the Alhambra by W. Somerset Maugham. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Church of St. Nicholas, on the other side of the valley, the Alhambra, like all Moorish buildings externally very plain, with its red walls and low tiled roofs, looks like some old charter house. Encircled by the fresh green of the springtime, it lies along the summit of the hill with an infinite, more simple grace, done in brown and deep red. And from the sultry wall on which I sat, the elm trees and the poplars seemed very cool. Firstly, after the long drought, the Daro, the Arab stream which ran scarlet with the blood of Moorish strife, wound its way over its stony bed among the hills, and beyond, in strange contrast, with all the fertility, was the grey and silent grandeur of the Sierra Nevada. Few places can be more charming than a green wood in which stands the stronghold of the Moorish kings. The wind sighs among the topmost branches, and all about is the sweet sound of running water. In spring, the ground is carpeted with violets, and the heavy foliage gives an enchanting coldness. A massive gateway, flanked by watch-towers, forms the approach. But the actual entrance, offering no hint of the incredible magnificence within, is an insignificant door. But then, then you are immediately transported to a magic palace, existing in some uncertain age of fancy, which does not seem the work of human hands, but rather of jinn, an enchanted dwelling of seven lovely damsels. It is barely conceivable that historical persons inhabited such a place. At the same time, it explains the wonderful civilization of the Moors in Spain, with their fantastic battles, their songs and strange histories, and it brings the Arabian Nights into the bounds of sober reality. After he has seen the Alhambra, None can doubt the literal truth of the stories of Sinbad the sailor and of Hansen of Bassora. From the terrace that overlooks the city, you enter the court of myrtles, a long pool of water with goldfish swimming to and fro, enclosed by myrtle hatches. At the ends are arcades, borne by marble columns with capitals of surpassing beauty it is very quiet and very restful the placid water gives an indescribable sensation of delight and at the end mirrors the slender columns and the decorated arches so that in reflection you see the entrance to a second palace which is filled with mysterious beautiful things but in the Alhambra, the imagination finds itself at last out of its depth. It cannot conjure up chambers more beautiful than the reality presents. It serves only to recall the old inhabitants to the deserted halls. The Moors continually used inscriptions with great effect. And there is one in this court which surpasses all others in its oriental imagery, in praise of Mohammed the Fifth. Thou givest safety from the breeze to the blaze of grass, and inspirest terror in the very stars of heaven. When the shining stars quiver, it is through dread of thee, and when the grass of the field bends down, it is to give thee thanks. 
but it is the hall of the ambassadors which shows most fully the unparalleled splendour of moorish decoration it is a square room very lofty with alcoves on three sides at the bottom of which are windows and the walls are covered from the dado of tiles to the roof with the richest and most varied ornamentation the moorish workmen did not spare themselves nor economize their exuberant invention one pattern follows another with infinite diversity even the alcoves and there are nine are covered each with different designs so that the mind is bewildered by their graceful ingenuity all kinds of geometrical figures are used and lacing with graceful intricacy intersetting combining and dissolving conventional foliage and fruit arabic inscriptions an industrious person has counted more than one hundred and fifty patterns in the hall of the ambassadors impressed with iron moulds on the moist plaster of the walls the roof is a low dome of large wood intricately carved and inlaid with ivory and with mother-of-pearl it has been likened to the faceted surface of an elaborately cut gem the effect is so gorgeous that you are oppressed you long for some perfectly plain space whereon to rest the eye but every inch is covered now the walls have preserved only delicate tints of red and blue pale wedgewood blues and faded terracottas that make with the ivory of the plaster most exquisite harmonies but to accord with the tiles the brilliancy still undiminished the colours must have been very bright the complicated patterns and the gay hues reproduce the oriental carpets of the nomad's tent for from the tent it is said i know not with what justification all oriental architecture is derived the fragile columns upon which rest masses of masonry are therefore direct imitation of tent poles and the stalactite borders of the arches represent the fringe of the woven hangings the moorish architect paid no attention to the rules of architecture and it has been well said that if they existed for him at all it was only that he might elaborately disregard them his columns generally support nothing his arcades so delicately worked that they seem like carved ivory are of the lightest wooden plaster and it is curious that there should be such durability in those dainty materials they express well the fatalism of the luxurious moor to whom the past and future were as nothing and the transient hour all in all yet they have outlasted him and his conqueror the spaniard inglorious and decayed is now but the showman to this magnificence time has seen his greatness come and go as came and went the greatness of the moor but still for all its fragility the alhambra stands hardly less beautiful travellers have always been astonished at the small size of the alhambra especially of the court of lions for here though the proportion is admirable the scale is tiny and many have supposed that the moors were of less imposing physique than modern europeans the court is surrounded by exquisite little columns singly in twos in threes supporting horseshoe arches and in the centre is that beautiful fountain borne by twelve lions with bristly manes standing very stiffly whereon is the inscription o oh, thou who beholdest these lions crouching fear not life is wanting to enable them to show their fury indeed 
Their surroundings have such a delicate and playful grace that it is hard to believe the Moors had any of our strenuous latter-day passions. Life must have been to them a mask rather than a tragic comedy. And whether they belong to sober history or no, those contests of which the curious may read in the lively pages of Hines Perez de Ita accord excellently with the fanciful environment. In the Alhambra, nothing seems more reasonable than those never-ending duels in which, for a lady's favour, gallant knights gave one another such blows that the air rang with them, such wounds that the ground was red with blood. But at sunset, they separated and bound up their wounds and returned to the palace. And the king, at the relation of the adventure, was filled with amazement and with great content. Yet, notwithstanding, I find in the Alhambra something unsatisfying. For many an inferior piece of architecture has set my mind working, so that I have dreamed charming dreams, or seen vividly the life of other times. But here, I know not why, my imagination helps me scarcely at all. The existence that within these gorgeous walls is too remote. There is but little to indicate the thoughts, the feelings of these people, and one can take the Alhambra only as a thing of beauty and despair to understand. I know that it is useless to attempt with words to give an idea of these numerous chambers and courts. A string of superlatives can do no more than tire the reader. An exact description can only confuse, nor is the painter able to give more than a suggestion of the bewildering charm. The effect is too emotional to be conveyed from man to man and each must feel it for himself. Charles V called him unhappy who had lost such a treasure, Desgraciado el que tal perdió, and showed his own appreciation by demolishing a part to build a Renaissance palace for himself. It appears that kings have not received from heaven with their right divine to govern wrong the inestimable gift of good taste. And for them possibly it is fortunate, since when, perchance, a sovereign has the artistic temperament a discerning people, cuts off his hat. End of the Alhambra by W. Somerset Maugham Read by Lilith Brander America by Voltaire from the Philosophical Dictionary, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. America. Since framers of systems are continually conjecturing on the manner in which America can have been peopled, we will be equally consistent in saying that he who caused flies to exist in those regions caused men to exist there also. However pleasant it may be to dispute, it cannot be denied that the supreme being who lives in all nature has created about the forty-eighth degree two-legged animals without feathers, the color of whose skin is a mixture of white and carnation, with long beards approaching to red about the line in africa and its islands negroes without beards and in the same latitude other negroes with beards some of them having wool and some hair on their heads and among them other animals quite white having neither hair nor wool but a kind of white silk it does not very clearly appear what should have prevented god from placing on another continent animals of the same species of a copper color in the same latitude in which, in Africa and Asia, they are found black, or even from making them without beards in the very same latitude in which others possess them. To what lengths are we carried by the rage for systems joined with the tyranny of prejudice? 
we see these animals it is agreed that god has had the power to place them where they are yet it is not agreed that he has so placed them the same persons who readily admit that the beavers of canada are of canadian origin assert that the men must have come there in boats and that mexico must have been peopled by some of the descendants of magog as well might be said that if there be men in the moon they must have been taken thither by astolfo on his hippogriff when he went to fetch roland's senses which were corked up in a bottle if america had been discovered in his time and there had been men in europe systematic enough to have advanced with the jesuit le Fateau, that the caribbees descended from the inhabitants of caria and the hurons from the jews he would have done well to have brought back the bottle containing the wits of these reasoners which he would doubtless have found in the moon along with those of angelica's lover the first thing done when an inhabited island is discovered in the indian ocean or in the south seas is to inquire whence came these people but as for the trees and the tortoises they are without any hesitation pronounced to be indigenous as if it was more difficult for nature to make men than to make tortoises one thing however which tends to countenance this system is that there is scarcely an island in the eastern or in the western ocean which does not contain jugglers quacks knaves and fools this it is probable gave rise to the opinion that these animals are of the same race with ourselves End of america by voltaire from the philosophical dictionary volume one The Art of Dying by August Strindberg. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The wish for power is said to be a fundamental condition of the existence of the ego, without which a man would perish as he could not resist the pressure of others. So we were taught by the seducing spirits of our youth. But Swedenborg says the thirst for power comes from hell, and Balzac speaks of the galley slaves of ambition who can never rest. Dante has a fine verse regarding the fate of the great painters, one must retire in order to make place for another he passes into the shadow and is forgotten even when it is unjust as it often is one must acquiesce in being relegated to the background for men get tired even of the best and desire change a great name becomes oppressive is felt as a tyranny and hinders others from also making great names for themselves. Napoleon and Bismarck saw this clearly, for both said beforehand that the world would give a sigh of relief when they were gone. But, in order to depart content, we require religious resignation, complete irrevocable withdrawal from the world such as Charles V's retirement into a monastery. To receive a benefit on one's retirement, and then to reappear on the stage, is not becoming. If one considers oneself dead to the world, and takes no notice of it, then a new life begins, but on the other side. It is a much more peaceful one, for it is the resurrection from the dead already here. Beethoven was vexed that the Viennese were ungrateful and forgetful when Rossini appeared, and brought again in fashion the Italian opera, which Beethoven had devoted his life to extirpate. Beethoven, however, was a hard, selfish, and very proud man, who was accordingly literally tormented out of life, in great matters and in small. Increasing deafness, a disagreeable lawsuit, 
a mad young relative domestic scandal illnesses troubled his last years he even had to be exposed to the undeserved ridicule of underlings thus well prepared he turned his back on life and departed from all without missing anything so it should be in order that nothing should bind one either with longing or with hope in order that on the other side of the river one may not look back but go straight forward the object of the trials of old age is to adjust accounts to finish up unsettled affairs to see through the cheat of life and to become weary of the incomplete so that no backward longings may disturb the repose of the grave end of the art of dying by august strindberg read for librivox dot org by john burlinson augusta tabor by caroline bancroft this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org augusta tabor her side of the scandal she is a blonde i understand and paints but i have never seen her augusta tabor made this remark about baby doe in the course of a long interview that she gave to a reporter for the denver republican the account appeared on october thirty first eighteen eighty three and carried several heads one of these read mrs tabor number one makes some spicy revelations augusta received her caller in the elegantly furnished sitting-room of her twenty-room mansion the house stood at the corner of seventeenth avenue and lincoln street but faced broadway its address was ninety seven broadway and was entered along a spruce lined circular driveway the house and its surrounding block of land had been part of her divorce settlement from the millionaire silver king horace a w tabor the divorce in the january preceding had been a national scandal only to be topped by the even greater scandal of her former husband's remarriage the wedding was performed on march first in washington where tabor had gone to serve a thirty-day term as senator it was attended by a number of political bigwigs including president chester arthur but they came without their wives the women drew a sharp line against recognizing that blonde the former mrs elizabeth mccourt doe the best people continued to draw that line when the tabors returned to denver after their honeymoon no one called on the second mrs tabor but shortly afterward augusta came home from california where she had taken her broken heart two hundred and fifty people organized a surprise reception for her at her palatial residence but in the following months augusta brooded i do not consider myself divorced from mr tabor she told the reporter the whole proceedings were irregular if it were not for my son maxie i would commence suit to-morrow to have the divorce annulled i repeat it was illegal do you think mr tabor would live with you if you were to have the divorce set aside the reporter asked no i couldn't hope for that but it would be a great deal of satisfaction to know that that woman was no more to him than she was before he gave her his name and mine augusta glanced over to the table where she had laid down her sewing a piece of silk patchwork the reporter thought she looked lonely and sad-faced then she sighed well there has been scandal enough god knows it would make a big volume if it were put in book form it has aged me a new chapter of the scandal was being enacted that week horace tabor was suing his old friend and business manager william h bush for twenty five thousand dollars because of sundry debts including a two thousand dollar embezzlement as former manager of the tabor grand opera house of denver bush had retaliated with a countersuit against tabor 
asking payment for all sorts of flagrant services performed for the silver king the juicy trial was the sensation of the week augusta had been called to testify for bush her testimony had been very titillating and she had startled the court even further by crossing over and sitting down beside tabor while she tried to engage him in conversation mr tabor has changed a great deal she commented to the reporter he used to detest women of that kind he would never allow me to whitewash my face however much i desire to do so she wants his money and will hang to him as long as he has got a nickel she don't want an old man the reporter ventured the suggestion that the fifty-two-year-old tabor was not such an old man oh yes he is he dyes his hair and moustache i noticed him in the courtroom the other day he was afraid to draw his handkerchief across his mouth for fear of staining it i also noticed that the hair on his temples which is grey was coloured nicely to give him a rejuvenated appearance augusta and the reporter conversed for two solid columns of small tightly packed print while she revealed a number of intimate matters the details of the secret illegal first divorce which tabor had procured from her in march eighteen eighty two were set forth augusta claimed the charges had been a lie from beginning to end and gave conclusive data in refutation mr tabor used to be a truthful man he is changed now she remarked indignantly after a pause she continued with i understand that she has her family quartered at his home i mean all in this country i understand that a fresh invoice is coming over from ireland the reporter smiled at her sally and encouraged her to talk on she showed him three scrapbooks that she was making of clippings about tabor these scrapbooks are now in the western history collection of the denver public library and contain this particular interview along with many others augusta explained that at first she had only saved newspaper articles that spoke well of him but now she was saving everything and the later clippings were all derogatory is there really seventeen in that court family well there is one thing that mr tabor cannot say and that is that any of my relatives ever lived off him not one of them ever received a cent from him that woman will break him up augusta liked to talk to newspaper people she herself had contributed to eastern newspapers and been a member of the colorado state press association in july eighteen seventy nine she attended a meeting of the association at manitou in company with flora stevens a correspondent for the kansas city times miss stevens later wrote augusta up under the heading a rich man's wife in which she said that augusta kept an extensive journal during the trip to manitou unfortunately this particular example of augusta's authorship has not been preserved augusta also liked to visit newspaper offices in may eighteen seventy nine she brought a visitor her dainty niece susie marston to see the various departments of the rocky mountain news this girl was from augusta maine the family home town after which augusta had been named augusta took her niece on trips around colorado and in eighteen eighty nine chaperoned her on a diversified tour of europe while they travelled with the george Tritches of denver the first mrs tabor's habit of calling on writers has preserved for us a very fine autobiography in september of eighteen eighty three mrs alice polk hill of denver who had lived in colorado for a decade or so decided to compile a book by collecting reminiscences and informal bits of history she spent several months travelling about the state to obtain material some time prior to the publication of her book in eighteen eighty four she arrived in leadville and stayed at the clarendon hotel augusta who was visiting her sister mrs melvina l clark in leadville at the time came to call mrs hill was delighted and later described augusta as a frail delicate-looking woman with pleasing manners more importantly mrs tabor number one wrote out a detailed account of her early marriage much of which mrs hill used in her first book tales of the colorado pioneers but which has survived intact in the denver republican 
Her romance with Tabor, a Vermont stonecutter, began in Maine in August 1853, when Augusta L. Pierce was twenty years old and Horace Austin Warner Tabor was twenty-two. He came to work for her father, a contractor. After a couple of years' employment, he fell in love with the boss's daughter. A two-year engagement followed, while Tabor homesteaded a 160-acre farm in Riley County, Kansas. On January 31st, 1857, we were married in the room where we first met, Augusta recalled. Farming in Kansas proved bleak, arduous, and lonely for the 24-year-old bride, and unprofitable for her husband. When the news of gold in Colorado broke, the Tabors joined the rush. On April fifth, 1859, they set out in an ox-drawn covered wagon, with two men friends and their sixteen-month-old baby son, Maxie, who was teething. They also took along several cows to provide milk. The journey to Denver took them until June the 20th. They camped there for two weeks because the cattle were footsore, and then moved to a site near Golden. Here the men decided to push on to Gregory Diggings, now Central City, and they went afoot since there was no adequate road for a wagon leaving me and my sick child in the seven by nine tent that my hands had made the men took a supply of provisions on their backs a few blankets and bidding me be good to myself left on the morning of the glorious fourth my babe was suffering from fever and i was weak and worn my weight was only ninety pounds how sadly i felt none but god in whom i then firmly trusted knew twelve miles from a human soul save my babe the only sound I heard was the lowing of the cattle, and they, poor things, seemed to feel the loneliness of the situation and kept unusually quiet. Every morning and evening I had a round-up all to myself, Augusta wrote. After three long, weary weeks, the men returned. On the 26th of July, they again loaded the wagon and started into the mountains. Travelling by way of Russell Gulch, it took them three weeks to reach Payne's Bar, now Idaho Springs. She remarked, Ours was the first wagon through, and I was the first white woman there, if white I could be called after camping out three months. The men cut logs, laid them up four feet, and put the seven-by-nine tent on top for a roof. Horace went prospecting, and Augusta opened a business. She baked bread and pies, gave meals and sold milk from their cows. Horace found no gold, but Augusta was very successful. She made enough money to buy their unpaid-for farm in Kansas and to keep them through the winter in Denver. In February, Horace returned to his prospect, but found his claim had been jumped. He decided to go prospecting farther afield on the Arkansas and returned to Denver to make plans. They travelled by way of Ute Pass and were a month on the road before they reached South Park. Now she waxed lyrical. I shall never forget my first vision of the park. The sun was just setting. I can only describe it by saying it was one of Colorado's sunsets. Those who have seen them know how glorious they are. Those who have not cannot imagine how gorgeously beautiful they are. The park looked like a cultivated field with rivulets coursing through and herds of antelope in the distance. After two hazardous crossings of the ice-caked and tumultuous Arkansas, and after several weeks of unsuccessful placering, when they could not separate heavy black particles from the gold, they arrived in California Gulch. It was May the 8th, 1860. The first thing after camping was to have the faithful old oxen butchered that had brought us all the way from Kansas. Yes, from the Missouri River three years before. We divided the meat with the miners in the gulch, for they were without provisions or ammunition. Once again Augusta was the first woman in the camp, and once again the men built her a primitive log cabin. This one had a sod roof, no window, and a dirt floor. She promptly went into business, and Horace went prospecting. As the Tabors were the only people in the upper end of the gulch who owned a gold scales, Augusta added weighing dust to her duties of taking boarders and doing laundry. 
in a few weeks ten thousand men were crowded in the gulch and a mail and express office was needed augusta was appointed postmistress of oro city i was very happy that summer she added by september the twentieth horace had accumulated five thousand dollars in gold dust from his claim he gave one thousand dollars worth of this dust to augusta and she prepared to leave the mountains to spend the winter with her father and mother i put my wardrobe what there was of it in a carpet bag and took passage with a mule train that was going to the missouri river i was five weeks in crossing and cooked for my board horace and maxie also went to maine that winter but augusta did not mention this with that one thousand dollars i purchased one hundred and sixty acres of land in kansas adjoining the tract we already owned my folks dressed me up and in the spring i bought a pair of mules and a wagon in st joe to return with which took about all my money horace spent the four thousand dollars that was left of the gold dust for flour in iowa on the way back in the spring they opened a store in augusta's cabin while he mined the claim augusta waited on customers and raised her son she even transported gold to denver on horseback for the express office in order to fool highway robbers tabor carried a small amount of gold while large amounts were hidden under her skirts enjoying the protection of chivalry to ladies that summer of eighteen sixty one the store was more profitable than mining because the easy place of gold was nearly played out the camp fell off rapidly and by autumn was practically deserted the tabers decided to try the other side of the mosquito range and the booming camp of buckskin joe again they opened a store and again it was selected as the post office horace had no better luck with mining in south park than in oro and so resigned himself to their small business venture but he still dreamt of bonanzas and hopefully grub-staked penniless prospectors the agreement was that in return for supplies which he gave them they would share any rich finds augusta viewed the practice with disfavor when the printer boy mine was expanded in eighteen sixty eight in california gulch the tabors moved back to oro city this time they erected a four-room log cabin about a mile above the present site of leadville and settled down to their usual routine of running a general store for ten more years bringing the total to eighteen augusta kept at her labors and horace cherished his dreams as the years passed augusta's natural new england frankness grew more tart she found horace's easy-going ways irritating his off-hand generosities made no sense to a woman who knew the value of a hard-earned dollar or perhaps some psychic intuition warned augusta that that very same trait would bring her eventual heartbreak and she was trying subconsciously to ward off the blow the blow came disguised as good fortune in eighteen seventy seven the news leaked out that those heavy particles of black sand which had been so difficult for the placer miners to separate from gold were really bits of lead silver carbonates a second rush to california gulch began the newcomers were silver seekers and chose the lower part of the gulch in which to settle the tabers decided to move their oro city store a mile farther down and selected a site on the south side of chestnut street a door below the harrison avenue corner they built a story and a half log and frame building with sleeping quarters upstairs and dining and kitchen arrangements to the rear business boomed tabor had to hire two clerks to take care of the post office alone soon he was forced to open a banking department since he owned an ordinary iron safe which sat outside the counter everyone wanted to deposit their cash in his safe the cashier divided his time between the dry goods and grocery divisions and the receipt of deposits and writing of exchange tabor hired still more clerks and expanded jovially in the balmy atmosphere of his new importance in january eighteen seventy eight the settlement comprised some seventy tents shanties and log cabins the inhabitants decided to call a meeting effect an organization and choose a name leadville was selected 
although a few people thought Cloud City was more poetic. A short while afterward they voted Tabor to the mayorship and officially confirmed his year-long office for the city election in April. Tabor was now worth between $25,000 and $30,000. As sleeping and eating facilities were at a premium, the Tabors decided to build a residence for themselves where Augusta could serve meals and to allow the clerks to sleep above the store. They chose a site at 310 Harrison Avenue, way off from the settlement, and began to build in the spring. Meanwhile, Tabor was handing out grub stakes and still dreaming then the momentous day of his castles in spain arrived on sunday april the twenty first eighteen seventy eight two german prospectors august rischer and george theodore hook asked him for a stake while tabor was sorting mail postmaster tabor told them to pick out what they needed and the men chose about seventeen dollars worth of supplies mostly groceries they drew up an agreement that tabor was entitled to a third of what they found a few days later they came back and asked for a second handout they had staked a claim and they needed shovels a hand switch drills and blasting powder to sink a shaft this brought the total outlay to some sixty dollars early in may augusta was coming downstairs one morning when august rischer burst into the store as she told the story to flora stevens his hands were full of specimens he rushed towards her and shouted we've struck it we've struck it augusta said she was rather frigid to him rischer when you bring me money instead of rocks then i'll believe you but it was true their mine the little pittsburgh netted tabor five hundred thousand dollars in the following fifteen months he bought the chrysolite which proved to be another bonanza augusta continued to keep orders during the summer and Tabor to supervise the store's activities. But then Tabor began to splurge, and in the autumn they sold out. The fall election had made Tabor lieutenant governor of Colorado, so they planned to move to Denver. In January 1879, Tabor rented, and the next month purchased, the Henry C. Brown House at 70th and Broadway, paying $40,000. According to Augusta, when her husband took her to see it, she was very mindful of the quick rises and equally rapid descents of Colorado fortunes. Augusta took one look at her husband's idea of a new home and said, I will never go up these steps, Tabor, if you think I will ever have to go down them. Thirty-five curious callers appeared the first day she was at home. She remarked sarcastically, I would scarcely know how to return the call of the woman next door who arrived in a carriage. Tabor provided the means for returning the call. It was a $2,000 carriage, an exact replica of the one driven by the White House coachman around Washington. La, she told Flora Stevens, if we had only had the money that is in that carriage when we began life delegations from the various churches also came to call each seeking the tabor's membership augusta remarked i suppose mr tabor's and my souls are of more value than they were a year ago poor augusta time was running out tabor's answer to her tartness was to spend his evenings in the variety halls and bordellos as his interests and investments widened he took the most seductive inmates travelling with him the newspapers reported that Tabor had given clothes, jewellery, furs, and furbelows to three or four women, one paper said five, so that they could appear as Mrs. Tabor. One that he singled out was Alice Morgan, an Indian club swinger at the Grand Central Variety Hall in Leadville. Next, he was charmed by Willie DeVille in Lizzie Allen's parlour house in Chicago, and he brought Willie west with him. Augusta discovered the affair, and the miscreants promised to part. But this was a ruse. Tabor kept on seeing her secretly, and took Willie on a trip to New York. There she was so indiscreet about their relations that a woman in the hotel tried to blackmail the Silver King. Tabor told Willie she talked too much, and made her a gift of $5,000 to soften the blow of saying goodbye. Augusta preserved an interview with many more details than these, 
that Willie gave to a St. Louis reporter a couple of years after the affair. Apparently, Willie was still talking too much. In September 1879, Tabor sold out his interest in the little Pittsburgh for a cool million dollars. He bought the matchless for $117,000, which later proved the greatest bonanza of all, and over 800 shares of stock in the First National Bank in Denver. Then he and Augusta went east for six weeks while he made further investments, notably land in South Chicago. On November the 5th, the Tabors returned to Denver, and Horace left for Leadville to see to the completion and opening of the Tabor Opera House. Augusta remained in Denver. Tabor did not return, even for Christmas. His bachelor suite on the second floor of the Opera House, with its handy passageway across to Bill Bush's Clarendon Hotel, proved too delightful for a man whose eyes wandered. Augusta and he began to quarrel more violently. During 1880, they appeared together at balls of the Tabor Hose Company in Denver and of the Tabor Light Cavalry in Leadville, and when Tabor entertained ex-president and Mrs. Grant in the Cloud City. The two couples sat together in the left-hand box for the second act of Hours, and then left to attend a ball in the general's honor. This was July the 23rd, 1880, a momentous date for 47-year-old Augusta not because she had met a president, but because, just about that time, Horace ceased to be her husband. In the autumn, back in Denver, Horace gave her a hundred thousand dollars following his usual practice of making a parting gift. In January 1881, Tabor left the Broadway mansion irrevocably and established residence in a suite at the Windsor Hotel, of which he was part owner. What happened was that, some time during the spring or summer on one of his frequent trips to Leadville, Tabor had met Baby Doe. She was 25 and he was 49. They were introduced by Bill Bush, who had known the Dresden doll beauty as Mrs. Harvey Doe during her two and a half year residence in Central City. Bill Bush had been proprietor of the Teller House and had also known her husband and in-laws. She had obtained a divorce from Harvey Doe in March 1880 for adultery and non-support, and shortly after arrived in Leadville. Baby Doe said that it was love at first sight on her part. With Tabor, the feeling grew on him. She became his mistress almost immediately, but it was not until January 1881 that he began to think of divorce and remarriage. Augusta put her foot down, she refused successive overtures of a handsome settlement in return for a divorce. Augusta knew what was going on. In December 1880, she bought a third interest in the Windsor Hotel from Charles L. Hall of Leadville. The other third was owned by Bill Bush, who also managed the hotel, assisted by her son, Maxi. In the next months, Augusta used her ownership to check up regularly on activities at the hotel. When Tabor brought Baby Doe down from Leadville and installed her at the Windsor, the two women must have passed in the lobby frequently. Augusta realized a fine monthly profit from her Windsor investment, and in April 1881 she treated herself to a trip abroad for several months. Both Tabor and Bush wanted to buy out her share. Tabor did not like her making such a damned nuisance of herself going in and out of the rooms and Bush wanted to obtain a controlling interest in the hotel. Augusta kept on saying no, no divorce, and no hotel sale. When Augusta returned from Europe, she found her husband had risen to new heights. He was being considered for a senatorship, and he had finished building the Tabor Grand Opera House in Denver. The citizens were tendering a ceremony and watch fob to him on the opening night. Augusta wrote him a letter apologizing for what she had said in the heat of passion. She also asked to be allowed to come to the opening night of, of the Tabor Grand and to go with him to Washington as a senator's wife. This letter turned up among Baby Doe's paper at her death. No one knows how or if it was answered, but the Tabor box was empty on September the 5th, 1881, the gala occasion Augusta wanted to attend. 
in april eighteen eighty two augusta instituted a suit for payment of fifty thousand dollars a year alimony despite the fact that she was not divorced she listed tabor's holdings and their specific worth an impressive tabulation which brought the total to nine million four hundred and ten thousand dollars the suit caused a lot of scandal damaged tabor politically but accomplished nothing for augusta since it was thrown out of court as illegal augusta gave in on the hotel sale petition first she sold her interest in the windsor to bush for close to forty thousand dollars in may eighteen eighty two finally on january the second eighteen eighty three she gave tabor a divorce in exchange for property worth about three hundred thousand dollars she caused a sensation at the divorce trial by reiterating not willingly oh god not willingly it was this public statement of hers to the judge which made her feel that the divorce was not valid amos stepp augusta's lawyer summed up the whole five years of public quarrelling and scandal when he talked about her to a reporter oh she knows all about his practices with lewd women i never saw such a woman she is crazy about tabor she loves him and that settles it for years augusta hoped that baby doe would tire of horace and crestfallen he would come back to his first wife she thought that when the money was gone the young hussy would flit she told reporters she was building up her own fortune and hanging on to her large house in order that she might take care of tabor in his old age but augusta was wrong she had underestimated her rival when the silver panic of eighteen ninety three reduced the former millionaire to poverty his pretty blonde wife stuck like glue belatedly augusta realized the true character of baby doe in eighteen ninety two the first mrs tabor sold her house on broadway and moved across the street to the newly opened brown palace hotel although maxie and bill bush were the managers and lived there also augusta did not enjoy hotel life her health was starting to fail and she went to california for the winter seeking a milder climate there in pasadena on february the first eighteen ninety five at the age of sixty two she died her social position still secure if not showy and her fortune built to a million and a half dollars she said in her own words when tabor was at his richest i feel that in those early years of self-sacrifice hard labor and economy i laid the foundation for mr tabor's immense wealth had i not stayed with him and worked by his side he would have been discouraged returned to the stone-cutting trade and so lost his big opportunity all colorado agreed with her at the time and then the mills of the gods ground slowly and exceedingly fine tabor's immense wealth evaporated but its going did not bring horace back to her he clung to baby doe until the end four years after augusta's death never once was there the slightest rumour of any fidelity of his to her after eighteen eighty one and none of baby doe to him after their first meeting it must have been galling to augusta maxie tabor inherited the money his father had husbanded with such business acumen he brought her body back from california and she was buried in riverside cemetery with the passage of the years maxie was laid to rest in fairmount beside his wife and horace tabor in mount olivet beside baby doe augusta lies alone in an old-fashioned cemetery as alone as she lived her last fifteen years terribly alone for many years of her middle life augusta was called legville's first lady the nickname was spoken in affection and in admiration and she was interviewed for the leadville papers under that heading yes she was a first lady in many ways courageous and industrious and civic the tragedy of her life lay in the fact that although she was beloved of many she lost the key to the only heart she wanted end of augusta tabor by caroline bancroft recording by lynn thompson
Consolation by Logan Pearsall Smith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Consolation. The other day, depressed on the underground, I tried to cheer myself by thinking over the joys of our human lot. But there wasn't one of them for which I seemed to care a hang not wine nor friendship nor eating nor making love nor the consciousness of virtue was it worth while then going up in a lift into a world that had nothing less trite to offer then i thought of reading the nice and subtle happiness of reading this was enough this joy not dulled by age this polite and unpunished vice this selfish serene lifelong intoxication End of Consolation by Logan Pearsall Smith Read by David Wales The Fantastic Imagination by George MacDonald This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE FANTASTIC IMAGINATION by George MacDonald That we have in English no word corresponding to the German Märchen drives us to use the word fairy tale, regardless of the fact that the tale may have nothing to do with any sort of fairy. The old use of the word fairy, by Spencer at least, might, however, well be adduced, were justification or excuse necessary where need must. Were I asked, what is a fairy tale? I should reply, read Undine. That is a fairy tale. Then read this and that as well, and you will see what is a fairy tale. Were I further begged to describe the fairy tale, or define what it is, I would make answer that I should as soon think of describing the abstract human face, or stating what must go to constitute a human being. A fairy tale is just a fairy tale, as a face is just a face. And of all the fairy tales I know, I think Undine the most beautiful. Many a man, however, who would not attempt to define a man, might venture to say something as to what a man ought to be. Even so much I will not in this place venture with regard to the fairy tale. For my long past work in that kind might but poorly instance or illustrate my now more matured judgment. I will but say some things helpful to the reading in right-minded fashion of such fairy tales as I would wish to write, or care to read. Some thinkers would feel sorely hampered if at liberty to use no forms but such as existed in nature or to invent nothing save in accordance with the laws of the world of the senses. But it must not therefore be imagined that they desire escape from the region of law. Nothing lawless can show the least reason why it should exist, or could at best have more than an appearance of life. The natural world has its laws, and no man must interfere with them in the way of presentment any more than in the way of use but they themselves may suggest laws of other kinds, and man may, if he pleases, invent a little world of his own, with its own laws. For there is that in him which delights in calling up new forms, which is the nearest, perhaps, he can come to creation. When such forms are new embodiments of old truths, we call them products of the imagination. When they are mere inventions, however lovely, I should call them the work of the fancy. In either case, law has been diligently at work. His world once invented, the highest law that comes next into play is that there shall be harmony between the laws by which the new world has begun to exist. And in the process of his creation, the inventor must hold by those laws. The moment he forgets one of them, he makes the story by its own postulates incredible. To be able to live a moment in an imagined world, we must see the laws of its existence obeyed. Those broken, we fall out of it. The imagination in us, whose exercise is essential to the most temporary submission to the imagination of another, 
immediately with the disappearance of law, ceases to act. Suppose the gracious creatures of some childlike region of fairyland talking either Cockney or Gascon. Would not the tale, however lovelily begun, sink at once to the level of the burlesque, of all forms of literature the least worthy? A man's inventions may be stupid or clever, but if he does not hold by the laws of them, or if he makes one law jar with another, he contradicts himself as an inventor. He is no artist. He does not rightly consort his instruments, or he tunes them in different keys. The mind of man is the product of live law. It thinks by law. It dwells in the midst of law. It gathers from law its growth. With law, therefore, can it alone work to any result. Inharmonious, unconsorting ideas will come to a man, but if he try to use one of such, his work will grow dull, and he will drop it from mere lack of interest. Law is the soil in which alone beauty will grow. Beauty is the only stuff in which truth can be clothed. And you may, if you will, call imagination the tailor that cuts her garments to fit her, and fancy his journeyman that puts the pieces of them together, or perhaps at most embroiders their buttonholes. Obeying law, the maker works like his creator. Not obeying law, he is such a fool as heaps a pile of stones and calls it a church. In the moral world it is different. There a man may clothe in new forms, and for this employ his imagination freely, but he must invent nothing. He may not, for any purpose, turn its laws upside down. He must not meddle with the relations of live souls. The laws of the spirit of man must hold, alike in this world and in any world he may invent. It were no offense to suppose a world in which everything repelled instead of attracted the things around it. It would be wicked to write a tale representing a man it called good as always doing bad things, or a man it called bad as always doing good things. The notion itself is absolutely lawless. In physical things, a man may invent. In moral things, he must obey, and take their laws with him into his invented world as well. You write as if a fairy tale were a thing of importance. Must it have meaning? It cannot help having some meaning. If it have proportion and harmony, it has vitality, and vitality is truth. The beauty may be plainer in it than the truth, but without the truth the beauty could not be, and the fairy tale would give no delight. Everyone, however, who feels the story will read its meaning after his own nature and development. One man will read one meaning in it, another will read another. If so, how am I to assure myself that I am not reading my own meaning into it, but yours out of it? Why should you be so assured? It may be better that you should read your meaning into it. That may be a higher operation of your intellect than the mere reading of mine out of it. Your meaning may be superior to mine. Suppose my child ask me what the fairy tale means. What am I to say? If you do not know what it means, what is easier than to say so? If you do see a meaning in it, there it is for you to give him. A genuine work of art must mean many things. The truer its art, the more things it will mean. If my drawing, on the other hand, is so far from being a work of art that it needs this is a horse written under it, what can it matter that neither you nor your child should know what it means? It is there not so much to convey a meaning as to wake a meaning. If it do not even wake an interest, throw it aside. A meaning may be there, but it is not for you. If, again, you do not know a horse when you see it, the name written under it will not serve you much. At all events, the business of the painter is not to teach zoology. But, indeed, your children are not likely to trouble you about the meaning. 
They find what they are capable of finding, and more would be too much. For my part, I do not write for children, but for the childlike, whether of five or fifty or seventy-five. A fairy tale is not an allegory. There may be allegory in it, but it is not an allegory. He must be an artist indeed who can, in any mode, produce a strict allegory that is not a weariness to the spirit. An allegory must be mastery or moorditch. A fairy tale, like a butterfly or a bee, helps itself on all sides, sips every wholesome flower, and spoils not one. The true fairy tale is, to my mind, very like the sonata. We all know that a sonata means something, and where there is the faculty of talking with suitable vagueness and choosing metaphor sufficiently loose, mind may approach mind in the interpretation of a sonata, with the result of a more or less contenting consciousness of sympathy. But if two or three men sat down to write each what the sonata meant to him, what approximation to definite idea would be the result? Little enough, and that little more than needful. We should find it had roused related, if not identical, feelings, but probably not one common thought. Has the sonata therefore failed? Had it undertaken to convey, or ought it to be expected to impart, anything defined, anything notionally recognizable? But words are not music. Words, at least, are meant and fitted to carry a precise meaning. It is very seldom, indeed, that they carry the exact meaning of any user of them. And if they can be so used as to convey definite meaning, it does not follow that they ought never to carry anything else. Words are live things that may be variously employed to various ends. They can convey a scientific fact, or throw a shadow of her child's dream on the heart of a mother. They are things to put together like the pieces of a dissected map, or to arrange like the notes on a stave. Is the music in them to go for nothing? It can hardly help the definiteness of a meaning. Is it therefore to be disregarded? They have length and breadth and outline. Have they nothing to do with depth? Have they only to describe, never to impress? Has nothing any claim to their use but the definite? The cause of a child's tears may be altogether undefinable. Has the mother therefore no antidote for his vague misery? That may be strong in color, which has no evident outline. A fairy tale, a sonata, a gathering storm, a limitless night, seizes you and sweeps you away. Do you begin at once to wrestle with it and ask whence its power over you, whither it is carrying you? The law of each is in the mind of its composer. That law makes one man feel this way, another man feel that way. To one, the sonata is a world of odor and beauty, to another, of soothing only and sweetness. To one, the cloudy rendezvous is a wild dance with a terror at its heart, to another, a majestic march of heavenly hosts with truth in their center pointing their course, but as yet restraining her voice. The greatest forces lie in the region of the uncomprehended. I will go farther. The best thing you can do for your fellow, next to rousing his conscience, is not to give him things to think about, but to wake things up that are in him, or, say, to make him think things for himself. The best nature does for us is to work in us such moods in which thoughts of high import arise. Does any aspect of nature wake but one thought? Does she ever suggest only one definite thing? Does she make any two men in the same place at the same moment think the same thing? Is she therefore a failure, because she is not definite? Is it nothing that she rouses the something deeper than the understanding, the power that underlies thoughts? Does she not set feeling, and so thinking, at work? 
Would it be better that she did this after one fashion, and not after many fashions? Nature is mood-engendering, thought-provoking. Such ought the sonata, such ought the fairy tale, to be. But a man may then imagine in your work what he pleases, what you never meant. Not what he pleases, but what he can. If he be not a true man, he will draw evil out of the best. We need not mind how he treats any work of art. If he be a true man, he will imagine true things. What matter whether I meant them or not? They are there, none the less that I cannot claim putting them there. One difference between God's work and man's is that while God's work cannot mean more than he meant, man's must mean more than he meant. For in everything that God has made, there is a layer upon layer of ascending significance. Also, he expresses the same thought in higher and higher kinds of that thought. It is God's things, his embodied thoughts, which alone a man has to use, modified and adapted to his own purposes, for the expression of his thoughts. Therefore he cannot help his words and figures falling into such combinations in the mind of another as he had himself not foreseen. So many are the thoughts allied to every other thought. So many are the relations involved in every figure. So many the facts hinted in every symbol. A man may well himself discover truth in what he wrote for he was dealing all the time with things that came from thoughts beyond his own. But surely you would explain your idea to one who asked you. I say again, if I cannot draw a horse, I will not write, this is a horse, under what I foolishly meant for one. Any key to a work of imagination would be nearly, if not quite, as absurd. The tale is there not to hide, but to show. If it show nothing at your window, do not open your door to it. Leave it out in the cold. To ask me to explain is to say, Roses, boil them, or we won't have them. My tales may not be roses, but I will not boil them. So long as I think my dog can bark, I will not sit up to bark for him. If a writer's aim be logical conviction, he must spare no logical pains, not merely to be understood, but to escape being misunderstood. Where his object is to move by suggestion, to cause to imagine, then let him assail the soul of his reader as the wind assails an aeolian harp. If there be music in my reader, I would gladly wake it. Let fairy tale of mine go for a firefly that now flashes, now is dark, but may flash again. Caught in a hand which does not love its kind, it will turn to an insignificant, ugly thing that can neither flash nor fly. The best way with music, I imagine, is not to bring the forces of our intellect to bear upon it, but to be still and let it work on that part of us for whose sake it exists. We spoil countless precious things by intellectual greed. He who will be a man, and will not be a child, must, he cannot help himself, become a little man, that is, a dwarf. He will, however, need no consolation, for he is sure to think himself a very large creature indeed. If any strain of my broken music make a child's eyes flash, or his mother's grow for a moment dim, my labor will not have been in vain. End of The Fantastic Imagination by George MacDonald God in the Constitution by Robert Green Ingersoll This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to learn how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
God in the Constitution by Robert Greene Ingersoll All governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. In this country, it is admitted that the power to govern resides in the people themselves, that they are the only rightful source of authority. For many centuries before the formation of our government, before the promulgation of the Declaration of Independence, the people had but little voice in the affairs of nations. The source of authority was not in this world. Kings were not crowned by their subjects, and the scepter was not held by the consent of the governed. The king sat on his throne by the will of God, and for that reason was not accountable to the people for the exercise of his power. He commanded, and the people obeyed. He was lord of their bodies, and his partner, the priest, was lord of their souls. The government of earth was patterned after the kingdom on high. God was a supreme autocrat in heaven, whose will was law, and the king was a supreme autocrat on earth, whose will was law. The God in heaven had inferior beings to do his will, and the king on earth had certain favorites and officers to do his. These officers were accountable to him, and he was responsible to God. The feudal system was supposed to be in accordance with the divine plan. The people were not governed by intelligence, but by threats and promises, by rewards and punishments. No effort was made to enlighten the common people. No one thought of educating a peasant, of developing the mind of a laborer. The people were created to support thrones and altars. Their destiny was to toil and obey, to work and want. They were to be satisfied with huts and hovels, with ignorance and rags, and their children must expect no more. In the presence of the king they fell upon their knees, and before the priest they groveled in the very dust. The poor peasant divided his earnings with the state because he imagined it protected his body. He divided his crust with the church, believing that it protected his soul. He was the prey of throne and altar. One deformed his body, the other his mind, and these two vultures fed upon his toil. He was taught by the king to hate the people of other nations, and by the priest to despise the believers in all other religions. He was made the enemy of all people except his own. He had no sympathy with the peasants of other lands, enslaved and plundered like himself. He was kept in ignorance, because education is the enemy of superstition, and because education is the foe of that egotism often mistaken for patriotism. The intelligent and good man holds in his affections the good and true of every land. The boundaries of countries are not the limitations of his sympathies. Caring nothing for race or color, he loves those who speak other languages and worship other gods. Between him and those who suffer, there is no impassable gulf. He salutes the world and extends the hand of friendship to the human race. He does not bow before a provincial and patriotic God, one who protects his tribe or nation and abhors the rest of mankind. Through all the ages of superstition, each nation has insisted that it was the peculiar care of the true God, and that it alone had the true religion, that the gods of other nations were false and fraudulent and that other religions were wicked, ignorant, 
and absurd. In this way, the seeds of hatred had been sown, and in this way have been kindled the flames of war. Men have had no sympathy with those of a different complexion, with those who knelt at other altars and expressed their thoughts in other words, and even a difference in garments placed them beyond the sympathy of others. Every peculiarity was the food of prejudice and the excuse for hatred. The boundaries of nations were at last crossed by commerce. People became somewhat acquainted, and they found that the virtues and vices were quite evenly distributed. At last, subjects became somewhat acquainted with kings. Peasants had the pleasure of gazing at princes and it was dimly perceived that the differences were mostly in rags and names. In 1776 our fathers endeavored to retire the gods from politics. They declared that all governments derived their just powers from the consent of the governed. This was a contradiction of the then political ideas of the world. It was, as many believed, an act of pure blasphemy, a renunciation of the deity. It was, in fact, a declaration of the independence of the earth. It was a notice to all churches and priests that thereafter mankind would govern and protect themselves. Politically, it tore down every altar and denied the authority of every sacred book, and appealed from the providence of God to the providence of man. Those who promulgated the Declaration adopted a constitution for the Great Republic. What was the office or purpose of that constitution? Admitting that all power came from the people, it was necessary first, that certain means be adopted for the purpose of ascertaining the will of the people, and second, it was proper and convenient to designate certain departments that should exercise certain powers of the government. There must be the legislative, the judicial, and the executive departments. Those who make the laws should not execute them. Those who execute laws should not have the power of absolutely determining their meaning or their constitutionality. For these reasons, among others, a constitution was adopted. This constitution also contained a declaration of rights. It marked out the limitations of discretion so that in the excitement of passion men shall not go beyond the point designated in the calm moment of reason. When man is unprejudiced and his passions subject to reason, it is well he should define the limits of power so that the waves driven by the storm of passion shall not overbear the shore. A constitution is for the government of man in this world, it is the chain the people put upon their servants as well upon themselves. It defines the limit of power and the limit of obedience. It follows, then, that nothing should be in a constitution that cannot be enforced by the power of the state, that is, by the army and navy. Behind Every provision of the Constitution should stand the force of the nation. Every sword, every bayonet, every cannon should be there. Suppose, then, that we amend the Constitution and acknowledge the existence and supremacy of God. What becomes of the supremacy of the people? And how is this amendment to be enforced? A constitution does not enforce itself. It must be carried out by appropriate legislation. Will it be a crime to deny the existence of this constitutional God? 
can the offender be proceeded against in the criminal courts can his lips be closed by the power of the state would not this be the inauguration of religious persecution and if there is to be an acknowledgment of god in the constitution the question naturally arises as to which god is to have this honor shall we select the god of the catholics he who has established an infallible church presided over by an infallible pope and who is delighted with certain ceremonies and placated by prayers uttered in exceedingly common latin is it the god of the presbyterian with the five points of calvinism who is ingenious enough to harmonize necessity and responsibility and who in some way justifies himself for damning most of his own children is it the god of the puritan the enemy of joy of the baptist who is great enough to govern the universe and small enough to allow the destiny of a soul to depend on whether the body it inhabited was immersed or sprinkled what god is it proposed to put in the constitution is it the god of the old testament who was a believer in slavery and who justified polygamy if slavery was right then it is right now and if jehovah was right then the mormons are right now are we to have the god who issued a commandment against all art who was the enemy of investigation and of free speech is it the god who commanded the husband to stone his wife to death because she differed with him on the subject of religion are we to have a god who will reenact the mosaic code and punish hundreds of offenses with death what court what tribunal of last resort is to define this god and who is to make known his will in his presence laws passed by men will be of no value the decisions of courts will be as nothing but who is to make known the will of this supreme god will there be a supreme tribunal composed of priests of course all persons elected to office will either swear or affirm to support the constitution men who do not believe in this god cannot so swear or affirm such men will not be allowed to hold any office of trust or honor a god in the constitution will not interfere with the oaths or affirmations of hypocrites such a provision will only exclude honest and conscientious unbelievers intelligent people know that no one knows whether there is a god or not the existence of such a being is merely a matter of opinion men who believe in the liberty of man who are willing to die for the honor of their country will be excluded from taking any part in the administration of its affairs such a provision would place the country under the feet of priests to recognize a deity in the organic law of our country would be the destruction of religious liberty the god in the constitution would have to be protected there would be laws against blasphemy laws against the publication of honest thoughts laws against carrying books and papers in the mails in which this constitutional god should be attacked our land would be filled with theological spies with religious eavesdroppers and all the snakes and reptiles of the lowest natures in the sunshine of religious authority 
would uncoil and crawl. It is proposed to acknowledge a God who is the lawful and rightful governor of nations, the one who ordained the powers that be. If this God is really the governor of nations, it is not necessary to acknowledge him in the Constitution. This would not add to his power. If he governs all nations now, he has always controlled the affairs of men. Having this control, why did he not see to it that he was recognized in the Constitution of the United States? If he had the supreme authority and neglected to put himself in the Constitution, is not this, at least, prima facie evidence that he did not desire to be there? For one, I am not in favor of the God who has ordained the powers that be. What have we to say of Russia, of Siberia? What can we say of the persecuted and enslaved? What of the kings and nobles who live on the stolen labor of others? What of the priest and cardinal and pope who rest even from the hand of poverty, a single coin thrice earned. Is it possible to flatter the infinite with a constitutional amendment? The Confederate states acknowledged God in their constitution, and yet they were overwhelmed by a people in whose organic law no reference to God is made. All the kings of earth acknowledge the existence of God, and God is their ally. And this belief in God is used as a means to enslave and rob, to govern and degrade the people whom they call their subjects. The government of the United States is secular. It derives its power from the consent of man. It is a government with which God has nothing whatever to do, and all forms and customs, inconsistent with the fundamental fact that the people are the source of authority, should be abandoned. In this country there should be no oaths. No man should be sworn to tell the truth, and in no court should there be any appeal to any supreme being. A rascal, by taking the oath, appears to go in partnership with God, and ignorant jurors credit the firm instead of the man. A witness should tell his story, and if he speaks falsely, should be considered as guilty of perjury. Governors and presidents should not issue religious proclamations. They should not call upon the people to thank God. It is no part of their official duty. It is outside of and beyond the horizon of their authority. There is nothing in the Constitution of the United States to justify this religious impertinence. For many years, priests have attempted to give our government a religious form. Zealots have succeeded in putting the legend upon our money, In God we trust. And we have chaplains in the army and navy, and legislative proceedings are usually opened with prayer. All this is contrary to the genus of the Republic, contrary to the Declaration of Independence, and contrary, really, to the Constitution of the United States. We have taken the ground that the people can govern themselves without the assistance of any supernatural power. We have taken the position that the people are the real and only rightful source of authority. We have solemnly declared that the people must determine what is politically right and what is wrong, and that their legally expressed will is the supreme law. This leaves no room for national superstition, no room for patriotic gods or supernatural beings, 
and this does away with the necessity for political prayers. The government of God has been tried. It was tried in Palestine several thousand years ago, and the God of the Jews was a monster of cruelty and ignorance, and the people governed by this God lost their nationality. Theocracy was tried through the Middle Ages. God was the governor, the Pope was his agent, and every priest and bishop and cardinal was armed with credentials from the Most High, and the result was that the noblest and best were in prisons, the greatest and grandest perished at the stake. The result was that vices were crowned with honor and virtues whipped naked through the streets. The result was that hypocrisy swayed the scepter of authority, while honesty languished in the dungeons of the Inquisition. The government of God was tried in Geneva when John Calvin was his representative, and under this government of God, the flames climbed around the limbs and blinded the eyes of Michael Servetus, because he dared to express an honest thought. This government of God was tried in Scotland, and the seeds of theological hatred were sown that bore through hundreds of years the fruit of massacre and assassination. This government of God was established in New England, and the result was that Quakers were hanged or burned, the laws of Moses reenacted, and the witch was not suffered to live. The result was that investigation was a crime, and the expression of an honest thought a capital offense. This government of God was established in Spain, and the Jews were expelled, the Moors were driven out, Moriscos were exterminated, and nothing left but the ignorant and bankrupt worshippers of this monster. This government of God was tried in the United States when slavery was regarded as a divine institution, when men and women were regarded as criminals because they sought for liberty by flight, and when others were regarded as criminals because they gave them food and shelter. The pulpit of that day defended the buying and selling of women and babes, and the mouths of slave traders were filled with passages of scripture defending and upholding the traffic in human flesh. We have entered upon a new epoch. This is the century of man. Every effort to really better the condition of mankind has been opposed by the worshippers of some god. The church in all ages and among all peoples has been the consistent enemy of the human race. Everywhere and at all times it has opposed the liberty of thought and expression. It has been the sworn enemy of investigation and of intellectual development. It has denied the existence of facts, the tendency of which was to undermine its power. It has always been carrying faggots to the feet of philosophy. It has erected the gallows for genius. It has built the dungeons for thinkers. And today the Orthodox Church is as much opposed as it ever was to the mental freedom of the human race. Of course there is a distinction made between churches and individual members. There have been millions of Christians who have been believers in liberty and in the freedom of expression, millions who have fought for the rights of man. But churches, as organizations, have been on the other side. It is true that churches have fought churches, that Protestants battled with the Catholics for what they were pleased to call the freedom of conscience. And it is also true that the moment these Protestants obtained the civil power, they denied this freedom of conscience to others. 
let me show you the difference between the theological and the secular spirit. Nearly three hundred years ago, one of the noblest of the human race, Giordano Bruno, was burned at Rome by the Catholic Church, that is to say, by the triumphant beast. This man had committed certain crimes. He had publicly stated that there were other worlds than this, other constellations than ours. He had ventured the supposition that other planets might be peopled. More than this, and worse than this, he had asserted the heliocentric theory, that the Earth made its annual journey about the Sun. He had also given it as his opinion that matter is eternal. For these crimes he was found unworthy to live, and about his body were piled the faggots of the Catholic Church. This man, this genius, this pioneer of the science of the nineteenth century, perished as serenely as the sun sets. The infidels of today find excuses for his murderers. They take into consideration the ignorance and brutality of the times. They remember that the world was governed by a god who was then the source of all authority. This is the charity of infidelity, of philosophy. But the church of today is so heartless, is still so cold and cruel that it can find no excuse for the murdered. This is the difference between theocracy and democracy, between God and man. If God is allowed in the Constitution, man must abdicate. There is no room for both. If the people of the great republic become superstitious enough and ignorant enough to put God in the Constitution of the United States, the experiment of self-government will have failed, and the great and splendid declaration that all governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed will have been denied, and in its place will be found this. All power comes from God, priests are his agents, and the people are their slaves. Religion is an individual matter, and each soul should be left entirely free to form its own opinions and to judge of its accountability to a supposed supreme being. With religion, government has nothing whatever to do. Government is founded upon force, and force should never interfere with the religious opinions of men. Laws should define the rights of men and their duties toward each other, and these laws should be for the benefit of man in this world. A nation can neither be Christian nor infidel. A nation is incapable of having opinions upon these subjects. If a nation is Christian, will all the citizens go to heaven? If it is not, will they all be damned? Of course, it is to be admitted that the majority of citizens composing a nation may believe or disbelieve, and they may call the nation what they please. A nation is a corporation. To repeat a familiar saying, it has no soul. There can be no such thing as a Christian corporation. Several Christians may form a corporation, but it can hardly be said that the corporation thus formed was included in the atonement. For instance, seven Christians form a corporation. That is to say, there are seven natural persons and one artificial. Can it be said that there are eight souls to be saved? 
no human being has brain enough or knowledge enough or experience enough to say whether there is or is not a god into this darkness science has not yet carried its torch no human being has gone beyond the horizon of the natural as to the existence of the supernatural one man knows precisely as much and exactly as little as another upon this question chimpanzees and cardinals apes and popes are upon exact equality the smallest insect discernible only by the most powerful microscope is as familiar with this subject as the greatest genius that has been produced by the human race governments and laws are for the preservation of rights and the regulation of conduct one man should not be allowed to interfere with the liberty of another in the metaphysical world there should be no interference whatever the same is true in the world of art laws cannot regulate what is or is not music what is or what is not beautiful and constitutions cannot definitely settle and determine the perfection of statues the value of paintings or the glory and subtlety of thought in spite of laws and constitutions the brain will think in every direction consistent with the well-being and peace of society there should be freedom no man should be compelled to adopt the theology of another neither should a minority however small be forced to acquiesce in the opinions of a majority however large if there be an infinite being he does not need our help we need not waste our energies in his defense it is enough for us to give to every other human being the liberty we claim for ourselves there may or may not be a supreme ruler of the universe but we are certain that man exists and we believe that freedom is the condition of progress that it is the sunshine of the mental and moral world and that without it man will go back to the den of savagery and will become the fit associate of wild and ferocious beasts we have tried the government of priests and we know that such governments are without mercy in the administration of theocracy all the instruments of torture have been invented if any man wishes to have god recognized in the constitution of our country let him read the history of the inquisition and let him remember that hundreds of millions of men women and children have been sacrificed to placate the wrath or win the approbation of this god there has been in our country a divorce of church and state this follows as a natural sequence of the declaration that governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed the priest was no longer a necessity his presence was a contradiction of the principle on which the republic was founded he represented not the authority of the people but of some power from on high and to recognize this other power was inconsistent with free government the founders of the republic at that time parted company with the priests and said to them you may turn your attention to the other world we will attend to the affairs of this equal liberty was given to all but the ultra theologian is not satisfied with this he wishes to destroy the liberty of the people he wishes a recognition of his god as the source of authority to the end that the church may become the supreme power but 
the sun will not be turned backward. The people of the United States are intelligent. They no longer believe implicitly in a supernatural religion. They are losing confidence in the miracles and marvels of the Dark Ages. They know the value of the free school. They appreciate the benefits of science. They are believers in education, in the free play of thought, and there is a suspicion that the priest, the theologian, is destined to take his place with the necromancer, the astrologer, the worker of magic, and the professor of the black art. We have already compared the benefits of theology and science. When the theologian governed the world, it was covered with huts and hovels for the many, palaces and cathedrals for the few. To nearly all the children of men, reading and writing were unknown arts. The poor were clad in rags and skins. They devoured crusts and gnawed bones. The day of science dawned, and the luxuries of a century ago are the necessities of today. Men in the middle ranks of life have more of the conveniences and elegancies than the princes and kings of the theological times. But above and over all this is the development of the mind. There is more of value in the brain of an average man of today of a master mechanic, of a chemist, of a naturalist, of an inventor, than there was in the brain of the world four hundred years ago. These blessings did not fall from the skies. These benefits did not drop from the outstretched hands of priests. They were not found in cathedrals or behind altars. Neither were they searched for with holy candles. They were not discovered by the closed eyes of prayer, nor did they come in answer to superstitious supplication. They are the children of freedom, the gifts of reason, observation, and experience. And for them all, man is indebted to man. Let us hold fast to the sublime declaration of Lincoln. Let us insist that this, the Republic, is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. The Arena, Boston, Massachusetts, January 1890 End of God in the Constitution by Robert Green Ingersoll Read by Scott Daniker Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Introduction from the Iron Road Book and Railway Companion, or A Journey from London to Birmingham, by Francis Coglin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction London and Birmingham Railway The Act of Parliament for forming this great undertaking was obtained in May 1833, and the works were commenced in June 1834. In July 1837, twenty-four and a half miles of the line, adjoining London, were opened to the public. Seventy-seven miles are now opened, that is, forty-eight from the London end and twenty-nine from the Birmingham end, and in the ensuing autumn the whole of the line will be completed. Embankments, etc. A level line for the railway was obtained by cutting through the hills and using the earth therefrom to form embankments. The country throughout is of an undulating character, so that there is scarcely a mile throughout the whole length in which cuttings or embankments were not necessary. The width of the embankments on the top, and of the excavations at the bottom, is thirty-three feet. 
the greatest height of an embankment is forty-five and the greatest depth of an excavation is sixty-five feet the greatest slope of the sides of the excavations is three in inclination to one in height the least three-quarter to one the greatest slope of the sides of the embankments is three to one the least two to one the slopes of the excavations and embankments are all neatly trimmed down some are covered with the turf originally taken from the surface others are sown with grass seeds and many of the embankments near coventry are planted with young trees the number of cubic yards of earth moved in forming the line will be when completed upwards of sixteen million nine tenths of which will be used in forming the embankments the remainder being formed into spoil banks or spread on the adjoining lands the number of embankments is one hundred thirty and of cuttings the same the greatest length of any one embankment is one and two-thirds mile and of a cutting two and a half miles at the bottom of each embankment and at the top of each excavation there is a space of ten feet on each side to allow of a hedge a post and rail and a ditch bridges the span of the bridges where the turnpike and other roads pass under and the width between the parapets where they pass over is in no case less than fifteen feet and from the road to the soffit of the arch the height is not less than sixteen feet the inclination of the roads where altered is no more than one in thirty for turnpike roads and no more than one in thirteen for other roads the span of the bridges where the railway passes under is thirty feet and the height not less than sixteen feet gates in some few cases the railway crosses roads of small traffic on a level wherever this occurs gates are erected and persons stationed the gates being so contrived as to close either across the railway or across the road immediately that a train of railway carriages is in sight the gates are closed across the road and as soon as the train is passed the gates are shut across the railway and the communication by the road again opened to give notice to the gatekeeper in the event of his not being on the alert the engine man turns the waste steam of the locomotive into a pipe contrived for the purpose this causes a shrill whistle which may be heard at a great distance no turnpike roads are passed on a level tunnels where the height of the ground is very considerable tunnels are driven of which there will be seven of the lengths of one thousand one hundred five three hundred thirteen one thousand seven hundred eighty six three hundred fifty two two hundred seventy two four hundred eighteen and two thousand three hundred ninety eight yards together about three and three quarter miles the greatest width of the tunnels within the walls is twenty four feet the greatest height above the rails twenty two feet in the short tunnels the shafts used for working and which are eight feet diameter in the clear are fully sufficient for ventilation in the tunnel near watford there is besides these working shafts which are four in number a shaft expressly made for ventilation the superficial area of which is seven hundred fifty feet in the tunnel of two thousand three hundred ninety eight yards there will be two ventilating shafts of this description the air that would become contaminated in a tunnel by a locomotive engine with its train passing through it supposing there were no ventilating shaft whatever is one four hundred fiftieth part of the whole the air of a crowded church or theatre is a thousand times more injurious if indeed such a term can at all be applied to a railway tunnel in the tunnels now opened not the slightest inconvenience is experienced in passing through either from insufficient ventilation or from any other cause i can vouch for this fact having been in the tunnels when a train has passed through inclinations between the extremities of the line are five ridges separated by six valleys varying in depth it became consequently necessary that the line should rise and fall but in no case does any inclination exceed one in three hundred four or sixteen feet in a mile if we accept a portion of the first mile from london between euston grove and camden stations 
for the working of which a stationary engine is employed. The ropes to draw up the carriages on this part of the line are 4,000 yards in length, 7 inches in circumference, and the weight of each is about 12 tons. Omitting this part of the line, and taking the part worked by locomotives, 13 miles are level, 51 and 3 quarter are at inclinations varying from 1 foot to 14 feet, and 46 and 3 quarter at inclinations between 14 and 16 feet. The following are the levels of the different parts of the line above the level of the sea. Distance from station at Euston Grove. Miles. One and one quarter. Passengers and goods station Camden Town. Level above the sea. Feet. 120. Miles. Three and one quarter. Brent Valley. Feet. 112. Miles. Fourteen and a quarter. Oxay Ridge. Near Watford. Feet. 240 miles sixteen and three quarter colne valley feet two hundred twenty nine miles thirty one and one quarter tring ridge feet four hundred twenty miles fifty four and a quarter os valley feet two hundred fifty nine miles sixty and a quarter blisworth ridge near northampton feet three hundred fifty eight miles sixty five and a quarter nen valley feet three hundred nineteen miles seventy seven and a quarter killsby ridge near daventry feet three hundred ninety five miles ninety one and a quarter avon valley feet two hundred sixty three miles ninety six and three quarter reeves green ridge near coventry feet three hundred seventy seven miles one o two and a quarter blythe valley feet three hundred twenty Miles, 112 and a half, Birmingham Station, Nova Scotia Gardens, feet 368. The Birmingham Station is thus 248 feet higher than that at Camden Town, and the difference of level between the Brent Valley and the Tring Ridge is 308 feet, in a length of 28 miles. From the Camden Depot to Birmingham, 54 and three quarter miles are ascending, 43 and 3 quarters descending, and 13 level. The number of times the gradients change between one end of the line and the other is 44. The greatest continued length of level line is 3 and a quarter miles. The greatest length of any gradient is 7 and a half miles. The greatest continued length of inclination in one direction, that inclination varying from one gradient to another, is 14 and a quarter miles. The curves along the line are numerous, but there are none of less than a mile radius, excepting close to the station at Euston Square and Camden Town. Rails. The total length of the line is 112 and a half miles. The part between Euston Grove and Camden Stations is laid with four double lines of rails, the remainder with two double lines. The sidings, or passing places, with the stations, etc., make an addition of one-tenth to the quantity of the rails, so that there will be about 125 miles of double line of railway. The width of each double line of way is five feet. The space in the center between the lines is six feet. The rails used on the line are all of malleable iron. Those originally laid upon the Liverpool and Manchester line were of the weight of 35 pounds to the yard, but they have been found insufficient for the immense traffic, and they have accordingly been increased. On the London and Birmingham line, ten miles are laid with rails of unequal depth, termed fish-bellied, fifty pounds to the yard, twenty-five miles with parallel rails, sixty-five pounds to the yard, and the remainder with parallel rails, seventy-five pounds to the yard. The rails are supported by cast-iron chairs, or pedestals, of an average weight of about twenty-five pounds, fixed to stone blocks or wood sleepers, a piece of felt being placed between each chair and block. The chairs under the 50 pounds rails are 3 feet from center to center, under the 65 pounds rails, 4 feet, and under the 75 pounds rails they are intended to have been 5 feet, but this latter bearing having been considered too great, has been altered to 3 feet 9 inches in the cuttings and small embankments, 
and to two feet six inches on the higher embankments the rails are raised above the ground rather more than an inch they are wedged to the chairs with oak keys sleepers the stone blocks under the chairs are two feet square and one foot deep excepting those under the joints of the seventy five pounds rails which are one foot three inches deep they are laid in a direction diagonally to the rails the descriptions of stone are various that is granite limestone portland bramley fall and whitby the sleepers are mostly of larch and oak some few are of beech all nine feet long nine inches wide and five inches deep the blocks are used in the excavations and on the smaller embankments the sleepers on the large embankments the chairs are attached to the blocks by drilling two holes in each block into which oak tree nails or plugs are driven and a spike inserted through them and the chairs the chairs are attached to the sleepers by a couple of pins or spikes the tree nails are six inches long with a hole bored through for the spike the ballasting of the line is about two feet in thickness being ten inches under the bottom of the blocks and eighteen inches under the sleepers open brick drains to take off the soakage are laid along the centre of the ballasting and each side in the excavations where the common roads pass the railway on a level the part of the road between and on each side of the rails is paved with granite carriageway paving the number of men originally employed daily on the line in the actual works of the contract since the works have been in full operation is twelve thousand this is exclusive of brickmakers employed by the contractors the number of whom on the line during the season from april to september is from seven hundred to eight hundred engines the locomotive power employed in transporting passengers and goods on a railway is simply that of the high pressure steam engine adapted to a carriage and accompanied by a tender to supply it with fuel the carriages containing goods and passengers are connected in a train behind the engines used at the present day weigh about ten tons the tender with its water and fuel weighs about three and a half tons the cost of an engine and tender is about twelve hundred pounds and the annual cost of repairs to an engine in constant use may be estimated at eight hundred pounds the consumption of coke is about six hundred pounds per hour an engine of the above description will transport from one hundred to two hundred forty tons on a level line at a rate of from ten to twelve miles an hour with a working steam pressure of fifty pounds to the square inch each boiler has two safety valves one of which is placed wholly out of the power of the engine man to tamper with in some of the boilers there is also a hole bored at a level below that at which the water ought to stand into which a plug is soldered with lead if therefore by any means the water should fall below that level the solder becomes melted and the plug falling out affords a vent for the steam and thus renders it wholly impossible for the boiler to burst it is to be borne in mind that the great superiority of a railway with locomotive engines over a common road becomes materially diminished if the road is not an exact level at great inclinations the power is entirely lost with an incline of one in two hundred it is less than one half at one in fifty an engine will but just draw itself and at one in twelve it will not ascend at all the force exerted causing the wheels to turn round on the same spot instead of advancing it is also of great importance to avoid abrupt curves or sudden turnings the character of the country through which a railway passes or the avoidance of particular estates render curves oftentimes compulsory but they are not of a less radius than a mile unless near a stopping place means have been provided to assist in a slight measure the engines going up an inclination by making use of a little additional pressure of the steam by partially stopping at the time the flow of water to the boiler but even this will not compensate for an incline however trivial in the part of the london and birmingham line now open in which the line chiefly rises from london 
although the rise in no part exceeds one in three hundred four still there is generally a difference in the time of travelling to and from london the speed however in both directions will be greater when the whole of the line is opened a consummation devoutly to be wished advantages the dangers of travelling upon ordinary roads are considerably greater than by railways this will be obvious when we reflect that upon the inside of the wheels of railway carriages there is a flange or guide which effectually prevents them by any means getting off the rail on a common road on the contrary the carriage has no hold whatever of the ground beyond that which gravity gives it and is liable to be deranged from many causes the importance and benefit of railway communication not only to london but to the most distant parts of the kingdom must be so evident that any attempt on my part to point out either the one or the other would no doubt be considered superfluous but i cannot help expressing my ardent hope that poor old ireland the land of my birth will derive some advantage from the facility of communication between the two capitals in twenty-four hours by the art of man we are enabled to reach dublin from london by a transit so easy and at so moderate an expense that surely the friends of the country will visit it to see to admire and to suggest plans for its improvement let its enemies visit it and their prejudices must be removed they yet know it not who that has ever visited that fine but ill-used country has not returned convinced of its inexhaustible resources though doomed by a combination of events to be the most degraded and impoverished country in europe what impartial observer but would bear testimony to the bravery talent and the hospitality of its sons alas my poor country would that i could do more constables are placed at distances from one mile to one mile and a half along the entire line each man is furnished with two flags red and white during the day and a lamp at night which is made to show either a white green or red light the first announces to the engineer of the approaching train that there is no impediment the green colour directs him to slacken the speed of the train and the red to stop it as soon as possible the flags are used for a similar purpose except that upon seeing the red flag the engineers lessen the speed which renders a green flag unnecessary the inspector at each station has a portion of these men under his orders they are on duty that is walking backwards and forwards on their beat from half an hour before the passing of the first train in the morning until after the passing of the last train at night i can vouch to their promptitude from personal knowledge having spoken with every man from london to birmingham when i surveyed the line for the purpose of giving the public a correct description of every part from my own observation and i am convinced that were the directors themselves placed on the line they could not display greater anxiety than these men do for the protection and safety of those travelling on the railway each man besides being in the employ of the company is sworn as a county constable they receive the same pay and wear a dress similar to that of the metropolitan police except in colour which is green watch boxes are placed at certain distances on the line to protect the men from bad weather receipt tickets on paying your fare at either of the booking offices in london or at the stations tickets are given coloured according to the class carriage you are going in in london they give pink for the first class white for the second along the line and at birmingham the colours are first class yellow second blue these tickets are taken from passengers at the end of their journey but must be shown at denby hall and rugby when you arrive at the former place on your way to birmingham and leave the trains show your ticket presenting it open and according to the colour a card will be given marked c or b coach or omnibus and numbered this entitles the holder to a seat in one of the conveyances which are also numbered when the passengers have taken their seats a person collects the cards a bell rings and away they go 
like so many stagecoaches starting for the saint Leger. At the period I visited this now celebrated spot, April 24th, nine conveyances started, each taking fifteen persons, making one hundred and thirty-five, but as the season advances, the company will no doubt be obliged to increase the number of coaches. The contractors, Messrs. Chaplin and Horn, with a view to prevent any inconvenience or delay to passengers, either at Denby Hall or Rugby, have placed a responsible person at each station, whose business is to superintend the transfer of travellers, and by whose indefatigable exertions much confusion is avoided. Complaints, should any just cause arise, ought to be made to Mr. Franklin at Denby Hall, and Mr. Brotherton at Rugby. Luggage much anxiety is frequently evinced on the part of travellers respecting their trunks, carpet-bags, hat-cases, etc. Indeed, as there are generally between one and two hundred passengers by the same train, there must be a great quantity of luggage, and being unacquainted with the arrangements of the company for the speedy and safe conveyance of it between Denby Hall and Rugby, the passengers are frequently heard exclaiming, "'Where's my trunk?' where's my portmanteau marked l l d a s s pray mr porter have you seen my bonnet box i am sure my best tuscan will be squeezed to atoms oh dear such quick travelling that one flies away from one's things the fact is that to prevent the unnecessary delay of unloading at denby hall and reloading at rugby a road van is filled with the luggage destined for birmingham at the euston square station on the arrival of the train at denby hall this van is taken off the train four horses are put to and it is immediately forwarded to rugby where it is again attached to the train in this manner the invisible luggage reaches its destination without being disturbed from london to birmingham the luggage of those who stop at any of the intermediate places are placed on the roofs of the carriages and there are lockers under the seats into which carpet-bags, hat-cases, or small parcels can be conveniently put. It would save some trouble and anxiety to travellers were they to see their small parcels put under the seat of the carriage in which they place themselves, and the larger description placed upon the roof of the same conveyance, between Denby Hall and Rugby. Always have your name and destination affixed to each piece of luggage, by this means, in case of its being mislaid, it would be forwarded to the nearest station, where it can be reclaimed. There is, I think, even now, scarcely a possibility of luggage being lost, much less when the whole line is open. I could not help noticing the awkwardness of many of the green porters, particularly at Rugby. Choice of Carriages and Seats it was the original intention of the company, by numbering the seats of the carriages, to give the passengers tickets accordingly, and I believe the plan was acted upon for a short time, but found to cause much confusion, and was therefore abandoned. Indeed, allotting particular seats to the concourse of persons travelling by the railway would be almost impossible. The method of numbering the seats in public conveyances is almost universally practised on the continent, with great facility and benefit to the passengers, and if adopted in our mails and stage-coaches, would be the cause of preventing the disagreeable squabbles for places which so often occur. In the mails and first-class carriages, where all the seats are alike comfortably fitted up, I should imagine that preference cannot possibly exist. Ladies have not even the old-fashioned excuse of, "'Can't sit with my back to the horses,' for should there be any horses attached to the train, they will be found where my countryman found his coat-tails, behind. The stagecoach passenger's rule is now applicable to railway coaches, and the first comer has the choice of seats, which, like the choice of seats at a rubber of whist, is all fancy. In the second-class carriages, or rather wagons, there is certainly a preference to be observed, in the first place, get as far from the engine as possible, for three reasons. First, should an explosion take place, you may happily get off with the loss of an arm or a leg, whereas if you should happen to be placed near the said piece of hot machinery, and an unfortunate accident really occur, 
you would very probably be smashed to smithereens, as Brother Jonathan most expressively terms the likely result of such an occurrence. Secondly, the vibration is very much diminished the further you are away from the engine. Thirdly, always sit, if you can get a seat, with your back towards the engine, against the boarded part of the wagon. By this plan, you will avoid being chilled by a cold current of air which passes through these open wagons, and also save you from being nearly blinded by the small cinders which escape through the funnel. A screen of fine gauze, fastened at the top of the funnel, would prevent this, and in no way interfere with the smoke. Stations. The principal stations at present are at Watford, Tring, Denby Hall, Rugby, and Coventry. At each of these places, two clerks, a police inspector, and several policemen and porters are in attendance. At the secondary stations, which are the Harrow, Boxmoor, Berkhamsted, and Leighton Buzzard, there is but one clerk, an inspector, and a less number of policemen and porters. At all the stations, accommodation has been provided for the passengers, both on arrival and departure. Denby Hall will be but a secondary station when the line is open to Wolverton. This will account for the want of those substantial buildings which are found at Rugby and the other principal stations. Under the head of the respective stations will be found the exact time when the trains arrive, both up and down, but I would recommend every person to be there at least a quarter of an hour before the time specified. Regulations. Time of Departure. The doors of the booking office will be closed precisely at the time appointed for starting, after which no passenger can be admitted. Luggage. Each passenger's luggage will be placed on the roof of the coach in which he has taken his place. Carpet bags and small luggage may be placed underneath the seat opposite to that which the owner occupies. No charge for bona fide luggage belonging to the passenger under 100 pounds weight. Above that weight, a charge will be made at the rate of one pence per pound for the whole distance. The attention of travelers is requested to the legal notice exhibited at the different stations respecting the limitation of the company's liabilities to the loss or damage of luggage. Gentlemen's Carriages and Horses Gentlemen's Carriages and Horses must be at the stations at least a quarter of an hour before the time of departure. A supply of trucks will be kept at all the principal stations on the line, but to prevent disappointment, it is recommended that previous notice should be given, when practicable, at the station where they may be required. No charge for landing or embarking carriages or horses on any part of the line. Road Stations Passengers intending to join the trains at any of the stopping places are required to be in good time, as the train will leave each station as soon as ready, without reference to the time stated in the printed tables, the main object being to perform the whole journey as expeditiously as possible. Passengers will be booked only conditionally upon there being room on the arrival of the trains, and they will have the preference of seats in the order in which they are booked. No persons are booked after the arrival of the train. All persons are requested to get into and alight from the coaches invariably as directed by the conductor, as the only certain means of preventing accidents. Conductors, Guards, and Porters Every train is provided with guards and a conductor, who is responsible for the order and regularity of the journey. The company's porters will load and unload the luggage, and put it into or upon any omnibus or other carriage at any of the stations. No fees or gratuities allowed to conductors, guards, porters, or other persons in the service of the company. Smoking, selling of liquors, etc. No smoking will be allowed in the station houses, or in any of the coaches, even with the consent of the passengers. No person will be allowed to sell liquors or eatables of any kind upon the line. The company earnestly hope that the public will cooperate with them in enforcing this regulation, as it will be the means of removing a cause of delay, and will greatly diminish the chance of accident. Parcels. The charge for parcels, including booking and delivery, are as follows. 
under fifty miles under twenty eight pounds one shilling tuppence above one half tuppence per pound above fifty miles under twenty pounds one shilling eight pence above one pence per pound end of introduction to the iron road book and railway companion or a journey from london to birmingham by francis coglan the legend of don no yo Gua rock by helen mcgowan carpenter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org introduction for forty six miles the san francisco and north pacific railway the picturesque route of california skirts the russian river a few of the many lovely views en route are shown in this little brochure this beautiful country was once occupied by the pomo indians a brave and flourishing tribe of whom but very few families remain many of the local features are hallowed by the indian folklore the legend of da no yo squaw rock so charmingly written by mrs h m carpenter of ukiah is presented to the reader among the many extant indian legends of squaw rock none has appeared which relates to the face of stone on the summit of this noted mountain the following is substantially as given by a direct descendant of conchitati a pomo chief who lived in the shadow of da no yo when time was young this chief was particularly noted for preserving the peace and harmony of his own tribe and others with which he came in contact his faithful squaw machata kingfisher devoted her time to her two sons kababa brave one and butaso little bear and as is the custom at the present day gathered the buckeye and acorn as a means of subsistence while her lord smoked his pipe or enjoyed a nap in the sunshine as the sons approached manhood they were inseparable companions and partook of the peaceful disposition of their illustrious father one day after vainly endeavoring to catch enough fish for dinner a very beautiful indian woman suddenly appeared before them when she merely looked into the water fish and turtles came out upon the sand and lay at her feet she pointed to the east and west and all kinds of birds and beasts were at once before her kababa the elder son who was to be chief of the tribe when the tati went to the happy hunting ground conceived the idea of making this young woman his wife feeling assured that at least a good living was in store for him through this arrangement divining his thoughts which did not meet with her approval as it is supposed she was already enamoured of butaso she declared in consequence of his selfish motives he should never be the chief of his tribe which so enraged kababa that he threw a fishing spear at her this missed its fair mark and was buried in the bosom of butaso all was immediately in darkness thunder rolled lightning flashed and the whole earth was convulsed from out the storm the woman's voice was heard pronouncing maledictions on the head of kababa and commanding him to hide himself in danaoyo and do penance for all time while he suffered in darkness she said the face of butatso should stand upon his sepulchre as a warning to all evildoers the disappearance of the chief's sons and the face of one of them engraved in stone upon the mountain overlooking their home so frightened the tribe that they fled to the north and no tribe has since had the temerity to live in sight of the face on don Alio. here the legend ends and we take up the threads and weave a little net of well-authenticated fact when the san francisco and north pacific railway wound through the picturesque canyon of chehuld badada russian river a tunnel pierced the base of danaoyo thus opening the door of kababa's prison and liberating him in fear of detection and a return to his solitary quarters he cautiously crept to his childhood's home only to find desolation turning his eyes to the summit of danaoyo he was transfixed with terror at beholding the face of butaso looking grimly down upon him 
held by an invisible power he gazes on unable to turn his eyes even to the bear deer quail and squirrel that venture so near peering in wonder at the lone man who is to suffer on through all eternity as he keeps his silent vigil of danayo advertisement the way to reach the russian river and its scenic surroundings is by the san francisco and north pacific railway the picturesque route of california continuous riding over this road does not become monotonous owing to the variety and constant change of scenery traversing as it does marin sonoma russian rivers sanel and ukiah valleys the hand of man in dotting the country with orchards vineyards grain fields homes towns and villages has most beautifully blended the domestic with nature's wildness from san francisco to ukiah the terminus of the road is only a hundred and thirteen miles the county's tributary marin sonoma mendocino and lake are known as the most fertile in the pacific coast the winds from the pacific ocean tempered by the bordering coast range and redwood forests produce a mild and salubrious climate so enjoyable to the healthy and refreshing to the weak the hotels and resorts and the numerous and various mineral springs afford every opportunity for health and recreation this section is specially desirable to the home seeker owing to the variety and profusion of products which can be raised and without irrigation for in this section renowned for its richness and fertility and wonderful soil products there is not one acre under irrigation ticket office six fifty market street chronicle building general office mutual life building san francisco End of The Legend of Don Ayo, Squaw Rock, by Helen McCowan Carpenter, read by David Wales. The Natural Equality of Men to be Acknowledged, by Samuel Pufendorf, 1632-1694, from The Whole Duty of Man, According to the Law of Nature. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Man is a creature not only most solicitous for the preservation of himself, but has of himself also so nice an estimation and value that to diminish anything thereof does frequently move in him as great indignation as if a mischief were done to his body or estate. Nay, there seems to him to be somewhat of dignity in the appellation of man, so that the last and most efficacious argument to curb the arrogance of insulting men is usually, I am not a dog, but a man as well as yourself. Since then human nature is the same in us all, and since no man will or can cheerfully join in society with any by whom he is not at least to be esteemed equally as a man and as a partaker of the same common nature it follows that amongst those duties which men owe to each other this obtains the second place that every man esteem and treat another as naturally equal to himself or as one who is a man as well as he now this equality of mankind does not alone consist in this that men of ripe age have almost the same strength or if one be weaker he may be able to kill the stronger either by treachery or dexterity or by being better furnished with weapons but in this that though nature may have accomplished one man beyond another with various endowments of body and mind yet nevertheless he is obliged to an observation of the precepts of the law natural towards the meaner person after the same manner as himself expects the same from others and has not therefore any greater liberty given him to insult upon his fellows as on the other side the niggardliness of nature or fortune cannot of themselves set any man so low as that he shall be in worse condition as to the enjoyment of common right than others but what one man may rightfully demand or expect from another the same is due to others also 
circumstances being alike from him and whatsoever one shall deem reasonable to be done by others the like it is most just he practise himself for the obligation of maintaining society among mankind equally binds every man neither may one man more than another violate the laws of nature in any part not but that there are other popular reasons which illustrate this equality to wit that we are all descended from the same stock that we are all born nourished and die after the same manner and that god has not given any of us certain assurance that our happy condition in the world shall not at one time or other be changed besides the precepts of the christian religion tell us that god favors not man for his nobility power or wealth but for sincere piety which may as well be found in a mean and humble man as in those of high degree now from this equality it follows that he who would use the assistance of others in promoting his own advantage ought to be as free and ready to use his power and abilities for their service when they want his help and assistance on the like occasions for he who requires that other men should do him kindnesses and expects himself to be free from doing the like must be of opinion that those other men are below himself and not his equals hence as those persons are the best members of a community who without any difficulty allow the same things to their neighbor that themselves require of him so those are also incapable of society who setting a high rate on themselves in regard to others will take upon them to act anything towards their neighbor and expect greater deference and more respect than the rest of mankind in this insolent manner demanding a greater portion unto themselves in those things to which all men have a common right they can in reason claim no larger a share than other men whence this also is an universal duty of the law natural that no man who has not a peculiar right ought to arrogate more to himself than he is ready to allow to his fellows but that he permit other men to enjoy equal privileges with himself the same equality also shows that every man's behavior ought to be when his business is to distribute justice among others to wit that he treat them as equals and indulge not that unless the merits of the cause require it to one which he denies to another for if he do otherwise he who is discountenanced is at the same time affronted and wronged and loses somewhat of the dignity which nature bestowed upon him whence it follows that things which are in common are of right to be divided by equal parts among those who are equal where the thing will not admit of division they who are equally concerned are to use it indifferently and if the quantity of the thing will bear it as much as each party shall think fit but if this cannot be allowed then it is to be used after a stated manner and proportionate to the number of the claimants because tis not profitable to find out any other way of observing equality but if it be a thing of that nature as not to be capable of being divided nor of being possessed in common then it must be used by turns and if this yet will not answer the point and it is not possible the rest should be satisfied by an equivalent the best way must be to determine possession by lot for in such cases no fitter method can be thought on to remove all opinion of partiality and contempt of any party without debasing the person whom fortune does not favor the consideration of this natural equality among men ought to take from us all pride a vice which consists herein when a man without any reason or without sufficient reason prefers himself to others behaving himself contemptuously and haughtily towards them as being in his esteem base underlings unworthy of his consideration or regard we say without any reason 
for where a man is regularly possessed of some right which gives him a preference to other men he may lawfully make use of and assert the same so it be without vain ostentation and the contempt of others as on the contrary every one is with good reason to yield that respect and honour which is due to another but for the rest true generosity is always for its companion a decorous humility which arises from a reflection on the infirmity of our nature and the faults of which ourselves either have been or may hereafter be guilty which are not less heinous than those which may be committed by other men the inference we ought to make from hence is that we do not overvalue ourselves with regard to others considering that they equally with us are endowed with the free use of their understanding which they are also capable of managing to as good purpose the regular use whereof is that alone which a man can call his own and upon which the true value of himself depends what for a man without any reason to set a high esteem upon himself is a most ridiculous vice first because tis in itself silly for a man to carry it high for nothing at all and then because i must suppose all other men to be coxcombs if i expect from them a great regard when i deserve none the violation of this duty is yet carried farther if a man show his contempt for another by outward signs actions words looks or any other abusive way and this fault is therefore the more grievous because it easily excites the spirits of men to anger and revenge so that there are many who will rather venture their lives upon the spot much more will they break the public peace then put up an affront of that nature counting that hereby their honour is wounded and a slur is put upon their reputation in the untainted preservation of which consists all their self-satisfaction and pleasure of mind end of the natural equality of men to be acknowledged by samuel puffendorf sixteen thirty two to sixteen ninety four from the whole duty of man according to the law of nature of interpretation of dreams by heinrich cornelius agrippa von nettlesheim fourteen eighty six to fifteen thirty five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org of interpretation of dreams here we may usher in the interpretation of dreams called oneirocritica whose interpreters are properly called conjecturers according to that verse in euripides he that conjectures least amiss of all the best of prophets is to this delusion not a few great philosophers have given not a little credit especially democritus aristotle and his follower themistius senesius also the platonic so far building upon examples of dreams which some accident hath made to be true that thence they endeavour to persuade men that there are no dreams but what are real for say they as the celestial influences produce diverse forms in corporeal matter so out of certain influences predominating over the power of the fancy the impressions of visions is made being consentaneous through the disposition of the heavens to the effect which is to be produced more especially in dreams because the mind being then at liberty from all corporeal cares and exercises more freely receives the divine influences therefore it happens that many things are revealed in dreams to them that are asleep which are concealed from them that wake with these reasons they pretend to beget a good opinion of the truth of dreams but as to the causes of dreams both external and internal they do not all agree in one judgment for the platonics reckon them among the specific and concrete notions of the soul 
avisen makes the cause of dreams to be an ultimate intelligence moving the moon in the middle of that light with which the fancies of men are illuminate while they sleep aristotle refers the cause thereof to common sense but placed in the fancy avieros places the cause in the imagination democritus ascribes it to little images or representatives separated from the things themselves albertus to the superior influences which continually flow from the skies through many specific mediums the physicians impute the cause thereof to vapours and humours others to the affections and cares predominant in persons when awake others join the powers of the soul celestial influences and images together all making but one cause arthemidorus and aldianus have written of the interpretation of dreams and certain books go about under abraham's name whom philo in his book of the giants and of civil life asserts to have been the first practitioner thereof other treatises there are falsified under the names of david and solomon wherein are to be read nothing but mere dreams concerning dreams but marcus cicero in his book of divination hath given sufficient reasons against the vanity and folly of those that give credit to dreams which i purposely here omit End of, of interpretation of dreams by Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa von Nettlesheim, fourteen eighty six to fifteen thirty five. Poets as Landscape Painters by Leonora Blanche Lang. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org poets are a fortunate race the art of rhyming was still lately so far beyond the power of most people that the few who possessed it were looked on with awe and allowed to commit all sorts of crimes unmolested breaches of the decalogue might be urged on the reader and he only smiled as he murmured poetical license high treason and sedition might be sought but as long as they were taught in verse nobody cared it is time however that moralists and teachers of the exact scientists made a stand at the false statements of poets as landscape painters how many of us have had our minds fatally corrupted by the astonishing description in campbell's stirring poem of thy wild and stormy steep elsinore the imaginative infant instantly figures to itself bare beetling crags stretching far into a sea that is forever swirling at its base the foam mingling with the white wings of the circling sea-birds and the picture remains long after he has become aware of the actual facts that at elsinore the sound is bordered by a flat green stretch of land what in scotland would be called a hoe that there is no cliff no seagulls no nothing to the end of its life the child harbors a sense of injury towards the inoffensive elsinore he feels towards it as grown people feel towards the original of a very flattering portrait as if the sitter was in some way responsible and that they would like to be revenged on him if they only got the chance if the child is conscientious and of a truthful nature his whole future will be poisoned by campbell's rash statement concerning elsinore he will dread to visit rome lest the tiber instead of tossing his tawny mane should turn out a blue and tranquil stream he will shun mont blanc for fear that the arve and averian instead of raging at its base may prove to be in some distant valley cashmere will be a sealed book to him for who is to know if the roses really are bright by the calm bendemere or if it is merely the convolvulus or cowslip which flourishes by those waters wordsworth is certainly a more trustworthy guide in this important question than most of his rivals and has less inaccuracy on his conscience 
the very qualities which made him a faithful chronicler of betty foy and her afflicted offspring led him to be careful and accurate in his descriptions of scenery and if the plough and harrow are not precisely the first images suggested by the mention of pleasant teviotdale but rather the echo of the baaing of many lambs both plough and harrow are implements by no means unknown to the inhabitants in his description of the notorious swan on still st mary's loch wordsworth is deserving of all praise think what a temptation to create as scott did a herd of swans arching their graceful necks and gazing complacently at their reflections in the limpid waters but no he was proof against all the blandishments of the muse and confined himself strictly to the truth which was that there was one swan and no more on the loch why there should be only one swan and if it is always the same and when it first came there are questions which the student of natural history may be able to answer to the uninitiated they are as darkly mysterious as the origin of prester john but this swan goes about killing young ducks in proportion as wordsworth is to be commended for the retinue and dignity of his attitude towards the swan of st mary's loch we must severely condemn scott for his account of the home whether permanent or temporary of that interesting bird even in scotland many people have no idea of the existence of such a spot as st mary's while in england it is quite safe to assert that it would never have been heard of at all had it not been honourably mentioned by these two poets but the children of larger growth who are impelled by scott's majestic lines to drive eighteen miles from selkirk or nearly as many from moffat to visit st mary's silent lake will be rather bewildered when book in hand they compare the reality with the description in marmion thou knowest it well nor fen nor sedge pollutes the pure lake's crystal edge abrupt and sheer the mountains sink at once upon the level brink and just a trace of silver sand marks where the water meets the land far in the mirror bright and blue each hill's huge outline you may view shaggy with heath but lonely bare there is not a single statement in these nine lines which is not open to criticism or even contradiction the numerous and pretty water weeds keep themselves well below the surface serving the double purpose of shelter for the fish and traps for the lines of the fishermen the mountains so far from being abrupt and sheer are round pudding-shaped lumps of no great height and perfectly easy of ascent from any part of the shore if the traveller has the mountaineering mania strong upon him the silver sand turns out to be a streak of windstones only visible when a dry summer has left the shores bare otherwise the water comes right up to the edge of the grass as to the brightness and blueness of the mirror that is a matter of the luck of the particular tourist though certainly the poet was so far right when he spoke of the reflections whether the water be grey or blue the reflections are equally firm and clear and no dog could be accounted a fool for mistaking here the shadow for the substance but when the conscientious explorer turns to look for the huge outline of the objects reflected he snorts with indignation the tallest of them does not seem above six hundred feet and its outline would not disgrace an apple dumpling or a dish cover three false statements in as many lines naturally make the humble student of poetry and nature suspicious as to the rest but he bounds with surprise when he is next asked to look upon the hills as shaggy with heath this is the crowning insult to his understanding for however long his sight and keen his eyes he may sweep the horizon to the end of his life without being able to detect more than one hill with heather on it this is the great drawback to the hills of the south of scotland their shapes are often fine but with few exceptions their green is apt to become monotonous except for the brief space in the autumn when the bracken changes into gold after this nothing matters the thousand rills which flow into the lake the country for scotland is curiously destitute of them 
and the solitude which is profaned by a horse's hoofs though not apparently by the baaing of the endless sheep may pass unnoticed but our faith is shaken it may be true that on occasion known to the poet the lake heaves her broad billows to the shore and that eagles scream around loch skane but perhaps the strangest part of the whole is that these assertions should be quoted in all the local guide-books as if they were literally true yet even a landlord of an inn can see that they are purely fanciful and that st mary's and loch skane are no more like scott's pictures than the ladies who sit to me r a resemble his charming portraits end of poets as landscape painters by leonora blanche lang read by david wales the progress of nationalism in the united states by edward bellamy author of looking backward this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by The Progressing America Project. The Progress of Nationalism in the United States. Technically, the term nationalism, as descriptive of a definite doctrine of social and industrial reform, was first used in 1888 by clubs made up of persons who sympathized with the ideas of a proper industrial organization, set forth in looking backward, and believed in the feasibility of their substantial adoption as the actual basis of society. Nationalism, in this strict sense, is the doctrine of those who hold that the principle of popular government, by the equal voice of all, for the equal benefit of all, which, in advanced nations, is already recognized as the law of the political organization, should be extended to the economical organization as well, and that the entire capital and labor of nations should be nationalized and administered by their people through their chosen agents for the equal benefit of all under an equal law of industrial service. In this sense of a definite philosophy and a positive program, nationalism is a plant of very recent growth. It would, however, be quite impossible to understand the reasons for its remarkable popularity and rapid spread and equally impossible to calculate the probabilities of its future development without taking into account the evolutionary processes of which it is the outcome. The very idea of the nation as an organization, for the purpose of using the collective forces for the general protection and welfare, logically involved, from the beginning, the extension of that organization to the industrial as well as to the political affairs of the people. Until the democratic idea became prevalent, it was, however, possible for privileged classes to hold back this evolution, and so for unnumbered ages it has been held back. From the period at which the democratic idea gained ascendancy, it could be a question of but a short time before the obvious interests of the majority of the people should lead to the democratizing of the national economic system to accord with the political system. The nationalist movement in the United States, instead of waiting till this late day, would have arisen fifty years ago as the natural sequence of the establishment of popular government and of the recognition that the national organization exists wholly and only for the promotion of the people's welfare had it not been for the intervention of the slavery issue. It would indeed be more accurate to say that in a broad sense of the word, the nationalist movement did arise fifty years ago, for in spirit, if not in form, it may be said to date back to the forties. Those who are not familiar with the history of the extraordinary wave of socialistic enthusiasm which swept over the United States at that period and led to the Brook Farm Colony and a score of phalansteries for communistic experiments have missed one of the most significant as well as most picturesque chapters of American history. Some of the most eminent persons in the country, and many who afterwards became eminent, were connected with or in sympathy with these enterprises that Horace Greeley would very possibly have devoted himself to some line of socialistic agitation, had not the slavery struggle come on, will surely be questioned by none who are familiar with his correspondence and early writings, and in this respect he was representative of a large group of strong and earnest spirits. But slavery had to be done away with, before talk of a closer, kinder brotherhood of men was in order, or, indeed, anything but a mockery. So it was that presently these humane enthusiasts, these precursors of nationalism, were drawn into the overmastering current of the anti-slavery agitation. 
Then came the war, which should be ranked the greatest in history, not merely on account of the extent of the territory and of the vastness of the armies involved, but far more because it issued, as such a war never did before, in the speedy reconciliation of the foes. The reunion of the North and South after the struggle is the best proof of the progress of humanity that history records, the best evidence that the nationalist motto, we war with systems, not with men, is not in advance of the moral sense of the nation we appeal to. The din of the fight had barely ceased when the progress of evolution towards economic nationalism resumed its flow with an impetus only heightened by its interruption. But social conditions, meanwhile, had profoundly changed for the worse, and with them the character of the economic controversy, which now became full of rancor and bitterness. The speculative opportunities offered by the war had developed the millionaire and his shadow, the tramp. Contrasts of wealth, luxury, and arrogance, with poverty, want, and abjectness, never before witnessed in America, now on every side, mocked the democratic ideal and made the republic a laughing stock. The Panic of 1873, with the seven lean years that followed in its train, ushered in the epoch of acute industrial discontent in this country. Then began the war between labor and capital. The phenomena of the period have been, on the one hand, ever enlarging aggregations of capital, and the appropriation of the business field by groups of great monopolies, and, on the other hand, unprecedented combinations of labor in trades unions, federations of unions, and the knights of labor. Both classes of phenomena, the combinations of capital and of labor, were equally significant of the evolution towards economic nationalism. The rise of the knights of labor, the great trades unions, the federation of trades, and, on the agricultural side, of the grangers, patrons of husbandry, farmers' alliances, and many other organizations, were demonstrating the feasibility of organizing the workers on a scale never dreamed of, while on the other side, the enormous and ever-growing trusts and syndicates were proving the feasibility of organizing and centralizing the administration of capital on a scale of corresponding magnitude. Opposed as these two tendencies seemed, they were yet destined to be combined in the synthesis of nationalism and were necessary stages in its evolution. Both, alike, in all their phases, were blind gropings towards completer union, confessions of a necessity of organizing forces for common ends that could find their only logical result in nationalism when the nation should become at once employed and employer, and labor and capital be blended in indistinguishable union. Nor were there lacking, in the epoch spoken of, very conscious and definite appeals, although partial and inadequate ones, to the national idea as the proper line along which adequate remedies were to be sought. The Greenback Movement, in its argument that the oppressions and inadequacies of the monetary system could only be removed by taking the issue of money wholly out of the control, or influence, of private persons, and vesting it directly in the nation, was a distinct anticipation of nationalism. The same idea was very evident in the proposition to reject the gold or silver standard as the basis of money, and rest it broadly on the nation's assets and the nation's credit. It is true, indeed, that nationalism, by making the nation the only storekeeper, and its relations of distribution with each citizen a direct one, excluding middlemen, will dispense with buying and selling between individuals, and render greenbacks as superfluous as other sorts of money. Nevertheless, in the spirit of its appeal to the national idea, greenbackism was strongly tinctured with the sentiment of nationalism. Another of the fragmentary anticipations of nationalism during this period referred to was the rise of the Knights of Labor. The peculiar merit of this admirable body is the broadly humane basis of its organization, which gives it an ethical distinction necessarily lacking to the mere trades union. Its motto, an injury to one is the concern of all, if extended to all classes, would be a good enough one for the most thoroughgoing nationalist. The Knights of Labor, like the Greenbackers, believed in the national idea, and in dealing with the most formidable and dangerous class of private monopolies in this country, demanded the nationalization of the railroads. In enumerating the streams of tendency which were, during this period, converging towards nationalism, mention should also be made of the various anti-monopoly parties that from time to time arose as local and more or less national parties. The platforms of some of these parties were extremely radical, 
and the dominant idea in the suggestion of remedies was an appeal to the nation. Finally came the Henry George agitation. The extraordinary impression which Mr. George's book, Progress and Poverty, produced was a startling demonstration of the readiness of the public for some radical remedy of industrial evils. It is unnecessary to remind my readers that the nationalization of land was Mr. George's original proposition. The foregoing considerations may perhaps sufficiently indicate how far back in American history the roots of nationalism run, and how it may indeed be said to have been logically involved in the very principle of popular government on which the nation was founded. A book of propaganda like Looking Backward produces an effect precisely in proportion as it is a bare anticipation in expression of what everybody was thinking and about to say. Indeed, the seeming paradox might almost be defended that in proportion as a book is effective, it is unnecessary. The particular service of the book in question was to interpret the purport and direction of the conditions and forces which were tending towards nationalism, and thereby to make the evolution henceforth a conscious and not, as previously, an unconscious one. The nationalist who accepts that interpretation no longer sees in the unprecedented economical disturbances of the day a mere chaos of conflicting forces, but rather a stream of tendencies, through ever larger experiments in concentration and combination, towards the ultimate complete integration of the nation for economic as well as for political purposes. The sentiment of faith and good cheer, born of this clear vision of the glorious end, and of the conviction that the seemingly contradictory and dangerous phenomena of the times are necessary means to that end, distinguishes the temper of the nationalist as compared with that of other schools of reformers. The first nationalist club was organized in Boston by readers of Looking Backward in 1888. Almost simultaneously other clubs were organized in all parts of the country, something like 150, having been reported within the following two years, the reporting having, however, been very laxly attended to. There never was, perhaps, a reform movement that got along with less management than that of the nationalists. There has never been any central organization, and little if any mutual organization of the clubs. Wherever in any community, a few men and women have felt in sufficiently strong sympathy with the ideas of the nationalists to desire to do something to spread them. They have formed an organization and gone ahead, with as much or as little communication with other similar organizations as they have desired to have. While these clubs have been, and are of the greatest use, and have accomplished remarkable results in leavening entire communities with nationalism, there has never been any special effort to multiply them or otherwise to gather the whole body of believers into one band. We like to think that not one in a hundred who more or less fully sympathize with us is a member of a nationalist club, or probably ever will be until the nation becomes the one nationalist club. The practical work of the organized nationalists for the past four years has, of course, been chiefly educational, consisting in the effort, by lectures, books, and periodicals, to get their ideas before the people. The lack of a central organization on the part of the clubs prevents, very fortunately, the existence of any formal official organ. The nearest approach to such a publication was, at first, The Nationalist, a monthly, issued in Boston, which a year and a half ago was succeeded by The New Nation, a weekly, edited by the present writer, and devoted to the exposition of the principles and purposes of nationalism with the news of the movement. In the brief period that has elapsed since the origin of the nationalist movement, with its clearly defined philosophy and positive purpose, the growth of nationalism in this country has been accelerated in an extraordinary manner. While it is impossible not to ascribe the acceleration largely to the literature and work of the nationalists, it is not for a moment intended to imply that this growth is solely attributable to the strictly nationalist propaganda. Throughout this paper, the argument has been maintained that this specific movement is but the outcome of forces long in operation, which, by no means as yet wholly coalescing with strict nationalism, continue to work consciously or unconsciously towards the same inevitable result. It is unnecessary, surely, to do more than call attention to the great moral awakening upon the subject of social responsibilities and the ethical side, or rather the ethical soul and center, of the industrial question which has taken place within a very recent time. 
It was but yesterday that the pulpit was dumb on this class of themes, dumb because its hearers were deaf. Now, every Sunday, hundreds of pulpits throughout the land are preaching social duty and the solidarity of nations and of humanity, declaring the duty of mutual love and service, whereby the strong are made bondmen to the weak, to be the only key to the social problem. This is the very soul of nationalism. To be able to present this theme effectively has become the best passport of the clergyman to popular success, the secret of full houses. One of the most hopeful features of the nationalist outlook, from the first, has been the hardiness with which a large contingent of the clergy has enlisted in it, claiming that it was, as it truly is, nothing more than Christianity applied to industrial organization. This we hope to make so apparent that ere long all Christian men shall be obliged either to abjure Christ or come with us. The recent change in the trend of economic discussion as to the questions involved in the proposition of nationalism has not been less marked than the moral awakening. Until very recently, this country was 25 years behind the intelligence and practice of Europe as to sociological questions. That there might be such awkward things as strikes, we had, indeed, learned since 1873, but that there was any such thing as a great industrial social question, of which these were but symptoms, had not dawned upon the public, or on old-fashioned economists, who supposed that wisdom had died with Adam Smith. Remember that it was only a little while ago that the social evil was understood to refer exclusively to a special form of vice. It was imagined that there could not be any other social evil of consequence here in America unless, perhaps, it was intemperance in the use of alcoholic stimulants or tobacco. While the effete monarchies of Europe might have to rectify their institutions from time to time to keep pace with human progress, we rested in the serene conviction that General Washington and Mr. Jefferson had arranged our affairs for all time and that Negro slavery was the last problem we should have to dispose of. And let it be observed that these great patriots, in setting up popular self-government, did give us a finality of principle, but that an economic as well as a political method, in order to give effect to that principle, has now become necessary. Whereas now that easy complacency over the social situation, which so recently was the prevailing temper of our people, Economic discussion and the debate of radical social solutions absorb the attention of the country and are the preponderating topics of serious conversations. Economic papers have the precedence in our periodicals and, even in the purely literary magazine, they crowd the novel and the romance. Indeed, the novel with the sociological motive now sets the literary fashion and a course in political economy has become necessary to write a successful love story. It is not so much the increased volume of economic discussion that marks the social growth of nationalism as the fact that its tone is chiefly given by the adherents of the new and humane schools of political economy, which, until recently, had obtained but little hearing among us. Up to within a very few years, the old school of political economy, although it had long before begun to fall into discredit in Europe, still held practically undisputed sway in America. Today, the new school, with its socialistic method and sympathies, is the school to which nearly all the young and rising professors of political economy belong. The definition of labor as a commodity would now endanger the position of an instructor in that science in any institution of learning, which did not depend for its patronage upon a reputation for being behind the times. There are a few such yet, despite the growth of nationalism. The full program of nationalism, involving the entire substitution of public for private conduct of all business, for the equal benefit of all, is not, indeed, advocated by any considerable number of economists or prominent writers. They discuss chiefly details of the general problem, but, insofar as they propose remedies, it is significant that they always take the form of state and national management of business. It would not probably be too strong a statement to say, that the majority of the younger schools of political economists and economic writers on that subject now regard with favor state conduct of what they call natural monopolies, that is to say, telegraphs, telephones, railroads, local transit lines, waterworks, municipal lighting, etc. Natural monopolies are distinguished by this school 
as businesses in which the conditions practically exclude competition. Owing to the progress of the trusts and syndicates, businesses, not natural monopolies, are rapidly being made artificial ones with the effect of equally excluding competition. If the economists of the natural monopoly school follow the logic of their method, they are bound, in proportion as the progress of artificial monopolization abolishes their distinction, to become full-fledged nationalists. I have no doubt they will soon be wholly with us, as in spirit and tendency they now are. There is a great deal more that might be said of the recent and swiftly increasing movement of moral sentiment and scientific thought towards nationalism, but the limits of my space compel me to pass on to the consideration of what has been accomplished in the field of politics and legislation within the four years since its rise as a definite doctrine. The immediate propositions of the nationalists are on two lines. First, the nationalization of interstate business and business in the products or service of which people in more than one state are interested. Second, the state management or municipalization of businesses purely local in their relations. In the former line, the rise within two years of a third national political party, pledged to a large part of the immediate purposes of nationalism, is certainly the most notable phenomenon. The People's Party was formed in Cincinnati on February 22, 1891, and ratified and endorsed at St. Louis, May 19, 1892, by a convention representing the great farmers' alliances, white and colored, of the West and South, and also the Knights of Labor and other artisans' organizations. The platform adopted at St. Louis, as that on which the People's Party presidential candidates are to be nominated, and supported by these allied organizations, demands nationalization of the issue of money, nationalization of banking by means of postal savings banks for deposit and exchange, national ownership and operation of the telegraphs and telephones, national ownership and operation of the railroads, and declares the land, with its natural resources, the heritage of the nation. Remember that this platform voices the enthusiastic convictions and determination of many million voters belonging to organizations which have already carried several state elections, and which, as now united, may carry in the presidential election, as their opponents concede, four or five states, and, as they themselves expect, twice or thrice that number. If you would estimate the probable growth of nationalism in the next six months, remember that during that period, the demands of this platform and the arguments for them will be stated and reiterated weekly by the eight to ten hundred farmers' papers of the South and West, and dinned into their ears by regimens of orators. About half the farmers' weeklies of the West, it should be added, not only support the St. Louis platform, but take every occasion to declare that the adoption of the whole nationalist plan, with the industrial republic as its consummation, is but a question of time. Talk about nationalism, said one brawny farmer at the St. Louis Convention. Why, west of the Mississippi, we are all nationalists. In tracing the rise of this third party, it may be interesting to note that it was in the trans-Mississippi states, in the newly admitted states and the territories, and on the Pacific coast, where the People's Party now has its main strongholds, that the reception of looking backward was most general and enthusiastic. The growing economic distress in the great grain states had, no doubt, much to do with this readiness for a radical industrial solution, but the bold, adventurous temper of the people, perhaps even more. To a race of pioneers which had hewn mighty states out of the wilderness, and the desert within the lifetime of a generation, there was nothing to take the breath away, in a proposal to reconstruct industry on new lines. I have left myself little space wherein, to speak of what has been done for nationalism, in the line of the municipalization of local businesses. The nationalists of Boston and vicinity, in 1889, circulated petitions for the passage of a bill by the legislature, permitting municipalities to build and operate their own lighting plants, gas or electric. The bill failed in the legislature of 1889-1890, passing the House but being lost in the Senate. The Nationalists resumed the fight the next year on petitions bearing 13,000 names. The bill became a law after a bitter fight in which the Nationalists, backed by the labor organizations and a strong popular sentiment, were opposed by a combination of the electric and gas companies, representing $35 million of capital. Prior to that date, public lighting, 
although long a matter of course in Great Britain and Europe, was almost unknown in America. A striking illustration, by the way, of the incomprehensible manner in which America has lagged behind monarchical and aristocratic states in the practical application of its own patented idea of popular government. Up to the passage of the Municipal Lighting Bill in 1891, by the Massachusetts legislature, less than a dozen American towns had tried public lighting, and few people had even heard of their experiment. In the one year since then, sixteen towns and cities in Massachusetts alone, and as many in Ohio, have taken steps towards public lighting works, while a host of municipalities in the rest of the Union are following their example. If the Nationalists had done nothing more than point out the way of deliverance from the gas meter, they would surely have deserved well of the American people, but in doing that, they have done more. They have set the people thinking along the line of municipal self-help. The American citizen is not unintelligent as to the questions of profit and loss. Give him the ABC of business proposition, and he can usually be trusted to go through the alphabet without further assistance. Once convince him that public light service means, as a matter of demonstration and experience, as it does, a saving to the consumer of from 30 to 50 percent, and he will commence to scratch his head and ask why the same rule doesn't apply to waterworks and transit systems. By turning over such functions to private companies, aiming only at the largest possible profits, instead of discharging them directly, cities and towns subject themselves to a needless tax, aggregating more, in many cases, than the total tax levy for nominally public purposes, as if, indeed, any purpose could be more public than lighting, water supply, and transit. Wherever a private company can make a profit on serving the community, leaving aside watered stock, the people themselves, who take no profit from themselves, can do it just as much cheaper. All we nationalists want to do is to get people to reason along the line of their collective interests with the same shrewdness they show in pursuing their personal interests. That habit, once established, nationalism is inevitable. End of The Progress of Nationalism in the United States by Edward Bellamy Remarks on a Pamphlet by John Harrison this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Remarks on a Pamphlet, lately published by the Reverend Mr. Maskeline under the authority of the Board of Longitude, by John Harrison. A publication having lately been made by the Reverend Mr. Maskeline, Astronomer Royal, under the authority of the Board of Longitude, manifestly tending, by the suppression of some facts and the misrepresentation of others, to impress the world with an unjust opinion of my invention, and falsely asserting that my watch did not at certain periods therein mentioned keep time with sufficient exactness to determine the longitude within the limits prescribed by the act of the twelfth of queen anne i think it incumbent upon me to submit some observations thereon to the impartial public and the rather because the said pamphlet is rendered so confused by unnecessary repetitions and voluminous tables that a man must be pretty conversant in these matters to trace and combine the facts so as to check the conclusions which would consequently be taken upon trust by the generality of readers unless publicly contradicted as it will be my endeavour so far to avoid the use of all terms of art as to make the subject generally intelligible i flatter myself i shall not be thought impertinent for giving a short explanation though quite unnecessary for the far greater part of my readers, of what the longitude is, and what the service required of the watch. The longitude of any place is its distance east or west from any other given place, and what we want is a method of finding out at sea how far we are got to the eastward or westward of the place we sailed from. The application of a timekeeper to this discovery is founded upon the following principles. The Earth's surface is divided into 360 equal parts by imaginary lines drawn from north to south, which are called degrees of longitude, 
and its daily revolution eastward round its own axis is performed in twenty-four hours. Consequently, in that period, each of those imaginary lines or degrees becomes successively opposite to the sun, which makes the noon or precise middle of the day at each of those degrees, and it must follow that from the time any one of those lines passes the sun till the next passes must be just four minutes, for twenty-four hours being divided by three hundred sixty will give that quantity, so that for every degree of longitude we sail westward, it will be noon with us four minutes the later, and for every degree eastward, four minutes the sooner, and so in proportion for any greater or less quantity. Now, the exact time of the day at the place where we are can be ascertained by well-known and easy observations of the sun, if visible for a few minutes at any time from his being ten degrees high till within an hour of noon, or from an hour after noon till he is only ten degrees high in the afternoon. If, therefore, at any time when such observation is made, a timekeeper tells us at the same moment what o'clock it is at the place we sailed from, our longitude is clearly discovered. To do this, it is not necessary that a watch should perform its revolutions precisely in that space of time which the earth takes to perform hers, it is only required that it should invariably perform it in some known time, and then the constant difference between the length of the one revolution and the other will appear as so much daily gained or lost by the watch, which constant gain or loss is called the rate of its going, and with being added to or deducted from the time shown by the watch, will give the true time and consequently the difference of longitude. I shall now proceed to make such remarks as occur to me on perusal of Mr. Maskelyne's pamphlet. Mr. Maskelyne begins by telling us that the Board of Longitude, at their meeting April 26, 1766, came to a resolution that my watch should be tried at the Royal Observatory under his inspection, and that he accordingly received it on the 5th of May, 1766. He then says, I most days wound up and compared the watch with the transit clock of the Royal Observatory myself. At other times it was performed by my assistant Joseph Diamond, and afterwards William Bailey. This was always done in the presence of, and attested by, one of the officers of Greenwich Hospital, when he came to assist in unlocking the box in which the watch is kept, in order to its being wound up. Not one of those attestations appears in the book. Perhaps Mr. Maskelyne thinks his assertion of the fact will be sufficient for the public, and indeed so it might have been to me, had I not received different information. But the truth is, the commissions appointed a set of gentlemen to attend, by rotation, the winding up of the watch. They were to unlock the box the watch was in, to see it wound up and compared with the clock, then to lock the box again and take the key with them, and Mr. Maskelyne was to have another key, there being two locks to the box. Footnote. It may not perhaps be improper here to observe that the locks were such as might be picked with a crooked nail, that the lock of which the officers had the key was on the 10th of July out of order, and that Mr. Maskelyne was sorry this should ever come to the ear of the public. End footnote. The officers of Greenwich Hospital were appointed for this service, some of whom from the infirmities of age and misfortunes in the service were scarce able to get up the hill to the observatory, so that when they came there, as can be proved from undoubted eyewitnesses, they only unlocked the box, sat down till Mr. Maskelyne had done what he thought proper, and then locked the box again, and departed. And whatever attestation they may be supposed to have made, I can prove that at several times when gentlemen of my acquaintance happened to be present, the attendance of the officers was by no means an effectual check upon the comparison of the watch with the clock. 
I would not be thought to accuse those gentlemen of neglect of the duty imposed upon them. On the contrary, I applaud their diligence in being ready at all hours of the day to attend when Mr. Maskeline was pleased to appoint, and therefore I will even for the present, though contrary to fact, suppose they have been the check proposed by the commissioners of the longitude against any unfair access to the watch. Still, the clock with which it was compared was left entirely in Mr. Maskeline's power, and an alteration of the one could not but produce just the same effect as an error of the other. Nor is there even the least pretense of a check either on the clock, or on its comparison with observations of the sun. Nay, on the contrary, Mr. Maskeline did at this time take the key of the clock from Mr. Diamond, in whose custody it used to be, and kept it himself. Mr. Maskeline then proceeds to give us an account of the watch's going from day to day, which in his fifteenth page he concludes thus. From the foregoing numbers it appears that the watch was getting from the very first near twenty seconds per day, a circumstance which is not my business to account for, but which, as it kept near mean time in the voyage to Barbados, seems to show that the watch cannot be taken to pieces and put together again without altering its rate of going considerably, contrary to Mr. Harrison's assertions formerly. When I made the discovery, upon oath, of the principles and constructions of the watch to six gentlemen appointed by the Board of Longitude and to Mr. Maskeline, who insisted on having a right to attend as being a commissioner, which discovery was finished on the 22nd day of August, 1765, as appears by the annexed certificate, the watch then remained in my hands, all taken to pieces. I little imagined the Board of Longitude would take it from me, as not conceiving any use they could make of it, and having besides received assurances from them that they only wanted the formal delivery of it, in compliance with the terms of the new law without meaning to deprive me of the use of it. I therefore went on making some experiments, and altered the rate of its going, thereby to determine a fact I wanted to be satisfied about. The watch was under this experiment the latter end of October, 1765, when upon receiving the certificate for the remainder of the first moiety of my reward, I was ordered to deliver it to the board. My son, attending with it, being asked if it was then as fit as before to ascertain the longitude, replied in the affirmative, for as I have before shown, the rate of its going, when once ascertained, does not prevent its keeping the longitude. He was not asked the present rate of its going, nor could he have answered with precision if he had, because we had not had notice sufficient to determine that point. But we did, at that time, tell several of our friends that it went about eighteen or nineteen seconds a day fast, and we have at several times since, without ever dreaming that this was to become a point of public discussion, had occasion to mention the same thing to several members of Parliament, commissioners of longitude and other gentlemen, insomuch that we did not believe anybody was uninformed of it, who at all attended to the business of the longitude. This may serve to account for the circumstance which Mr. Maskeline declares it was none of his business to account for, why the watch was getting near twenty seconds per day, but as to his inference, I must say, it betrays the most absolute ignorance of mechanics, and of this machine in particular, in which it is obvious, and for this fact I appeal to the watchmakers who saw it taken to pieces, that its going at the same rate when put together again as before depends, if none of the parts are altered, upon nothing more complicated than putting a single screw into the same place from whence it was taken. Indeed, this passage and the ignorant and puerile remarks which Mr. Maskeline has been suffered to prefix to my written description of the watch to the disgrace of this country in those foreign translations it has already undergone, brings strongly to my remembrance an observation made by some of the gentlemen present at the discovery, 
that they wondered at his patience in attending so long to a subject he seemed so totally unacquainted with. Mr. Maskelyne then proceeds to tell us of a change that happened in the going of the watch, and says, This change began in the beginning of August, on the few and only hot days we had last summer, which yet were not extreme, the thermometer within doors having never risen above 73 degrees. The rest of the summer in general was remarkably cool and temperate. When I took this watch to pieces, I informed Mr. Maskelyne and the other gentlemen that in trying any experiments with it, in respect to heat and cold, it would be proper that it should be so fixed that, as far as could be, the heat should have an equal influence on all sides of it, and it is obvious that the thermometer ought to have been kept in the same box with it, but as this was not done, I apprehend the effects of heat mentioned above do not merit much attention, and therefore shall only observe that the watch was placed in a box with a glass in the lid, and another in one side, in the seat of a window level with the lowest pane of the window, and exposed to the south-east, whilst the thermometer, which was to ascertain the degree of heat the watch was exposed to, was placed in a shady part of the room. Now, it is obvious that while the air surrounding the thermometer might be very temperate, there might, if the sun shone upon it, be a heat in the box, superior to what was ever felt in the open air in any part of the world, and perhaps greater than any human being could subsist in, and consequently improper, or at least unnecessary, for this experiment. Mr. Maskelyne next tells us of an irregularity which he says happened in cold weather, and says, However, it seems in general that the frost must have been the cause of these irregularities, as well as of the watches going so much slower in the month of January than it had gone before. Mr. Maskelyne ought along with this to have published what I told him when I explained it, that the provision against the effects of heat and cold was not in this machine extended to all degrees, that I never had tried it so low as the freezing point, when according to the best informations I have been able to procure, is a degree of cold that never did exist between the decks of a ship at sea, in any climate yet explored by mankind. Mr. Maskelyne then comes to the rate of its going in different positions, and says, it is obvious, these last mentioned trials of the watch in a vertical position could not be designed to show how near it would go at sea, where it can never obtain these positions. The intent of them is to prove how near Mr. Harrison's execution of his watch comes up to his principles, with respect to the making all the arcs described by the balance, whether large or small, to be performed in the same time, as Mr. Harrison asserts them to be. Mr. Maskelyne here also might have had candour enough to inform the public, as I did him, that although the watch was quite sufficient to answer the purposes required of it in navigation, and to fulfil what was prescribed by the act of Queen Anne, yet it was far from being in a state of perfection, as a universal exact timekeeper for every purpose. I showed him and the rest of the gentlemen the reasons why the machine then, before them, would not go at the same rate in such different positions into which the motion of a ship could never put it, and whilst I explained to them those imperfections in the particular machine we were examining, I also, in the clearest manner I was able, pointed out the means of remedying them with certainty in others, which the gentlemen skilled in mechanics seemed perfectly to comprehend, and to be satisfied of the truth which I again assert, that watches made on my principles will endure a much greater motion and change of position than they can ever be subject to in a ship, and that they will not be affected by any degree of heat or cold in which a man can live. If anything was meant to be concluded with respect to me by this experiment, either in point of property or of reputation, Common justice would have required that I should have had an opportunity of seeing the facts ascertained, and when such a trial was directed as put the result in the absolute power of a single person, that I should have been satisfied of his integrity, disinterestedness, 
and ability for the purpose. I would not be understood to attack Mr. Maskelyne's knowledge of the theory of astronomy, as for anything I know to the contrary, it may be of the very first rate, especially as the commissioners have thought proper to entrust him with the execution of their commands, and which he has ever been as ready to undertake. But alas, as to his skill in mechanics, he knows little or nothing of the matter he has ventured to take in hand. I think it more consistent with the respect I owe to the public, and myself, to speak out plainly than to have recourse to insinuations on a subject of this nature. I therefore declare that I am not satisfied with the truth of his reporting other observations relative to the longitude, as I do maintain that in both his voyages the observations which he said he made the land by were not calculated till after he had seen the land, and I am certain those he has given, in the publication now before us, are not genuine, for he pretends to find each observation of the transit of the sun to be a hundredth part of a second of time, a degree of exactness about twenty times beyond what any other observer has hitherto found practicable. Moreover, I know him to be deeply interested in the lunar tables, a scheme set up some years ago for the reward in competition with my invention, and for which large sums of money have already been paid by the public. Although I flatter myself the reader is already in possession of very sufficient reasons for rejecting the whole pamphlet as partial and inconclusive, yet I entreat his patient attention whilst I advance one step farther, and show that although Mr. Maskelyne has presented us with a set of observations which, according to his mode of calculation, prove what he advances, yet those very observations, when rightly reasoned upon, prove the contrary, and that in each of the periods he refers to, except those of the severe frost and improper positions, against which Mr. Maskelyne ought to have informed the world I never warranted this particular watch, it kept time with sufficient correctness to determine the longitude within the limits of the act of Queen Anne. The reader by this time knows enough of the subject to see that in order to try whether the watch would or would not keep time with sufficient exactness to determine the longitude, Mr. Maskelyne's first operation, after receiving it, should have been to ascertain the rate of its going. But no such thing happened, he knew it had not gone exactly correspondent to mean time during the voyage to Barbados. It had been publicly enough declared that its rate of going had been since altered, and, if he had not received that information, he might, nay, must have discovered it in the first twenty-four hours' trial. However, without once attending to this essential circumstance, he goes to work, comparing the first period of six weeks, which he observes is generally reckoned the term of a West India voyage, when it was in a horizontal position, with mean time instead of the corrected time, and each succeeding period with that immediately preceding it. Who can hesitate in pronouncing that his conclusions must be all erroneous? He should first have ascertained the rate of its going by a length of observations of the sun or stars, or by a perfect pendulum clock if he had such a one, and then have corrected the time shown by the watch accordingly. However, supposing for a moment his facts to be genuine, I will deduce the real result in the best manner the observations will admit, rejecting those made while the watch was in improper positions, and those during the frost, for the same reasons that Mr. Maskelyne lays no stress upon them, and for those I have already stated. I shall therefore, pursuing his idea of six weeks, take it during the first tranquil six weeks that it had, that is, from July the 6th to August the 17th, in which time it gained in all 11 minutes 50 seconds, or 16 9 tenth seconds per day, which I will assume as the rate of its going. Or, if Mr. Maskelyne pleases, I will take the average of his whole time of examination, from the 6th of July to the 3rd of January, and from the ninth of January to the 4th of March, 
which will come out at the rate of sixteen eight tenth seconds per day fast and i say that according to either of those rates of going the watch kept the longitude within the limits of the act of queen anne during any period of six weeks that can be pointed out excepting those of extreme cold and improper position which have already been explained i do not trouble the reader with the calculations if i assert an untruth i shall hardly escape contradiction there is another inaccuracy which though of less consequence ought not to escape notice one would naturally suppose when mr maskelyne found the watch went at this rate of gaining on mean time he would have been very exact in his time of comparing it with his clock but on the contrary we find he was so irregular as to vary his comparisons on succeeding days from half an hour to four hours and forty-eight minutes and this not for a time or two but for one-third of the whole time he had it mr maskelyne having shown from the result of his calculation which i have here proved to be false that the watch is not to be depended upon to determine the longitude in a voyage of six weeks then says these considerations are sufficient to explain the motives which might have actuated mr harrison as a man of prudence in desiring to send his watch two voyages to the west indies upon his idea that he should be entitled to the large rewards prescribed in the act of the twelfth of queen anne in case his watch kept time within the limits there mentioned whether the method itself was or could be rendered generally useful and practicable or not this insinuation published under the authority of the commissioners of longitude that i had contrived a trial which i knew the watch would fulfil whilst i was conscious that it would not answer the general purposes of the act of queen anne and consequently that i had formed a villainous scheme to rob the public of the reward without really and effectually performing the conditions strikes me as a charge of so atrocious a nature that i think myself not only justified in publishing to the world what has been done with respect to trials of the merit of my invention but even indispensably obliged to do so i well know what i hazard thereby and if the rest of my reward cannot be obtained on principles of national faith and public spirit i am contented to forego it but i will not descend into the grave loaded with that dishonour which my enemies availing themselves of their rank or offices have in various ways attempted to throw upon me in the first place i must remark that the trial referred to was not fixed by me but by an act of parliament passed so long ago as the year seventeen fourteen which after vesting certain discretionary powers in commissioners to judge what methods are likely to prove practicable and authorizing them to issue smaller sums of money goes on to fix the last grand test of the merit of any such invention and enacts that when a ship under the appointment of the said commissioners shall thereby actually sail from great britain to the west indies without losing her longitude beyond certain limits the inventor shall be entitled to certain rewards having from the year seventeen twenty six employed myself in adapting those principles which i had at that time executed in a pendulum clock to an instrument or timekeeper so constructed as to endure the motion of a ship at sea and having made a voyage to lisbon and done sundry other things during a course of years mostly under the direction of the commissioners of longitude by way of preparatory experiments i thought the invention sufficiently perfect about the latter end of the year seventeen sixty to go upon the ultimate trial which i accordingly applied for my son after being sent to portsmouth with the third timekeeper the fourth or watch being to be sent to him was kept there five months waiting for orders which having by returning to london at length obtained he went to jamaica in the depthford man-of-war and returned in the merlin sloop of war having fulfilled every instruction of the commissioners it remained to compute from the astronomical observations made at portsmouth and jamaica 
whether the watch had or had not kept the longitude within the prescribed limits, and as my title to twenty thousand pounds was to be determined thereby, I thought it but reasonable that I should name some person to check the computations, which was refused. The commissioners appointed three gentlemen for that purpose, and on receiving the report were pleased to declare that the watch had not kept its longitude within the above-mentioned limits. Footnote. It may not be amiss to take notice here of an objection that was raised by two of the commissioners, both famous for their knowledge in astronomy, that is, that the observations of equal altitudes made at Portsmouth could not be depended on, because the equal altitude instrument had been removed from the place of observation in the morning to another place to make the afternoon observations, from which it is plain that these great astronomers did not understand either the principles or use of one of the most simple instruments in astronomy. End footnote. Thoroughly convinced of the contrary, for I had the same materials they had to calculate from, I required a copy of the computations which was also refused me, nor could I ever obtain a sight of them either officially or through private favour, till three years afterwards, when they were ordered to be laid before the House of Commons. And it then appeared that two of the three computations were absolutely inconclusive, proving nothing, and the third decided in my favour. Further proof of the watch having succeeded in this voyage may be found in the Journals of the House of Commons, Volume 29, page 546, in the evidence of George Lewis Scott, Esquire, and Mr. James Short. The reader will easily believe I did not feel perfectly easy under this treatment of an invention to the perfecting of which, encouraged by the long-continued patronage of a Graham, a Halley, a Foulkes, etc., etc., learned friends to society and public good, whose minds were too enlarged and spirits too liberal to admit that little jealousy of inferior artists which since their death I have been exposed to, I gloried in sacrificing every prospect of advantage from other pursuits, and had willingly submitted to lead a life of labour and dependence. However, it was too late to retreat, and I had only one means of success left, which was to follow the commissioners in their own way. Accordingly, after many difficulties, with a relation of which I will not tire the reader, as it is by no means my intention to meddle with any subjects of complaint, except such as are material to the forming a right judgment of the trials made and proposed, a second voyage to the West Indies was agreed to in the latter end of the year 1762, which agreement was afterwards well nigh overset by the commissioners insisting on such astronomical observations being previously made, as were next to impracticable in this climate, and could be put into the instructions for no other reason that I could conceive, but to throw insuperable difficulties in my way as they were not at all material to the determination of the matter in question. However, the commissioners at length gave up this point on my opinion of the impracticability being confirmed by that of an officer of the navy, distinguished for his abilities and skill in matters of astronomy. To take away all possibility, as I thought, of this voyage being rendered fruitless like the last, I then desired to have inserted at the end of the instructions some few words to this purpose, that provided the experiment answered, the commissioners present were of opinion I should without further trouble receive my reward. But my son attending the board with this proposition was told by Lord Sandwich, at that time president, that it would be mere tautology, for that their giving instructions implied the same thing and that if the watch kept its time within the limits of the act, there could be no doubt of my being entitled to and receiving the reward, and nobody could take it from me. Upon the faith of this, my son went the voyage to Barbados, in which the watch kept its time considerably within the nearest limits of the act of Queen Anne, as certified even by the commissioners themselves. 
on the success of this trial being known and after having employed nearly forty years of my life on the faith of an act of parliament was a doctrine broached to me as i solemnly declare for the first time that the commissioners were invested with a discretionary power of ordering other trials and the fulfilling of other conditions than those specially annexed by act of parliament to the reward footnote if this interpretation of the act was true and the commissioners had a general discretionary power where was the reason or use of specifying any trial at all in the original act End footnote. an exposition of the law which i ever did and ever shall until it is supported by legal authority totally reject and refuse obedience to for i do maintain that before passing the last act of parliament i had as full and perfect a right to the reward of twenty thousand pounds as any freeholder in britain has to his estate and i never would have desired nor ever will desire any better satisfaction than a judicial determination of that point which however it was very soon thought proper to preclude me from by a new law passed at the instance of the commissioners of longitude placing me too certainly under the discretion of the commissioners and totally changing the terms on which the reward was to be given me enacting that i should have half of it when i had disclosed the principles and construction of the machine and assigned over for the use of the public the last made timekeeper together with the three others which were not so perfect as the last and the other half when i should have made more watches without determining how many and proved them to the satisfaction of the commissioners without defining the mode of trial i frankly confess that from thenceforward i considered the second moiety of the reward as lost for ever the first moiety i obtained though it was with great difficulty as the act required me to explain my invention upon oath and the commissioners were pleased to put into that oath words of an indeterminate and unlimited meaning and refused to explain them or even permit me or my son to ask what was meant by them we at length agreed to take it finding we should never get anything if we did not such was now the power of the commissioners and they declared that themselves and the gentlemen appointed by them to whom we were to explain it would be upon honour not to disclose it that i might have an opportunity of obtaining the reward promised by foreign powers however in less than a month an account of it appeared in the public newspapers signed by the rev mr ludlam one of the six gentlemen named by the commissioners to receive the discovery and therefore i make no doubt by leave of the board nor did they stop here for they have since published all my drawings without giving me the last moiety of the reward or even paying me and my son for our time at the rate of common mechanics a discouragement to the improvements of arts and sciences and an instance of such cruelty and injustice as i believe never existed in a learned and civilized nation before i have already had occasion to mention that at the time i received the certificate for the first moiety of the reward the watch was delivered up it remained six months locked up at the admiralty and was then removed to greenwich to be the subject of those experiments concerning which i now trouble the public the other three machines were by order of the commissioners soon after demanded of me by mr maskeline one of them which had been going more than thirty years was broke to pieces under his careful and ingenious management before it got out of my house and the other two were so far abused in the carriage by land to greenwich as to be rendered quite incorrect and as far as i can learn incapable of being repaired without having some essential parts made anew thus perished the first essays of this long wished for invention unwilling however that the public should lose the benefit of the discovery or the chance of further improvement i applied by repeated letters to the board praying that the watch might be lent to me offering security for it if required for the sake of employing other workmen to make the different parts by model with quicker dispatch and in order to determine by experiments 
whether some expensive parts of the machinery might not be obliged or totally left out still have my requests been refused and of late they have alleged that they cannot keep their engagements with mr kendall if they were to lend me the watch what those engagements are may be seen below footnote the board contracted with mr kendall one of the six persons to whom the discovery was made to make a watch after the model of mine he was to be paid for everything beforehand and to begin in a twelve month after making the bargain he is to make parts like parts but is not to be answerable for his watch's going at all my timekeeper is now in his possession though he is not yet ready to make use of it there are some parts in the making of which the model can be of little or no use to him i only desired it for six or eight months and am confident he can have no occasion for it before that time is expired however i have offered to have it forthcoming whenever mr kendall declares that he wants it therefore i apprehend their engagements with mr kendall afford no solid reason for the commissioners to refuse lending it to me End footnote. the new act as i have already observed did not determine how many more watches were to be made before i should receive the other moiety of the reward it was seven months before I could get them to fix how many, and then they would neither agree to any mode of trial proposed by me, nor propose any themselves, till eleven months after that, that is, not till the eleventh day of April last, when, an inquiry having been sent on foot in the House of Commons, they were pleased to propose that instead of the length of a West India voyage, which is about six weeks, the watches should be placed with their very good friend and well-wisher mr maskelyne for ten months and then be sent for two months on board a ship in the downs and all this i am required to submit to without the least shadow of assurance on their part that they will be satisfied with this trial let it answer ever so well or that i shall thereby be brought at all the nearer receiving what is due to me although independent of making the watches it must necessarily employ one whole year of mine or my son's time in superintending an examination which after all can only prove that i who have made one machine can make another like it and that the point of general practicability about which so much stir is affected to be made would not be one jot advanced beyond what it is at present i cannot help begging the reader will here allow me to add a remark or two upon the general practicability of my invention as that is now said to be the only thing that was in dispute between the commissioners and me and that they only wanted to be satisfied as to this point in order to clear it up then i will submit to the public to determine whether the general use and practicability of my invention can in the nature of things be attacked unless under one of these three following heads one that a timekeeper however perfect is an insufficient means of ascertaining the longitude at sea two that such information has not been given as will enable other workmen to make other timekeepers of equal goodness with that which is certified to have kept the longitude or three that they will come to so enormous a price as to be out of the reach of purchase from the benefit of the first objection even if it was founded in truth which i utterly deny the commissioners have surely precluded both themselves and the nation as with respect to me by their repeated orders and instructions and after leading me on for near half a century to employ my whole time and make long voyages for perfecting the invention they can never be permitted now to come and say the invention itself is good for nothing should any one however continue to propagate such an opinion i beg leave in contradiction to it to offer that of sir isaac newton and that of martin folks dr halley dr smith mr graham and eight other persons of great eminence both publicly given to the house of commons and to be found in the journals that is sir isaacs in volume seventeen page six hundred seventy seven and the others in volume twenty nine page five hundred forty seven 
the second objection is flatly contradicted by evidence lately before the house of commons by which it appears that the description and original drawings from which the watch was made as given in by me upon oath are printed and published and that mr mudge the only one of the watchmakers to whom the discovery was made who has been examined by the house of commons declared he could make these watches as well as i can moreover i am ready on condition on receiving the remainder of what's due to me upon oath to give all manner of future information and instruction in my power and i hope it could never enter into any man's idea of general practicability that i should actually teach every indifferent workman in the nation and furnish each of them with a set of tools for the trial of his ability at my own expense before i could be entitled to the reward with regard to the third objection no estimate of the future expense can from the nature of the subject be grounded upon any authority better than that of opinion the price of common watches where each part is made by a different workman bears no proportion to what must necessarily be charged by any man who was to make the whole with his own hands the same reduction will naturally take place when a number of workmen are instructed to make the different parts of these my opinion is that they might in a very few years be afforded for about one hundred pounds apiece and if a reduction of the machinery can be effected which i am strongly inclined to think is the case but have not had an opportunity of proving by experiment for want of my models the expense may be reduced to about seventy or eighty pounds by this time i think the reader may naturally exclaim how can all these things be what can induce a number of noblemen statesmen and officers of the first rank and most unblemished characters what can induce the president of the royal society and the professors of the universities to each of whom his majesty has been most graciously pleased to order payment of fifteen pounds per day for every board of longitude they attend and what can induce the astronomer royal thus to discourage an invention which they are specially constituted to improve protect and support i might answer with mr maskeline that's none of my business to account for the facts are so and this public relation of them is extorted from me by a conviction that no other way is left me to obtain justice or so likely to prevent the invention from perishing however if it is expected of me like mr maskeline to deliver an opinion on this point i shall declare what i believe very sincerely that by far the greater part of the commissioners are perfectly innocent of the treatment i have met with most of them are commissioners by virtue of great employments which engage their time and attention a board so constituted is continually changing and this being a matter of science which to many may seem rather abstruse it was very naturally left to the management of a few of those members who stand in the most immediate relation to science and whose opinions upon a business of this nature the rest of the board had too much modesty to call in question how well they have merited that degree of confidence is left to the impartial world to determine to return again to mr maskeline's account he as i think has been already shown having said and done everything in his power to the dishonour and discouragement of my invention scruples not to sum up his opinion of it in the following terms Quote, that mr harrison's watch cannot be depended upon to keep the longitude within a degree in a west india voyage of six weeks nor to keep the longitude within half a degree for more than a fortnight and then it must be kept in a place where the thermometer is always some degrees above freezing that in case the cold amounts to freezing the watch cannot be depended upon to keep the longitude within half a degree for more than a few days and perhaps not so long if the cold be very intense nevertheless that it is a useful and valuable invention and in conjunction with the observations of the distance of the moon from the sun and fixed stars may be of considerable advantage to navigation End quote. having sufficiently refuted the first part of his opinion already it only remains for me to make such remarks on the lunar method of finding the longitude as this coupling of my invention with it seems to call upon me for 
it is with reluctance that i follow mr maskelyne into a subject in which i may seem like him to be actuated by a selfish preference to my own scheme however as i shall give my reasons for what i advance i will not hesitate to submit them to the public i beg to be understood as a warm and declared friend to that and every other mode which can be devised of ascertaining the longitude at sea so long as they keep within the bounds of reason and probability here are now two methods before the public would to god there were two hundred the importance of the object would warrant public encouragement to them all but called upon to say something on the subject i think it incumbent upon me to point out those limits beyond which its utility cannot from the nature of the thing be extended the method of finding the longitude by the moon in which mr maskelyne is in a pecuniary way interested is this if the apparent distance between the sun and moon or between the moon and some fixed star at any certain part of the globe was for every hour of the year known and if a navigator when at sea could also by observations ascertain what is the apparent distance at the place where he is between the sun and moon or between the moon and a star and likewise their respective altitudes and if he could also at the same moment ascertain the time of the day either by an immediate observation of the sun or by a watch which would keep time pretty exactly from the last solar observation these matters of fact being given the difference of longitude may from thence be calculated i admit the principle to be absolutely true in theory the lunar tables for which the rewards have been given are calculated to show the distance between the sun and moon or moon and stars at greenwich i admit the practicability of making such tables but with regard to the other requisites i beg leave to observe that for six days in every month the moon is too near the sun for observing consequently during those days the method falls totally to the ground that for about other thirteen days in every month the sun and moon are at too great a distance for observing them at the same time or are not at the same time visible therefore during those thirteen days we must depend upon observations of the moon and stars and upon a watch to keep time from the last solar observation with sufficient exactness which common watches cannot be depended upon to do well therefore might mr maskelyne admit that my invention would become of considerable value even if taken in aid of the lunar tables i leave the reader to judge of the practicability of making these observations from what follows to ascertain the longitude by the moon and a star requires a distinct horizon to be seen in the night which is next to impossible and if you have not an horizon the altitude of neither moon nor star can be taken it also requires and this perhaps when a ship is in the high sea the distance of the moon and star in order to come at which the image of one of them must be reflected through a silvered glass and the other seen through an unsilvered part of the same glass and they must be brought into conjunction in the line that connects the silvered and unsilvered parts and this to an exactness only true in theory for an error of a minute of a degree committed in this observation will mislead the mariner half a degree in his longitude now i call upon any astronomers of reputation publicly to declare that they have even at land and with the best instruments europe affords been able to make this observation of the moon and a star with anything like the precision required to determine the longitude within the limits required by the act of the twelfth of queen anne i know it cannot be done nay i further call upon any such astronomers to declare whether even in observations of the distance between the sun and moon two of them observing together have generally speaking agreed in this observation within a minute of a degree i know that in general the difference between the best observers even at land will be more and as a farther proof of this assertion i refer the reader to the note below footnote 
in the fifth volume of m de lacaille's ephemerides page thirty one he says that any person would be in the wrong to suppose that the longitude at sea can be determined by the moon to a less error than two degrees let the method which is employed be never so perfect let the instruments of the sort now in use be never so excellent and let the observer be the most able and accomplished for if we examine without prejudice all the circumstances which enter into the calculation and into the observation of the longitude at sea we shall be easily convinced that it would be ridiculous to maintain that the sum of the inevitable errors should not amount to five minutes of a degree that is to two degrees and a half of longitude nota bene m de lacaille published this in the year seventeen fifty five and is universally allowed to have been an excellent observer and made several voyages by sea where he made trials of this method by the moon dr halley and dr bevis as appeared to the honourable house of commons upon an examination of the latter did with an excellent hadley's quadrant rectified by mr hadley himself and in his presence attempt to take the angular distance of the moon from aldebaran a star of the first magnitude but with such bad success some of the observations removing greenwich from itself almost as far as paris that dr halley seemed to be out of hope of obtaining the longitude by this method End footnote. and if these matters of fact are still doubted i shall beg leave to call upon mr maskelyne and mr green to declare how near they with admiral tyrrell agreed in determining the longitude by the sun and moon in their voyage to barbados and also whether during that voyage they ever did determine the longitude by the moon and stars i know they did not for they found the observation too difficult and indeed it is only true in theory from the foregoing premises i infer first that during six days in every month no observations can be made by this method to ascertain the longitude at sea secondly that during thirteen other days in each month it is impracticable to ascertain it by this method with any instruments hitherto contrived or which the nature of the service to be performed seems to admit of and thirdly that during the remaining eleven days in each month when the sun and moon may if the weather is clear be observed at the same time no reliance can safely be placed upon the best instruments in the hand of the best observer for ascertaining the longitude within the limits of the act of queen anne and consequently that how valuable soever the lunar tables may be for correcting a long dead reckoning and thereby telling us whereabouts we are when we are not afraid of falling in with the land yet even during these eleven days they do not extend to the security of ships near the shore this method of ascertaining the longitude by the moon has already cost the public the sum of six thousand six hundred pounds at least and yet no proper experiment has been made of it i shall not presume to make any reflections on the different treatment the two inventions have met with nor will i take up more of the reader's time by detail of the very earnest attention paid by the french government to this object if our rivals in commerce and arts should rob us of the honour as well as the first advantages of the discovery i hope it will be admitted that the fault is not mine and i likewise flatter myself that i have now furnished sufficient materials for the justification of my friends and for showing that the cause which they from public spirited motives had the goodness to espouse was not unworthy of their patronage john harrison Red Lion Square, June twenty third, seventeen sixty seven. End of Remarks on a Pamphlet lately published by the Reverend Mr. Maskeline under the authority of the Board of Longitude by John Harrison. Read by Avaii in May two thousand sixteen.
trials of the wife of a literary man by leonora blanche lang this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. novels without number have been written setting forth the sufferings of the literary man who has awakened from a moment of folly to find himself mated with a spiritual clown or with what is even more paralyzing one of the doras of this world harrowing pictures have been drawn of some gifted hopkins driven by lack of sympathy in his own home to seek that precious balm elsewhere he only craves to pour out his soul at every possible opportunity on the subject which is possessing it for the time being and while he excites himself to frenzy as to the truth of the claims of some false dimitri or the ultimate fate of don sebastian he is met by a wife's wandering eye and vague smile followed after a polite pause by an instance of tommy's drollness or mary's precocious wit it is not every woman who is clever enough to catch up her husband's voluble arguments and reproduce them as if they were her own to his wonder and admiration nor indeed is it every man who would be content with having the mirror thus held up to his own nature yet after all this is perhaps quite the best that he has any right to expect marriage most of us have found that out is an affair of compromises few people are attracted to each other by their intellectual qualities and if they are they are generally of the first order of prigs a man falls in love with a girl because she is pretty or lively or sympathetic it is surely unjust to demand that she should be intellectual as well as to the girls they fall in love with a man because he has fallen in love with them or because there is nobody else either way neither has the right to blame the other but it must not be supposed that every literary man's wife is capable of feeling the trials of her position to some the position itself is only a matter of pride this kind of wife is a very serious person who invests everything that touches her with a halo of solemnity delightful to the one who looks on as a rule her life has been passed among scenes quite different from those into which her marriage has plunged her and she begins her new career densely ignorant of subjects and details which have been the literature of the nursery to most other people but in a surprisingly short time she has got by heart the masonic signs and passwords of her new state of existence and if she sometimes misquotes or misapplies them she never finds it out this is not the sort of woman who will lie awake at night reddening with shame and mortification while she watches the bevues of which she has been guilty standing in a row opposite her bed making their bow the man who marries a lady cast in this mould is usually as deficient in humour as herself and is prepared to take her at her own valuation thus making her worse he is in every sense le mari de sa femme and most certainly each is the elective affinity of the other it is rare indeed that the husband turns out a mr bennett and unkind things were said by darcy and have been repeated by other people about mr bennett's habit of extracting entertainment from his incomparable lady yet what could the poor man do there was only one alternative possible and that led to the gallows the foregoing remarks have been made to show that all the trials and grievances are not on one side as some eloquent orators would have us believe and that no prejudice exists in the mind of the writer against the male sex the rights and wrongs of man are not however the subject of this paper which is as they say in churches for women only now of course the typical instance of a literary man's wife who has attained the very height or depth of suffering is mrs carlyle but let us leave her on one side partly because nobody with any sense or consideration for his fellows would revive that war cry but partly also because it is difficult to give our entire sympathy to mrs carlyle's grievances besides quite a new crop of sufferings have sprung up since mrs carlyle discoursed so eloquently upon hers 
in modern days budding authors and authoresses especially the authoresses are a fruitful source of danger to the literary man's wife if the husband happens to be the editor of a magazine he will be inundated with manuscript poems or novels accompanied very frequently by appeals ad misericordiam amidst the bundle of hopeless mediocrities he may come upon something better than the rest and then full of benevolent ideas he comes to his wife and tells her that a miss so-and-so has really written a rather clever story and as she says she is coming up to town on business should they ask her to come and spend a day or two with them the wife has very likely seen this experiment tried before at the houses of other literary friends and if she is a person who can learn by experience it is not every woman who can and no men she has inwardly digested the lesson so she points out firmly that if the future sappho or embryo george eliot turn out to be shy or impish or gushing it is she and not he who will have to bear the burden afternoon tea she will consent to but nothing more until she is sure of her ground the husband whose zeal in the matter has been quite disinterested gives way as he cannot help doing and probably lives to thank her for her foresight the trials to which the wife of a literary man is subjected naturally differ according to his temperament and mode of life but there is one which from mrs carlyle downwards all the wives have in common though in a greater or less degree the wife must be prepared to be ignored consciously or unconsciously by people who are either unaware that she exists at all or are profoundly indifferent to the fact how far this position will be felt by the lady who is passed over depends to a certain extent on the amount of social ambition she may possess but more on her common sense which will tell her whether the slight is deliberate or unintentional as to the husband if he thinks the proposed dinner or visit will bore him he assumes airs of virtue and declines but if it happens to be a question of his favourite sport or latest craze golf or roman camps or norman architecture then it is to be feared ah greatly feared that he will make one of that country-house party on the other hand sportsmanlike fairness must admit that the case is sometimes reversed the lady is literary and the author of a murmuring heart the husband is undistinguished he cannot be left out and has been found weeping in the harness-room while his wife shone in the gilded saloon these tears as mr frederick bayham said were manly sir manly if the literary man is an eager enthusiastic being ready to unbosom himself to any audiences however unpromising how much worse is it when the wife has some special knowledge or intelligence that may make her opinion really of some use i should like to read you this he will say coming in with a sheaf of loose papers in his hand all mixed and all requiring correction as your judgment is a criterion of that of the average public and after this hardly flattering commendation he proceeds to read out an article on some obscure subject to which the wife has never given a thought stopping all the while to correct a phrase or insert a missing word with his hovering pen and expecting the unfortunate woman to be ready with an intelligent criticism at the end of it is any creature in the world more wearisome than the man or woman who is a person of one idea or habitually talks shop yet is anybody a worse sinner in this respect than the literary man morning noon and night does he expatiate interminably upon the subject to which he is at that moment giving his attention say frederick the great however congenial or familiar the theme may be to the wife it is impossible for some one to follow without special study the details of hitherto unsuspected conspiracies or exult in a proper spirit over important discoveries yet for months altogether in fact till one burning question is replaced by another she must be content to have the topic recur at every meal perhaps she would like to speak of the matters which interest her 
french memoirs astronomy the borgias let us say but she is never given a chance for men have a wonderful power of assuming that what interests them is bound to interest other people what was the cause of the thirty years war and who were the principal generals a literary man once asked his wife as they were having an early breakfast before starting for their summer quarters and having produced the required information it was months ere the luckless woman was allowed to converse about anything else the years were dated by her in an entirely original manner oh that was the summer we talked of confucius that was the george washington summer and so on on one point only she was firm her walks should not be invaded by this phylloxera if she was to keep hold of her sanity at all she must possess her own soul for some part of the day the demon might breakfast with her dine with her mingle with her dreams but take a constitutional with her he should not perhaps at the outset when young and full of vigour the wife may have had visions of correcting her husband's shortcomings making him share the practical difficulties of their daily life as wives always contrive to do in a sentimental novel but as the years roll on and her power of fight becomes weakened she gives up the struggle finding it far less trouble to do things herself often a morbidly anxious person she even ceases to discompose herself when her husband dashes into the room and announces that he has burnt a letter containing some editor's check oh no you haven't she replies calmly it is sure to turn up all right and of course it does neither does she pay the slightest attention to his asseverations when he mislays a book that he had it on such a table and by no possibility can it be found on any other a prolonged search which occurs several times every day will invariably end in the production of the missing volume in the precise spot which he had never been near and if she is wise she soon learns to begin her search from that very place like the laird with the salmon show me a hopeless cast he said after an empty day and there she had him as to arranging journeys or recollecting her husband's independent engagements the wife speedily discovers that if either were to be carried through she must take the burden on her own shoulders and instead of the husband being grateful for being saved from pitfalls of all kinds he probably lets off impatient jibes at his wife's memory of course i could have done it perfectly well myself if you had only told me what to do or what to say he exclaims and very likely he could still it grows tiresome to remark eight or nine times over have you written that letter have you answered that invitation and it is infinitely easier to do it herself this division of labor works very well as long as the wife enjoys good health but there are moments when it has its inconveniences occasionally she may be obliged to take to her bed and when she is up again the doctor declares that she will not get strong till she has had a thorough change her husband is anxious about her and is desirous to take her anywhere that will cure her most quickly but a wife endowed with any sense will resolutely stay at home and get better when and how she can oh yes she says to the doctor i've no doubt a change would do me good and if i only had the maiden aunt of fiction who would carry me off to her lovely country house where i could lie wrapped in shawls under the trees and drink bowls of soup every hour i would go to-morrow but if you think it would be a rest to me to have my husband sit down to the writing-table and begin what hotel shall i write to what room shall i order what train shall we go by what time shall i order the cab you are wrong i must mend at home or not at all change may be possible for the wife of a barrister a soldier or a clergyman but not for the wife of a literary man for these and other reasons it is quite clear that foreign travel can be no enjoyment to the literary man's wife and her husband recognizing this fact will probably urge her to accept an invitation to join a friend when he is safely engaged for some weeks hunting for cranogs whatever they may be 
or seeking ogams in the wilds of ireland for one weak moment she thinks she may manage it and then her long and ghastly experience comes to her aid i don't know how i can remember you have promised to lecture at sheffield on the third of next month and if i am not here you will be sure to get into some mess about it what nonsense he cries indignantly you can't want to go if you make such a silly excuse just as if i couldn't manage my own lecture by myself he does his very utmost to persuade her, but she stands firm, and what happens? He departs for his remote corner of the West, with the date of the lecture repeated to him ad nauseum, both by word of mouth and in subsequent letters. At last, late one Saturday night, with bank holiday treading on the heels of Sunday, the hapless victim gets two letters by the same post one from the secretary of the lecture committee saying that the date was now drawing near and no subject had as yet been fixed on until that was done nobody would take tickets might he say it would be upon uh, the women of the fronde a period with which he knew the lecturer to be familiar the other letter is from the literary man himself and begins for heaven's sake wire at once and tell me the date of the lecture and the subject the wife who is not of the order of woman that keeps her husband's letters in a scented box sends hastily for the waste paper basket and turns over the contents of two in the hope of discovering the name of a telegraph station stamped in the corner of one of the fragments there is none and her only resource is to write out two concise telegrams one to her husband with the date and the subject fixed on it by the secretary and the other to the secretary himself and dispatch them to the head office to go up by post the other offices have been closed hours ago but the wife knows quite well that her trials in the matter are not yet over the husband has carefully avoided answering any of her numerous questions as to how long he is staying in his present quarters and what he means to do next the journey is a long and broken one and letters are apt to come irregularly and besides as he has paid no attention to any of her remarks hitherto what guarantee has she got that the substance of her telegrams will reach his supraliminal self the other is no good however she does all she can looks up every conceivable train and steamer that may lie between him and his ultimate goal and calculates carefully all his dates these with a letter of minute instructions she sends off next day her efforts are so far crowned with success that he finally grasps the date of the lecture but through the succeeding days letters and telegrams contradict each other with wonderful regularity as to places and seasons but we are often told whether truly or not that the capacity of human suffering has its limits and it may be supposed that this particular woman had reached hers there is however one kind of trial to which the literary man's wife is especially subject but for which he cannot fairly be held responsible if she like him occasionally has a fancy for dabbling in literature then every word she writes as long as it is worth anything at all will be ascribed directly or indirectly to her husband it matters nothing if the subjects she chooses are those of which he is entirely ignorant it is to no avail that her name and not his appears on the title page of the book it is he and not she who will obtain all the credit and all the praise no wonder literary ladies are proverbially somewhat short in their tempers to those who reflect on the trials of lady byron harriet shelley or mrs robert burns the sufferings enumerated above may seem paltry and not worth mentioning and indeed to a person fond of managing or with an inborn love of playing providence it is possible that they might even be productive of pure enjoyment but it is not every woman who has these advantages and before she is made practical by sheer pressure of circumstances when her nature is naturally shiftless and indolent she will have to pass through a purifying fire of considerable intensity from this she emerges one entire and perfect chrysolite 
End of Trials of the Wife of a Literary Man Read by David Wales Two Centuries of American Women by Lenora Blanche Lang. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. If any one is ignorant in these days of the smallest detail concerning the American War of Independence and the men who fought in it, that is certainly his own fault but the domestic side of colonial life with its endless makeshifts resulting in inventions has been left comparatively untouched till mrs alice morse earle told its story in the four or five volumes already produced by this lady she has shown herself as hard-working as any of the ancient colonial dames whose daily round she describes if she does not herself spend her time in making soap like abigail foot during the autumn and in dipping candles in the spring or in spinning weeding washing and carding like that young woman i carded two pounds of whole wool and felt nationally says abigail in her diary we are convinced from the way these things are related by her that she could do any one of them if she chose in home life in colonial days mrs earle gives minute accounts of the occupations of her ancestresses and when every article worn and eaten is raised on the premises it is evident that the labor must be both long and severe why any one of these home industries from birth to burial sounds enough to fill the day of a single person and yet there are or seem to be dozens of them if they had not been so vigorous perhaps we should not have been so nervous remarked an american lady who was discussing this very book adding and i owe them a grudge for it it is certainly amazing what these women did when there was no one else to do it and later when the first difficulties were overcome and the rude implements had given place to something better what useless though ingenious arts were developed the chief idea of the colonist was that they would be behind nobody if hideous little bead or hair landscapes were fashionable in england america would show that she could produce some that were finer and more fantastic still if mrs delaney exhibited the flora of great britain and ireland cut out in colored paper madame deming a boston lady delighted her friends with a whole view of boston whose treatment reminds us of all things in the world of the perspective of one of the assyrian friezes in the beginning each man helped his neighbor cleared ground for him felled trees for him split logs for him any stranger was welcome to the best and in the end owing to this boundless hospitality ruin came upon more than one splendid southern home when society consisted of half a dozen small hamlets of two or three houses each known in common talk as the mason neighborhood the johnson neighborhood life was on a much more friendly footing than when the population became more numerous and classes were divided then masonville and johnstown drew sharp lines as to their acquaintance and only behaved civilly to their kinsfolk reverting to the early manners of many parts of the world they did not encourage marriages out of their tribe and when a match took place and love found out a way the interloper never ceased to be a stranger and was never allowed to stay a night with his in-laws just as an australian black must never speak to his wife's mother whatever the colonists required they went at with the doggedness of the english race when things are going wrong if the stage-coaches provided for travellers were apt to be faulty in balance the first ran in seventeen sixty six between new york and philadelphia and took two days over the journey matters were set right by the driver signalling at a given moment and the occupants flinging themselves from side to side to prevent the coach being overturned this must have been a warming process on a cold winter's day when war with england was imminent and there were no great contractors to provide the soldiers with clothes each provincial congress requisitioned thirteen thousand thick coats to be got ready before the winter came 
and not one of the thirteen thousand was missing and in each coat was sewn the name of the woman who had woven it at home and that of the town she lived in as to dyeing the colonists were always fond of gardens and were mostly good botanists and there was no lack of plants from which to extract beautiful hues red was procured from moss madder or sassafras yellow from laurel or from a certain kind of clay large tracts of wild indigo afforded a splendid blue and purple came from the tops of the cedars with these resources at their command the love of fine clothes developed rapidly in the year sixteen seventy six thirty-eight women living in the connecticut valley were arraigned before the magistrates as being of too small an estate to wear silk and excess in clothes was an abomination to the male virginian indeed they went so far as to assess unmarried men according to their dress and married men according to that of their family which must have caused strife in many a household of course the puritans never ceased to wrestle with this hydra-headed dragon but unluckily they could not always agree in the matter to be reprobated roger williams for instance enjoining one sunday the women of salem to wear veils while the following week the minds of the parish were upset by john cotton who held that a covered face betokened slavishness and was not to be endured when clothes were made at home the material was stout and strong but very soon the love of colour and finery crept in among the women and the lust of the eye was apt to take the place of mere usefulness even in these days silk dresses play an immense part in the lives of the very poor and humble folks in mrs wilkins freeman's stories not to have two silk dresses when you are married is a humiliation that no village girl however obscure can bring herself to face and we all remember the old workhouse woman who being irritated at the recital of her companion's splendours invented surpassing ones of her own in which the number and beauty of her silk dresses awed her friends into silence this attitude of mind is entirely without a parallel in england no cottage girl dreams of possessing a silk dress any more than the vicar's wife expects to have a tiara life was and is looked on from a different standpoint a beautiful gown has from the earliest times given an amount of pleasure to an american woman that no english woman can grasp her equivalent would be a horse to carry her across country or more spacious nurseries or a boat or something of that sort her dress would in most cases come after all these and she would take it for granted that her clothes mattered to others as little as to herself in the states as riches increased the passion for finery increased also and an english traveller notes in the year seventeen forty that boston men and women dressed every day as gay as courtiers in england at a coronation and they did not save upon the children either for in every point the children were the replicas of their parents miss curtis washington's stepdaughter aged four had an array of pack-thread stays fans and silk coats sent with her to england where she was to be educated while the twelve-year-old miss huntington carried twelve silk gowns with her to boston yet her teacher thought these not enough and demanded more as to those horrid bushes of vanity wigs the sums they cost were quite incredible whether they were grave full bottom giddy feather top long tail fox tail or anything else a wig would cost as much as twenty five pounds with another ten pounds for the care of it many gentlemen had eight or ten of different colours and fashions and bound and braided with coloured ribbons in seventeen fifty four william freeman was given on his seventh birthday a wig for which his father paid nine pounds and as he had two elder brothers naturally bewigged also the headgear of the family must have cost a considerable sum not less interesting than the dresses of the colonists are their food and the utensils connected with it the dining-table was originally a mere board laid on trestles and on it stood chafing dishes to keep the food hot cups large chargers or dishes spoons and knives but no forks 
there were also trenchers or bowls pieces of wood hollowed out into squares twelve inches wide and three or four deep which were generally shared between two people one connecticut deacon insisted on every child having its own trencher and was held by his neighbors to give himself airs mrs earle refers to a table-top she has seen made of heavy oak six inches thick at intervals of about eighteen inches round the edge bowls were scooped out in which every man's dinner was placed now curiously enough a friend of the present writers and a soldier who had seen long service told her that he had once induced the police to take him with them in their nightly raids in some of the worst parts of london he saw many things to astonish him but the strangest of all was the table of a greek eating-house scooped out exactly in the manner described by mrs earle except that down the middle and across the sides were trenches leading to each bowl the thick soup was poured by a man into the middle trench from which it made its way to the bowls the visitors did not trouble themselves for the most part about spoons but stooped down and lapped like dogs the colonial tables however needed to be specially strong for the fare spread upon them was ample especially in the luxurious philadelphia john adams the president who lived well in his boston home had his eyes considerably opened by his travels in the south he stopped at philadelphia and visited the house of one mears fisher a young quaker lawyer plenty he had expected but not such profusion this plain friend he says in his diary with his plain but pretty wife sick with her these and thous had provided us a costly entertainment ducks hams chickens beef pig tarts creams custards jellies fools trifles beer porter punch wine and a long whatever that may mean chief justice chu was no whit behind the fishers indeed there was probably a sort of rivalry in all this hospitality about four o'clock we were called to dinner a most sinful feast again everything that could delight the eye or allure the taste but it seems to have been a lighter and more elegant repast than the fishers for besides turtle and every other thing great quantities of sweets were mentioned as well as twenty kinds of tarts carving was considered one of the fine arts and must have formed the study of a lifetime woe be to him who had not mastered the intricacies of the matter or its appropriate language how all must regret exclaims one old author to hear some persons even of quality say pray cut up that chicken or hen or have that plover not considering how indiscreetly they talk when the proper terms are break that goose thrust that chicken spoil that hen pierce that plover if they are so much out in common things how much more would they be with herons cranes and peacocks cold must have been among the severest trials of the early colonists who mostly sat in the kitchen as being the warmest room in the house even there tales are told of the sap being frozen at one end of the burning log and what then could the bedrooms have been like to be sure they soon learned from the dutch to place their beds in alcoves and lie on one feather bed with another over them but feather beds are slippery things especially in alcoves and must have been poor substitutes for roaring fires what these earnest christians must have endured in church is something fearful to think of there was not the smallest effort at heating the building and the members of the congregation were thankful to be allowed to have their dogs in their seats to use as muffs or foot warmers and here they sat the best part of the day for the prayers were always from one to two hours long and the sermons from two to three the doors were watched over by a verger and none could leave except in cases of undoubted illness and by that time the poor victims must have been frozen too hard to move yet the young men contrived to make so much noise that they were frequently brought before the magistrates and worse still the instances of sunday tobogganing were by no means uncommon such roughly was the setting in which colonial women grew up to begin with there were few 
very few of them and they were not perhaps at first a felt want for the puritans of new england clamored for ministers rather than for wives but in virginia things were otherwise in the softer climate men sighed after homes and families and declared they would never settle until they had them and in the end the english immigration society and shakespeare's friend lord southampton declared that they would give them what they wanted so one fine morning in the year sixteen twenty about four hundred young men dressed in their best with feathered hats and shining swords assembled eagerly on the beach of jamestown virginia to welcome the ninety young handsome honestly educated maids of honest life and carriage after their tedious voyage and to gain acceptance if possible as husbands before the girls were out of the roll of the breakers surely the marriage fee of a hundred and twenty pounds b d v then worth about eighty dollars was never paid with so light a heart it must have been a glorious time for the young women but no bullying was permitted and no flirtation was allowed perhaps things may not have been on quite such a straightforward and business-like footing when other maidens arrived to try their fortunes but at any rate the colony flourished and in three years thirty five hundred english emigrants set sail for virginia this was in comparatively early days but nearly a century later louis the fourteenth who was quick to note what was happening in the world sent a company of virtuous girls to the governor of louisiana with orders to get them well married and to place them where they might train the indian squaws the king was a wise man in many ways but he did not know his own countrywomen or rather perhaps he knew them at that period chiefly through the eyes of madame de maintenon his female immigrants were not chosen from the strong peasant women of normandy or brittany or any of the provinces where they were accustomed to hardships but from paris the girls seem as far as is known always to have led godly righteous and sober lives yet they abhorred the indian corn which formed their staple of diet nearly as much as they did the teaching of the squaws it was the old story frou-frou sans paris fifteen years later another attempt was made in louisiana this time in the year which saw the death of the regent and knowing what we do of that highly gifted person we shall hardly be surprised to learn that these young women taken from penitentiaries had not even a succes d'estime in the colony of louisiana filles a la correction they were called in contradistinction to the filles a la cassette who landed seven years later in louisiana the aristocracy of which state prided themselves on their descent from these girls of spotless lives poor manon lescaut was not of the proper division on looking through the history of the various colonies it is curious to note how each state has its peculiarities peculiarities not always to be explained by those who belong even to the inner circle why did maryland hail convicts not necessarily criminals with delight why were the transported jacobites taken to maryland instead of elsewhere and why did an english husband whose wife was condemned to death for stealing three shillings sixpence beg that her sentence might be commuted to exile to virginia the most marked feature of the whole civilization is the preeminence held by widows in all the society indeed the number of chances possessed by every lady member of the society was so numerous that we can only imagine that the boys and girls married at an as early an age as they now do at clapham and if so what became of the men je ne comprends rien as the man said when he rushed tearing his hair to the front of the stage-box during the play however there the widows were and the husbands kept on dying that is all we know the widows at least most of them arranged their own settlements and bargained quite as hard and shrewdly as any lawyer would have done for them but though no one's sensibilities were hurt by this process the marrying of widows and widowers was not devoid of complications mr sargent a boston builder was reputed as remarkable in his marriages as his wealth 
for he had three wives, the second having been a widow twice before her third venture. And his third, also a widow, and even becoming his widow, and lastly the widow of her third husband, who had had three wives himself. One's head reels at the intricacy of these statements, which sounds like a very involved riddle. However, it was not only in America that these hasty marriages were made, though perhaps it may have been there that widows were most appreciated. John Rouse, for instance, tells of a gentleman who died in London in the year 1638 at eight at night, leaving his wife five hundred pounds a year in land, and the lady and the whole of her property was transferred to the custody of the journeyman draper who had come about her mourning before twelve next day the memoirs of the verney family teem with wooings which were not long a doing and old men's wife had certainly no difficulty in providing herself with suitors the circumstances of the times when everything was disjointed and people had to use any material that came ready to their hands was favourable to the growth of strong natures, both of men and women. There were no special grooves made for the women to walk in, and there were many who seized the chance to fashion others more agreeable to their feet. One of the most conspicuous of these ladies was Margaret Brent, who stepped so far from the conventional path of her own day that she almost found herself in hours. She reached Maryland in 1638, in company with her sister Mary and two brothers, took up land, built several good manor houses, sent for other colonists, and, before others would have dug the foundations, Margaret was signing herself, Attorney for my brother, what a confiding brother, and Mary holding court baron and court leet at her own house. Men were known to ask for her help in military uprisings, and when the indomitable Mrs. Margaret Brent requested to have a vote in the house for herself and voice also, she probably had many partisans. However, as the governor denied Mrs. Brent that she should have any vote in the house, the advanced lady was forced to retire, protesting all the while against the injustice of her exclusion. Several acute and ingenious gentlewomen in Virginia cultivated tobacco plantations and drained slopes, and indeed such women were far more common in the southern states than in the northern ones. Maid coats were discouraged, and the maids admonished frequently and harassed and considered dangerous by their acquaintance, and it required all the obstinacy of the Lady Deborah Moody's of the world to persist as they had begun not that agriculture absorbed all the business talent of the colonial ladies besides the many employments considered suitable for women in all countries there were a large number of capable and industrious females who carried on their husband's trade first as his assistant and last as his successor women publishers and women printers were numerous during the whole of the eighteenth century and of these the goddards mother and daughter were the most business-like and most prominent the maryland gazette was continued after the death of the publisher by his widow under the title of anna catherine green and son who printed also for the whole colony at the time mrs green undertook this arduous task she was about thirty-six and the mother of six sons and eight daughters it was from this Green family that thirty-four anti-revolutionary printers sprang. It is new and pleasant to note among these stern religionists a vow church, raised in Philadelphia by a Scotch Presbyterian immigrant, who had been shipwrecked on her way out, and was reduced, with the rest of the survivors, to such straits that they never ate without first drawing lots who would fast that day. She was rescued and eventually prospered in her business, and her first savings went to the fulfillment of her vow. The colonial ladies were great gardeners, and the hours they passed with their fruits and flowers must have been moments of much pleasure in their busy lives. The most famous of these ladies was the daughter of George Lucas, a planter of Carolina, and at the same time governor of Antigua at which place he appears to have resided, leaving Miss Eliza at home. From Antigua he sent her all sorts of tropical seeds of fruits and flowers, to try if any would take kindly to the soil of Carolina. 
eliza observed certain hopeful signs with regard to the indigo and undismayed by repeated accidents to the young plants at length obtained a good crop governor lucas was so delighted at this unlooked-for success that he sent over an englishman to teach eliza the whole process of indigo working the englishman bearing gifts seems to have been rather a sly and tricky sort of person but when did england ever get the better of america the youthful miss lucas saw through the englishman's dodges his name was cromwell and finally obtained a successful knowledge and application of the complex and annoying methods of extracting indigo a bounty of sixpence a pound encouraged the planting and through its profits more children were sent over from carolina to be educated at home than from all the other colonies put together indigo was looked upon at last as a sort of current coin and it is on record that when a little boy was sent to school at philadelphia he took with him a wagon of indigo to pay his expenses after studying the labors of these monumental women it is with a sense of relief that we turn to the enactments against blabbing and discovering the faults and frailties of others to which colonial ladies were especially prone one would have thought that in the early times they were so hard worked that they would have been mum budgets of silence and magazines of taciturnity by nature but the court records tell a very different story one minister's wife to be sure she was a dutch woman was accused of lifting her petticoats in crossing the street and exposing her ankles in an unseemly manner after a minute inquiry into the state of the roads and the height of the petticoat it was decided that ro anecki had been justified in her action and her slanderers were fined and punished other evil speakers were gagged or had cleft sticks placed on their tongues and worst offenders were ducked in special ponds near the courthouses church-going was not considered as binding on women as on men in the state of virginia their seats were suffered to remain vacant on the slightest excuse while a man was condemned for the first offence to lie neck and heels that night and to be a slave to the colony for the following week for the second offence to be a slave for a month for the third for a year and a day probably if we were to visit these churches now we should find the balance readjusted the first great female traveller on the other side of the water predecessor of the miss kingsleys and the mrs bishops of our own day was a boston lady mrs sarah knight who rode from boston to new york in seventeen o four and back again she sprang of a bold stock as her father captain kimball had to spend two hours in stocks nearly fifty years before to expiate his lewd and unseemly behavior in kissing his wife publicly on the sabbath day on the doorstep of his house after he had returned from a voyage of three years madame sarah had need of all her father's courage during her long and lonely ride a price was set on the heads of wolves and bears must have been nearly as common as sparrows to judge by the fact that long after mrs sarah's adventure twenty of them were killed in a week just outside boston besides all these were swarms of red indians and indians were fearfully on the warpath just then it seems odd that she should have chosen the winter with all its added horrors for her journey but probably it was unavoidable for she left on october second and took more than two months reaching new york visiting many friends on the way the customs of connecticut struck her as particularly strange with the frequent divorces and laws against kissing which was almost as much a matter of course then as shaking hands is now but however distant the relations between the sexes may have been in connecticut they were less icy in other states notably in virginia and in pennsylvania in seventeen seventy two an ancestor of the present writer and one of the family of the celebrated downright shippen of pope the only member without a price of walpole and the cousin of benedict arnold's wife gave umbrage to the bells of philadelphia by his free exercise of endearments what a pity it is writes miss sarah eve that the doctor is so fond of kissing he really would be much more agreeable if he were less fond one hates to be always kissed especially as it is attended with so many inconveniences 
it decomposes the economy of one's handkerchief it disorders one's high roll and it ruffles the serenity of one's countenance the account of certain frolics in virginia reads not unlike the horseplay fashionable in some country houses of our own time wherein the humour appears to consist in gentlemen bouncing into ladies bedrooms and chasing them over the garden to escape from these assiduities the young ladies seem to have gone to their own room taking with them a large dish of bacon and beef after that a bowl of sago cream and after that an apple pie while we were eating the apple pie in bed god bless you making a great noise in came mr washington not george dressed in hannah's short gown and petticoat and seized me and kissed me twenty times in spite of all the resistance i could make and then cousin molly hannah soon followed dressed in his coat they joined us in eating the apple pie and then went out after this we took it in our heads to want to eat oysters as might naturally be expected the new england states were far more strict in the matter of amusement than the laxer south and to judge from the stories the moment you got beyond the wealthier class in the puritan settlements matters were very much as they always were thursday lectures singing schools bees were all the opportunities the young people had of bringing about marriages or at least so we might think did we not know that marriage is indifferent to opportunity in the south they were better off sleighing parties turtle frolics but balls above everything these formed the diversions of the youth of virginia and if as a matter of course each gentleman asked permission to fetch and carry a lady no monopoly was allowed in the ballroom by the master of the ceremonies perhaps the fact that the united states have no established church has favored the growth of the immense number of sects which strikes every reader of american stories it is not only the excitable negroes who congregate in the forest to hold camp meetings it is the steady-going narrow-minded puritans who are forever seeking something new they do not strike you as being easy to impress these hard-headed gentlemen yet they have more than once been as wax in the hands of some religious fanatic and went down by hundreds before the handsome vain and lazy jemima wilkinson who posed for over forty years in the middle of the eighteenth century as the universal friend it was really the world in general who was the universal friend to jemima for it kept her in comparative luxury and even gave her money in return for perpetual sermons on sin death and repentance perhaps an ideal is necessary to the hardest lives and may account for much that is perplexing and contradictory in the existence of these practical men and women to many natures the unknown god is of necessity more attractive than the known one and the feeling may be a remnant still lurking in us of the children we once were at any rate not only priestesses like the universal friend but princesses such as the daughter-in-law of peter the great and the sister of the queen of england found ready acceptance and much kindness among the people of the states the first of these ladies her name was charlotte not christine as stated by mrs earle was the daughter of the duke of brunswick wolfenbuttel and so unfortunate as to become the wife of the grand duke alexis she put up with him for several years and then is reported to have given out her own death and to have fled to america where she found peace and a new husband in an old adorer le chevalier dupont the whole story has been produced in an interesting novel by lady georgiana fullerton called too strange not to be true the english uh, princess had a very different fate and her story was all the stranger as she had neither beauty nor charm to recommend her sarah wilson had been maid to one of queen charlotte's maids of honour and had managed to steal some jewels belonging to the queen she was caught and condemned to death but was afterwards pardoned and sent as a convict to the states it was not long before she managed to escape from servitude and on the strength of the jewels which she had somehow kept concealed about her she declared herself the lady susanna caroline matilda sister to the queen 
the end of this enterprising young person is wrapped in obscurity we know only that some fat years were rudely broken in upon and she was arrested prosecuted and whipped in charleston but a lady of her resources is not easily discouraged and it is probable she may under some other disguise have played a prominent part on another stage these few remarks may serve to show the immense amount of labor expended by mrs earle in collecting matter for her work the number of houses she has visited both in england and the states in order to see or to verify some special object is a testimony to the thoroughness of her methods and the accuracy of the statements and besides all these she is familiar with endless old books bearing on her subject and has studied the letters and records of countless private families tusser piers ploughman hollingshed are at her fingers ends as well as the records of mrs martha smith and the journal of the young lady of virginia it is in this way and this way only that history whether domestic or political should be written and mrs earle has steeped her mind so completely in her materials that she leaves the impression on her readers minds of having lived through the state of things she describes so graphically end of two centuries of american women by leonora blanche lang read by david wales The History of the Underground Railroad of McDonough County, Illinois, by D. N. Blazer, an address before the McDonough County Historical Society, October 20th, 1922, from the Journal of the Illinois State Historical Society, Volume 15. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I have been asked to write a historical account of the Underground Railway that was in existence in McDonough County before the Civil War. But it is impossible, after a lapse of more than 60 years, with no authentic records to draw from, to assemble anything like a chronological account of the events that transpired in those troubled times as it is my aim to deal only with those events that i know to be true i must therefore confine my account largely to episodes that came directly under my attention as a boy and to incidents related to me by my father and mother coupled with much valuable information secured from the children of andrew and harmon allison who like the blazers my father james blazer and his brother john blazer and their families were ardent abolitionists and a part of the underground system i trust that this account which is as accurate and complete as it is in my power to give it at this late date may assist you in gaining an idea of the strife and animosities that existed in the decade in eighteen sixty it was preached that slavery was a divine institution and that the negro was nothing more than an animal the fearless men who operated the underground system were criminals in the eyes of the law but they gained courage for their dangerous work in the firm belief that they were performing a duty in the eyes of god and that the black man was a human being with a soul all underground railroads started on the line of some free state that bordered on a slave state the road that extended through McDonough County started at Quincy, which was station number one, receiving Negroes from across the Mississippi River in Missouri. Station number two was down at Round Prairie in Hancock County at the Petty John or Burton home. Station number three in McDonough County was generally at the home of someone of the Blazers down on Camp Creek in Industry Township or at the home of Uncle Billy Allison, or one of his sons up on Troublesome Creek. Part of them lived in Chalmers and others in Scotland Township. Station number four was at the home of Henry Dobbins in Fulton County. 
from whence cargoes of negroes were dispatched to galesburg princeton and on to canada the terminus of all underground railroads it is interesting to recall that the princeton station was in charge of the lovejoy family which played such an important part in the early abolition movement at the time when the quarrel between the abolitionists and adherents of slavery was becoming most bitter proponents of emancipation engaged an orator to speak afternoon and night at old camp creek church then located about a mile and a half southeast of ebenezer church and a like distance southwest of the present camp creek church antagonists served notice that the speaker would not be permitted to talk and when the afternoon meeting hour drew near there was an organized gang present bent on breaking up the meeting and probably doing violence to the orator these men were armed and acting in a threatening manner the atmosphere was tense with excitement bloodshed was feared there were men and women present who while not in sympathy with any argument that could be delivered against slavery were governed by cooler judgments and they prevailed upon the gang not to start any trouble let him speak we'd like to hear what he has to say was the admonition that calmed the armed band the address was an impassioned speech depicting the negro in chains cowed to the dust under the whip of the master sold and bartered like cattle and torn asunder mother from child father from son the negro though black by no fault of his own born in the image of his creator and entitled to life liberty and happiness no less than his white brother the orator held his audience well but only for the moment animosities were too bitter to be wiped out with a single flash of oratorical genius hatred of the negro as a free and equal being was too deeply embedded when the address was finished and the more inflammable minds descended to the level of everyday thinking these hatreds and animosities again came to the surface and there was a general determination that the speaker had said enough for one day a council of the abolitionists was held and both men and women debated whether or not it would be advisable to permit the speaker to go through with his evening program it was finally decided that in order to avoid probable bloodshed the evening session should be called off in eighteen fifty two the abolitionists had a candidate for president in john p hale the adherents of slavery declared there should not be an abolitionist vote cast in mcdonough county in those days there were a number of voting places in the county and any resident could go where he chose to vote but there was no secret ballot then when you went to the polls you gave the clerk your name who wrote it down called through the list of offices to be filled and you told him your choice which was registered the voting place in macomb that year was james m campbell's store on the west side of the square and north of west jackson street known for years as campbell's corner now the abolitionists were just as defiant as their opponents and sent word back to them that they would vote at ten o'clock in macomb the records show there were nine votes cast for hale the archives in the attic of your courthouse have been thoroughly searched for the names of the nine men but they are not to be found george andrew and harmon allison and charles john and james blazer made up six of the nine men but i am not positive as to the other three i am indebted to the late alex mclean for the information that the nine men met in the courthouse yard by lot they decided their places in the line and then marched across to campbell's corner single file each with his gun on his shoulder there were many men of the opposition there with guns and many who were there just to see what would happen of course the vast majority of them as now felt that every man should have the right to vote his own sentiments 
and probably that spirit had much to do with preventing bloodshed. In assembling data, I have had the honor to receive a communication from Sarah K. Allison, now living at 504 East Washington Street, Macomb. This communication, coming from the granddaughter of Uncle Billy Allison, one of McDonough County's foremost ardent abolitionists, is especially interesting, and I take pleasure in including it in its entirety as follows. Quote, the first I remember of hearing about the Underground Railroad was when I was a little girl in our district school in the country. This was when Lincoln ran for president in 1860. We school children were political enthusiasts on the sides our fathers were on. We had gleaned many notions of right and wrong. I remember one day I was told we kept niggers in our attic. This I was too small to understand, but that evening I told mother and asked what they meant. She replied, you may tell them there are none there now. This did not improve matters much because I heard a lot about the nigger. One thing was he was not more than a sheep with wool on his head, etc. These went home again to mother, who said, They do not know it all. God made all people, and he made the colored man too. Years later, I heard father telling about taking some farm produce to market to a named place and returning with several colored people underneath the straw on the bottom of his wagon bed. After a time, he noticed he was followed by three horsemen. They were gaining on him, although he was driving as fast as the roads would permit. Coming to a gully or deep ravine, he slowed down and told these colored people to jump out and keep along the stream. This they did while he drove on as fast as possible. Yet he was overtaken and ordered to halt. This he did and explained he had marketed produce and was returning home but they turned everything upside down in the wagon, then let him go on. This incident father repeated more than once because he said he never knew what became of them, those colored people. He searched the ravine for them when it was safe to do so, but he never heard from them in any way afterward. This related incident brought more questions from me, and mother then told me, the Allisons helped slaves to freedom, and sometimes had kept them a while when pursued. The attic in the old home had old gowns, hoods, coats, etc., used as disguises. They helped them reach the blazers. The Quincy station was from John Van Dorn's. My mother's oldest brother, John Brown, helped them from Missouri across. He had many adventures that worried his mother. She told me about this. My mother, Beulah Brown, and her sister, Lucinda Brown, married two Allison brothers, Harmon and Andrew, and came to reside near Macomb in 1851-1853. My father's sister, Mary, married into the John Van Dorn family by a previous marriage at Quincy, Illinois. There was another wedding, the spirit of those independent times, made to slip twixt the cup and the lip, as it were. Elizabeth, my father's sister, met a southern gentleman with southern principles, but Cupid played a part, and he promised she should be free to hold her own views on the slavery question, and so express them. The wedding was arranged for, guests invited, the table set, and guests, groom-to-be, minister, and everyone there. Then he broke his promise and pled with her not to talk abolition politics in the home he was taking her to. For her own sake, as well as his, he asked her not to do so. She replied he had commenced just a little bit too soon to curb free thought and the freedom of expression. She handed him back his ring, and in her wedding gown went into the guest room, where the company had gathered and announced there would be no wedding, giving her reason. The would-be groom was met by his party and friends and departed. 
Later, Elizabeth married a Yankee doctor from Massachusetts. They agreed on politics. I wonder if there are not times when silence is really wisdom after all. So much depends, but young America believes in independence, and I glory in her spunk. Don't you? End of quote. I was told by a friend that McDonough County had a complete account of the Underground Railroad in Clark's history. That interested me, and I secured a copy which I prize highly. It is an interesting and accurate account of the early history of the county, and as a whole, the abolitionist question is treated ably. But the story of the Underground Railroad in McDonough County could be told only by the families who conducted it, and they would not talk. Mr. Clark did not mention an Allison and but one Blazer, John Blazer, who told him one story, and only part of that. The strife and worry of twenty years with their neighbors had worn them out, and they did not want to say or do anything that would stir up old scores. I can remember Mr. Clark visiting at my father's house and insisting that my father tell him something, but father and mother said no. He told them that John Blazer had given him a story, and my father said that was enough. The story was about Tom, a bright, likely young Negro who was quite religious. My uncle asked him what church he was going to join. He said, when I get up north, I'm going to join the Yankee Church. One thing sure, I never will join the Presbyterian Church. Now that was quite interesting, as the Blazers were Presbyterians. No, said Tom, they are perfect devils, and I'll never join that church. My master was a Presbyterian. While John Blazer told the anecdote of Tom, he did not tell that Tom together with an old negro, a young wench, and two little pickaninnies were in the same shipment and that it was extremely muddy at the time. That cargo was held a week or more at Burton's. At that time, our family was keeping house for a year or more at the home of my uncle, John Blazer, his wife, my Aunt Mary, having died. The two negro men the black woman and the two pickaninnies were delivered to us by Burton and stayed in a bedroom just off the living room, and although neighbors happened infrequently, we never heard a whimper from the babies. The neighbors were none the wiser, except, of course, that the blazers were always under suspicion of aiding Negroes to freedom. Why didn't John Blazer tell Mr. Clark this? Twenty years of strife threats of imprisonment, and an aversion against stirring up old animosities closed the lips of those men who could have written a first-hand account of the Underground Railway in McDonough County or furnished the material for Mr. Clark to do so. One of the early experiences of the Blazers, told to me by my father, occurred in the early 40s. One evening there was a party of several men gathered across the ravine back of my grandmother Blazer's house, better known in late years as the Butcher Place. They all carried guns, and the Blazer men went into the house to get their weapons. But my grandmother said, No, do not take any guns. We will just go over and see what they want. They went, but by the time they got there the men had disappeared. On their way back, the boys discovered that their mother carried a meat axe under her apron. When my cousin, Jenny Blazer Watson, was a little taut and just beginning to talk, a neighbor man who had very curly hair came to my grandmother's. Jenny toddled up to him and said, You have curly hair all over your head, just like little Maggie. Well, Maggie was a little black girl, who, with her mother, previously had gone through on their way to Canada. A child's prattle could not be used as evidence in court, so nothing came of it except to cause more talk and more discussion of the fugitive slave law, for the Missouri Compromise and the Dred Scott decision 
were ably and fluently discussed at that time by school children and men who could neither read nor write the most interesting story connected with any negro that passed through the underground railroad of mcdonough county was woven around charlie a very light colored buck with a sharp nose he probably was a quadroon or quarter blood and was the property of a man by the name of bush whose plantation lay back some miles from the missouri river it was customary with the planters when the wheat was threshed to go to town and stay while negro boys hauled it to market charlie and two others were hauling the bush wheat when teed up one night bush and the other planters were discussing recent escapes of slaves from missouri when bush turned banteringly to charlie and asked him why he didn't try running away just for a little excitement when charlie went to his quarters that night he was thinking and before he went to sleep he had it all figured out how he was going to make a break for yankeedom next morning charlie was up early and on their way the boys scolded him for driving so hard when they reached home charlie who was the boss when his master was not around put the boys to loading the wagons with wheat for the next day's trip to the river charlie told the boys he was going to a dance across the way and went to an old mammy and asked for some bacon and pone she gave it to him but said nigger what you up to you know you would not need any bacon or pone if you were going to a nigger dance you are up to some deviltry charlie struck out a foot but not a word did he tell his wife for he said he knew it would break her heart he had nearly forty-eight hours start for the boys had to drive to the river and the master go back home to secure dogs and organize for the chase when the pursuers reached the big river charlie was housed securely with the van dorns and john brown in quincy the blazers gave charlie the credit of being the smartest negro that ever passed over the mcdonough county route after reaching canada charlie got some pennsylvania presbyterians interested in trying to get his wife and two children to canada they sent an old presbyterian minister through who arranged with bush for their freedom for eight hundred dollars the preacher went back and raised the money, but when he returned with the cash, Bush had raised to 1200 He went back to Pennsylvania, secured the 1200 but Bush had concluded he must have 1500 This Charlie would not agree to, determining to go back, steal them, and take them to Canada. He made several trips. Twice he succeeded in getting his wife and children and making a start. After the first attempt, Bush had the mother and two children sleep in the loft above his and his wife's bedroom, which was reached by a ladder and a scuttle hole. But Charlie climbed to the top of the cabin, removed the clapboards, and succeeded in getting nearly to the Illinois side of the Mississippi with his loved ones. When the chase was so close, it was evident they were going to be captured. On the advice of his wife, Charlie jumped into the river and escaped in the dark. A few days later, he was at the Blazers on his way to Canada. Charlie by this time knew the road and did not require any conductor. Lodging and something to eat were his only needs, and he always had a new and interesting experience to relate. One is worth a place here. Charlie was on his way to Missouri and left Dobbins, the Fulton County Station, for the blazer post, but he had not gone far when a fog arose and Charlie lost his way. He wandered around nearly all night, finally gave up and lay down to sleep. When he awoke it was daylight, and two men were standing over him. They ordered him to get up, which he did, but Charlie jerked a big dirk knife and made a slash at one of them. Charlie escaped and arrived at my father's early that night. They fed him, but decided he had better strike out for the next station immediately. Charlie said he cut the fellow's clothing, 
but did not think he was hurt much. The fact that one of them carried an ox whip suggested that the men from whom Charlie escaped had been plowing prairie and were at the time of the encounter looking for their cattle which had been unyoked and turned loose to graze during the night. This guess proved to be true, for later one of the plowmen was found laid up from a slight wound such as might have been caused by a knife. However, the plowman did not mention any set-to with the fugitive negro, declaring that he had accidentally fallen against a plowshare. Perhaps they thought it would not be of any credit to them to acknowledge that a negro was too much for two of them. Charlie did not succeed in stealing his wife and children, but on the other hand they finally captured Charlie and sent him to the hemp works in Tennessee. There was only one place worse that you could send a Negro, and that was the Indigo Works in Florida. There he would lose his fingernails inside of two years and be a dead man in five years. But Charlie was too smart for them to keep him any place unless they kept him chained. A few months later, just at the opening of the Civil War, Charlie crossed the Ohio River near Cincinnati and went up through Ohio. He told the Ohio people of his wonderful experiences, which they doubted, but he gave them the address of Henry Dobbins. They wrote to him, and he verified Charlie's story. After the emancipation of the slaves, Charlie's wife and two children reached Canada, the Canaan of all Negroes. It frequently happened that families were divided on the slave question. The Chase family and an incident directly connected with the Underground Railway is worth a place in this article. A conductor from the station in Hancock County started to bring a darkey to the Allison station. A fog, which was very common at that time, rose, and he found he was lost. After driving for some time, he came to a house and called the man out and asked the road to Macomb, and found he was just south of town. He knew Reverend James Chase lived close to Macomb and was an abolitionist, so he inquired the way to Chase's. He was told it was just a little way over to the Chase home, and was directed to the Harvey Chase place, which stood just this side of Kill Jordan, now within the city limits of Macomb, where the Archie Fisher home stands. Now, it happened that Harvey Chase, who had been reared as an abolitionist the same as James, had changed and was on the other side of the question. When he called Mr. Chase out and informed him of his mission, he was told that he was wanting James Chase and was directed to his home, which was on the farm east of the county farm. When the abolitionists asked Harvey Chase, why he did not call an officer and have the darkey sent back to his master, he explained by saying, The stranger came to him in good faith, and he, as a gentleman, was honor bound to keep the faith. But his brother James had a different explanation. He said, Brother Harvey knew slavery was wrong, and while he talked in favor of it, he did not believe in it. The Chase brothers were gentlemen of honor. The last cargo of Negroes passed over the Underground Railway in McDonough County in 1860. This last cargo was not only the largest, but the most valuable that ever passed over our route, and the only Negro ever captured in this county was taken from this cargo. They were all big husky fellows, picked with a view to strength and endurance, and were brought up for the hemp works of Tennessee. They were brought into a river town and were to be delivered the next morning when the master would get his money. But that night they all escaped and reached Quincy. This was in June. The prize was a big one. Five hundred dollars per head was the sum offered for their capture. The cargo of Negroes had been out to Round Prairie two or three times and backtracked to Quincy until things would quiet down but was finally delivered to us by Petty John of the Huntsville country one morning before daylight in September, 1860. 
I was aroused and told to go to my uncle's to inform him of the arrival of the Negroes. I rapped gently on the window of Uncle John's bedroom. He signaled with a light tapping on the pane to let me know that he understood. I returned home, and by the time I had reached there, the Negroes had been stowed away, each in a shock of corn, and supplied with food and water. I am not sure at this late date whether there were eleven or twelve Negroes in the cargo, as the shipments were then called. Clark's history incorrectly reports the number as five. When Petty John delivered the Negroes at our home, he started on his return trip immediately. Just after daylight, on a hill west of Middletown, or Fandon, he passed a man on horseback. At some distance, Petty John looked back and saw that the other traveler had stopped and was looking over the conductor and his empty train. Petty John at once knew that he was suspicioned. The man on horseback was not one of those that took part in hunts for runaway slaves, but as afterwards told to my father, he was Dave Chrismans, who was the leader of the slavery sympathizers in McDonough County. Clark's history reports that the driver got lost and left his team and wagon in a gully near Dave Chrisman's house, and in that way it was learned that the cargo had arrived at the Blazers. That was Dave Chrisman's story, and it was generally believed. There was no means of knowing that it was not true, and Mr. Clark was justified in writing it, as the abolitionists would not give the historian any facts. At the time this history was written, the Negroes had long since been free, and the abolitionists were only too glad to dismiss the old strifes from their thoughts. Dave Crispin was a bluffer, and invented the story of finding the team near his house, thinking it would add to his notoriety. I recall very well that while the dozen Negroes sat and sweated in the corn shocks, for it was a hot September day, my father and John Blazer flailed buckwheat just south of the John Blazer house, and they had company all day long. Dave Chrisman was the first visitor. He had been the rounds and notified his followers and made arrangements which were to be carried out that night. No one stayed very long, but one visitor was not any more than gone when another rode up and would sit on his horse out in the road and talk for a time. All carried rifles, which was not unusual those times, for there was still considerable game in the country. But the visitors were not the only people who had guns, for two rifles stood inside the fence near where the two men flailed and talked to their neighbors, while I sat on the fence, listened and watched and reported who was coming. The sober, quiet, determined men knew that trouble was ahead for them, and when by themselves talked over their plans for the coming night, when the valuable cargo must be delivered to the next station. You may think it strange, but each insisted that he should be in charge of the Negroes when they started on the perilous trip and each had a reason why he should go, but John had the best argument. It was his turn, and my father, when the time came, started up the prairie just after dark with a wagon load of grain covered with a tarpaulin. Before he had gone a half mile, some twenty-five or thirty horsemen rode up, all carrying guns, and rode along for a mile or more and visited when they dropped back and held a short consultation, and four came back, caught up with him, and rode several miles with him, when they turned and rode away. My father went on to Bernadotte to mill, and did not know the fate of the darkies until he returned home the next day. Now John and the colored boys had swung off towards the timber, and then went straight east up the prairie until even with the Dickey Craig farm. When they started to the timber, they had to cross a new plank fence which had been built just along the south side of the Craig land. Just as John and the Negroes got on top of the fence, Chrisman and his men, who had been lying in the shadow of the fence, raised up. John Blazer said to the Negroes, 
run boys for the timber they did as told and all got away but one whom chrisman hit over the head with a gun chrisman accompanied by one or two of the leaders took the negro to macomb where he was held in jail until the owner came and claimed his property but chrisman as was often the case then failed to get his reward as the owner said he had lost his man's work and spent so much money trying to get him back that he could not afford to pay anything ten or twelve men comprising the balance of the party that together with chrisman had captured the negro came back that night and threw clubs and rocks at our house and shouted and yelled my mother went to the door which had no lock and stood with an axe in her hand ready to protect her home and children threats that my father and uncle would be indicted by the next grand jury that they had been caught red-handed in transporting negroes and would have an opportunity to serve time at alton was not a pleasant greeting to their families this did not go direct to the ears of my father and uncle even dave chrisman was too gentlemanly to discuss the question with the blazers or allisons those were trying times but do not conclude this condition existed all over the county it was much worse in the neighborhoods where there was an underground station now i do not believe any one who was not intimate with conditions can realize just what it meant to a family to be in such strife and turmoil with the emancipation of the slaves by abraham lincoln there was of course no further need for the underground railway but many years and a new generation were required to wipe out the old animosities end of the history of the underground railroad of mcdonough county illinois by d n blazer an address before the mcdonough county historical society october twentieth nineteen twenty two read by sue anderson William James, Gustav Fechner, Wilhelm Wundt, and Soren Kierkegaard by Woodbridge Riley from Vassar College Psychological Bulletin, Volume 12, Numbers 1 through 12, 1915 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox dot org general reviews and summaries historical contributions by woodbridge riley vassar college the most important historical contribution since our last general review has been j mark baldwin's history of psychology reviewed in the september number of the bulletin a briefer supplemental account is given in kruger's article which expounds the aims and tendencies in psychology especially in their german-american relations thus the first laboratory for experimental psychology was established by wundt whose first assistant and cooperator was cattell for the latter the claim is made of holding the first special professorship in psychology in the world while the united states can boast of a more extensive system of psychological instruction than any other country with particularly valuable investigations in animal and social psychology the germans are not particularly conversant with these facts this german-american account is in turn to be supplemented by the french so much for the general aspects of psychology for more particular views we take up the study of four eminent thinkers william james fechner wundt and kierkegaard knox explains that while james was led on from psychology to philosophy 
it was precisely his psychological insight that enabled him to discern the personal sources of the big philosophical antithesis he was not deterred by the a priori distinctions between logic and psychology by the assumption that our aim is purely impersonal and objective but held that personal vision and practical makeshifts determine metaphysical theory he challenged the intellectualist axiom that the parallel lines of knowing and doing must never meet this makes his principles of psychology as valuable a handbook of ethics as it is of logic thus was early laid in psychology the foundations for the coming pragmatism and so conversely james invites us to treat our moral and religious aspirations as methodologically on a par with scientific categories as with james so with fechner Engel points out that in the case of the german a curious tendency towards a practical mysticism from the physicist comes forth the philosopher and the laboratory has given place to the oracle believing that the reality of the world must accord with what is reasonable fechner saw clearly that this reality could not be deduced by dialectics but that it must be worked out as one works out final questions in physics namely by generalization and by analogy in other words the purpose of fechner was an inductive metaphysics or metaphysique von unten now james who twenty-five years ago gave his official opinion that the proper psychological outcome of fechner's work was just nothing has made the amende honorable in a generous sympathetic essay in the pluralistic universe Moomin's account of the life work of wilhelm wundt is noteworthy for two features its arraignment of german officialdom for its neglect of a great thinker and its praise of american psychologists for spreading the fame of the master the former fact is explained as due to wundt's south german independence of bureaucracy the latter as due to his endeavors to make his work both scientific and practical to americans brought up on the old introspective mental philosophy the new experimental psychology was a welcome relief in place of the old static view of the mind came the doctrine of development in place of the study of the normal adult was offered animal and child and race psychology so what fechner had started at leipzig wundt enlarged and america spread james's pragmatism and fechner's mysticism had a similar twofold aspect both were scientific and both sought truth under the analogy of the self so was it with the system of kierkegaard as his compatriot hofting shows the danish thinker's philosophy had a double quality being both personal and scientific while subjectivity is the avenue of truth the world in which we live is a world of scientific approximation and james's pluralism is matched by the statement that the personal world represents not a world but a plurality of worlds resulting from the different points of view of personalities here arise four chief types there is the ascete who draws a tangent to the circle of life along the line of passing pleasures there is again the ironist who knowing how to distinguish the interior from the exterior strives to shelter his inner life against the changes of the moment there is next the moralist who enters into positive relations with other men and endeavors to fulfill his duty there is finally the humorist who being sadly affected by the contrast of finite and infinite is forced to look upon life as more or less of a joke all this reminds one of james's types of thinking from the man who carves out order to him who considers the universe a vast grab-bag 
between the american and the dane there is then final agreement in respect to the doctrine of discontinuity the old idealistic continuity being supplanted by the view that both the psychic and cosmic life proceed by leaps natura per saltum end of william james gustav fechner wilhelm wundt and soren kierkegaard by Woodbridge Riley, Vassar College, 1915. Wounded Knee and Oglala Sioux First Person Account by Rex E. Beach. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org here is an untold tale of the red man as spoken by dewey beard an oglala sioux who sits alone to-day bullet-scarred and sad while in the drifting blue from his tepee fire come images of that glory which has departed from his race it is true though running counter to the lore of the white man the reason whereof lies hid beneath army influence once a dashing leader led his troop against a subtle foe was outgeneraled and his men annihilated in fair fight leaving naught but a blood-soaked hillside and a shining memory this was custer's massacre years passed and a few starving sioux bound toward an agency for protection and succor were surrounded by three times their number of soldiers who demanded their dying chieftain as hostage they gave him then puzzled and frightened while busied in laying down their arms they were massacred by the men in blue and brass leaving nothing but bodies of babes and women and defenseless men with a name upon the yellowed page of history the battle of wounded knee the buffalo were gone all the indians were hungry one day as i sat with my father in his tepee a messenger came saying a savior for the sioux had appeared to one in the far land of the setting sun who promised to bring again the buffalo and antelope and to send the white man from out of the land where we hunted in the old time this messenger was holy he told us if we danced and prayed the savior would appear does this mean that we shall fight again with a white man my father asked it is not good to speak so of war no said the messenger there is no talk of battles when the great one comes the white people will go away and in the land will be many things to eat let us see this thing said my father to us the great white chief in washington has broken his word for he took our lands saying we should have food as long as we live we are starving while our families eat nothing but the wild turnips so we went to white clay creek where the indians danced the ghost dance and we danced also i my father and all my brothers there were many people about the medicine pole as they danced they threw dust to the heavens in handfuls and fanned it with their blankets singing to the savior they did this for many hours till some of them fell there were young women who took part also and these stood in a line within the circle then at a signal ran toward a goal pursued by the medicine men who struck them with a great ball so that they fell there were drums beating and the sound of great singing while people whirled and whirled till they dropped in a trance and were dragged from beneath the feet of the others when they arose they spoke in an unknown tongue many danced till they died while others seemed to die but did not these appeared to be holy claiming to have seen mysterious things and saying that the savior had promised to bring again the golden days the women wore ghost dresses as did some of the men shirts of cotton cloth with magic on them painted and blessed by the medicine men so that no harm could come to him who wore one not even bullets of the white man before long i observed that it was bad indians who saw these sacred images each time these and the medicine men were the only ones so i spoke to my father when the spirit would not come to any of us he said 
my sons it is strange that we do not see the saviour i am told they dance better at the cheyenne agency we may see the holy one there so with kicking bear we went to the tepees of bigfoot but there it was the same for the mystery came not to any of our family soon after our arrival soldiers came and camped close by about five hundred of them our chief counseled with the officer saying my friend why do you camp so close that one replied you are dancing the ghost dance and i fear you will do wrong no we intend no harm if we do nothing but dance that cannot be any one's business but our own said bigfoot the agent at pine ridge is frightened and has called for many soldiers he says you are bad and i have come out to stop this i will go away from here said bigfoot and my people will go with me but we are good indians and do not want you to follow us we will dance to the holy spirit if we wish but we will do no harm you must have a pass if you leave the reservation said the white man at which my father who had come to the soldier's tent with bigfoot said my friend we are not on the war path we are praying to our saviour and doing no evil do you get a paper from the great father at washington when you pray to the white man's god i think perhaps the great spirit does not know you when the sun went down bigfoot gave us orders to make ready in secret so when the soldiers were asleep that night we slipped away quietly to cherry creek camping in a circle the next day the soldiers came again and pitched their tepees near us while the officer said to bigfoot you must move back to your old camp we are not cattle to be put in a pen said our old chief speaking very slowly and then in a great voice he cried we will pray where we please that day the soldiers left shortly after this a band of old people and squaws and children from sitting bull's camp came riding by bareback and we knew there was trouble gathering in the tepees of that chief so bigfoot called us together again saying i fear disasters are coming my people we had best go back to our old place as the soldiers told us to do so the great father will know we are not bad indians accordingly we moved back to the cheyenne but immediately many soldiers camped near us again in the night time more came so that when we arose in the morning they stood in a line all around us with their guns in their hands they had pointed a cannon at us when we came out of our tepees to look at them our women grew greatly frightened then as we watched a half-breed advanced announcing that the officer wished to speak with bigfoot that one answered let him come to our camp and talk we mean no harm but he should not point his guns at us for we do not like it the officer arrived and through his interpreter commanded us to surrender why should we do that said bigfoot we are not hostiles we are only hungry indians beseeching the great spirit for food when you took our land you said we should have plenty to eat but we are starving let us have food so that we may think about it for a day or so then perhaps we will go with you the soldier talked with our head men until afternoon securing at last from bigfoot a promise that we would not go away before the next morning the soldiers gave us no food at daybreak we found them standing in line again with their cannon pointing at our tents it was very close by the officer sent word that we could have but a little time to consider and if we did not give up before the sun was as high as his hand he would fire the big gun killing our women and children we must go with this man the chief said to us so we did the next day some of the soldiers marched before us and some of them marched behind while others were on both sides of our wagon but bigfoot rode a pony near the front and said nothing for he was very sad all day we watched him as afternoon drew on he announced quietly to one of his braves get ready the man rode back down the line passing the word whereupon our squaws threw out the tepee poles one by one and dropped every heavy thing scattering the goods for a long way when he saw this the officer rode up to bigfoot 
why do your people throw away things the ponies are weak said our chief when the sun was two fingers high the old man spoke again our horses can go no farther we will camp here where there is good water giving the sign we suddenly turned out in a body leaving the soldiers at which they looked foolish by the time they had gotten together we were some distance up a narrow creek and they had to follow after like a snake's tail in the grass when we had gone a little way our leader said we will camp here but do not allow one pony to get away so we unhitched and built fires as though to cook while our guards came near and stopped for it was dark word was passed to the braves who rode ponies to put blankets over their shoulders so they would look like women and then to build many small fires while this was being done the squaws in the wagon farthest away from the soldiers were told to move on when they were gone for a little time the next wagon was told to follow and so on one by one till there remained only the two nearest the whites when these drove off an under officer came to big foot where are all the wagons they have gone to the other side of our camp the old man replied but in a few moments the messenger came again and asked to see them come said big foot to us who had stayed about the fire let us show him where they are at which we all rose up together when he saw there were braves beneath the blankets the man ran away crying loudly we are attacked we leaped to our ponies and rode fast overtaking the wagons we shouted to the women to drive hard and in a body we went ahead all that night as rapidly as possible and on the next day were in the badlands hearing from a half-breed that the general was at pine ridge agency our chieftain said we would go to red cloud's camp at that place where we could counsel with the big soldier so we traveled together coming at last to a pass in the wall of the badlands down which we could go to the valley of the white river when we got there however we saw many white men marching below and thereupon lay all day watching them till they went into camp at cane creek to the north when they had passed the place wherein we hid we went down across the valley but the next morning finding that big foot was very sick and bleeding at the nose we went to what is now called big foot springs from there we went to red water creek but our leader became so ill he could not go farther and we were forced to stay two nights and two days at this spot at last he said we must reach red cloud's camp before i die so at sundown we broke camp and marched all night coming on the second day to yellow thunder creek near porcupine butte here we saw four mounted indian scouts and although we called to them they spurred away as fast as they could we continued on but as we drew near to the butte we discerned soldiers to the northeast they had pack mules and were coming towards us at which bigfoot said go meet them when we approached they formed a line pointing a cannon at us as though about to shoot bigfoot had been too sick to ride a horse so we had carried him in a wagon since leaving redwater he asked us to drive him toward the soldiers which we did till an officer met us i rode alongside and when the man came near i cried don't shoot we are going to the agency we don't want to fight where is bigfoot said the officer in that wagon but he is very sick is he able to talk then running to the wagon he pulled the blanket from the chief's head inquiring can you talk yes replied the old man at which the soldier demanded where are you going we are bound for our relatives at the pine ridge agency then you must lay down your arms we are ready to do that said the chief but we fear something will happen to us if we do we are friendly will you not wait until we get to the agency and have a chance to speak with the big general he will tell us everything but now we do not understand we are afraid we do not know what all this means i will go with your soldiers now and my people will give up their guns when we reach the agency i wish no trouble for i am going to die the officer said 
that is a good plan i have a nice wagon with four mules for you to ride in and when bigfoot agreed to this they brought the sick wagon put him on some gray blankets such as the soldiers have and placed him in it i grew very much afraid now for the soldiers laughed when they carried bigfoot away together we moved toward wounded knee creek while a guard was placed around the sick wagon i said to the medicine man my friend you would do well to stop and dance the ghost dance for i fear trouble is coming to our chief one of my friends wished to shoot the officer but my father told him this would do no good as the white men would kill us all together with our women and children and it would make matters much worse generally i rode near to the ambulance with one of our people who understood english for i was greatly troubled and wished to know of what the soldiers spoke coming to wounded knee creek bigfoot was put in a tent under guard at which all the rest of us pitched our teepees close by an under officer established many soldiers around us as guards which caused my father to inquire why do you do this we would not have followed you if we wished to run away but they only laughed at him then he called me and my brothers aside saying there is great trouble coming you must do whatever the soldiers command and give them no excuse to harm you some of our people attempted to go to the agency but the soldiers turned them back which added to our uneasiness nobody in our camp slept much that night except the children for we went from tepee to tepee talking of our situation we agreed to give up our guns if commanded although i intended to hide mine and come back for it again while some of the young men who had good magazine rifles they had recently bought would say nothing my father asked the medicine man what he could do telling him that if his messiah was of any account now was the time for help but the pious one was sullen and only said he would bring aid when the time came as it neared daylight the bugle sounded we all came out to see what would happen a second time the bugles blew and in the early light we discerned that we were surrounded for near us there were soldiers on foot while farther away in a great circle were many more who rode horses a half-breed named philip wells interpreted for the officer announcing gather together gather together there will be a council so we assembled in a ring all of us except four men and the women and children and bigfoot who was still in the soldiers tent under guard the foot soldiers closed around us on three sides while those on horses remained in the rear across a deep ditch others stood about the cannon on the hill and many were drawn up in a line beside their camp the interpreter began by saying that we must surrender our arms at once when we asked him what bigfoot said about this he answered that our chief told us to do so whereupon we went into our tepees and i dug a hole in the ground to bury my carbine this took me a little time so that when i came out most of the guns had been piled in the council circle as i took my place i noted there were soldiers behind me and on both sides and from where i sat i looked toward the cannon on the hill in this way i did not feel afraid for the gunners could not shoot without hurting their own men the officer said you have twenty-five more guns which i want i counted them yesterday there are many cartridges and knives too you must give them up this was not true nearly all of our weapons were piled in the center not more than four or five being hidden my father asked the officer will the great father feed us after he takes our arms away i don't know anything about that all i know is that i am going to have these guns every one of them there was considerable talk but no more rifles appeared at last one of the four indians who had refused to join the council came and sat down with the rest of us which left only the medicine man and two young braves named black fox and yellow turtle these two refused to yield and held their weapons in their hands we will give up our cartridges they said and carry our guns empty but the soldier refused to allow this and commanded them to yield at once he announced further that he would go into the tepees and get every weapon he could find this he did 
while doing so an under officer with four soldiers advanced toward black fox and yellow turtle who stood at some distance as they advanced the two young men retreated toward the creek while the medicine man came forth standing between them and the white men my father cried you do not need a gun medicine man your ghost shirt will be enough bullets cannot hurt you he replied my friend i am afraid at this point philip wells spoke saying when the soldiers have taken your rifles you must march past in a line and they will hold out their guns toward you he meant by this that they would hold their weapons in front of them as soldiers do sometimes but we thought they would take aim at us so my brother cried when they aim at us that way they will kill us and my father said to the medicine man again you claimed your messiah could protect us from the white man's bullets this is the time for your savior see now if he is any good you stand there like an old woman at this the medicine man began to sing a prayer to the great spirit while an under officer with two soldiers advanced again toward black fox and yellow turtle the latter warned them my friends do not come to me in that way for i do not want to harm you turning to black fox he continued now you will see if i am brave do not give up your gun and that one in turn cried to the white man keep away from us for we will die before we give up and if we die we will take many of you along one of our men cried out the soldiers are going to shoot let us get our rifles and go to the ditch where we can get away but an old indian crept up beside wells saying no my people do not do that it is this interpreter who is speaking with two tongues if he brings trouble i will kill him with my knife again my father spoke to the medicine man now is the time for help do your best that one stopped singing and began to cry to the great spirit gathering handfuls of dust and throwing them toward the sky while he waved his blanket beneath as they did in the ghost dance when calling for the messiah while he did this i saw the officer emerge from a tepee with a gun in his hand and i looked at it sharply for i thought it was my own while i looked i heard a soldier cry look out look out run back and someone shouted in indian stop don't shoot i turned to find black fox and yellow turtle holding their rifles as though ready to fire they were laughing however for the under officer and his two soldiers were walking away very fast looking back as though afraid i glanced away for an instant and as i did so a gun was fired behind me i do not know who shot it may have been an indian but i do not think so both of the young braves turned firing at the spot where the report came from and we all jumped up some cried they will kill us and others shouted get your guns and get ready shots were fired by the soldiers on both sides of us and black fox and yellow turtle fell the latter began his death song then raised to his elbow and shot at the soldiers while it appeared to me that the white men opened fire on every hand i saw my friends sinking about me and heard the whine of many bullets i was not expecting this it was like when a wagon wheel breaks in the road get your gun someone shouted in my ear i was frightened and ran seeing soldiers running also i followed but came into smoke so thick that i could see nothing as i went i took out my knife the first thing i distinguished in the smoke was the brass buttons on a soldier's coat while a gun was thrust into my face and fired so close that it burned my hair i grabbed it by the barrel and stabbed at the man with my knife i stabbed him three times till he let go then i tripped and fell when i arose i found i was right among his comrades so ran back toward the ditch till i saw another group aiming at me and felt something smite me on the shoulder so heavily that i spun around and fell again i raised my head to see a white man aiming at me but he missed and i snapped at him with the gun i had taken from the soldier it did not explode however for i had forgotten to load it so i quickly opened the breech as i did so he ran away i began to breathe hard now while every breath hurt me greatly i rose to my feet and tried to run but could not so i walked 
The ground rocked and pitched like a canoe. Something warm in my throat strangled me, and when I spit it out I saw it was blood, so I knew I was shot. Before reaching the ditch other soldiers came at me and I charged toward them, thinking I would die in this way. They retreated into the smoke, and I went on, coming to a dead trooper whose belt of cartridges I cut off because mine would not fit the gun I had taken from the other man. I wished to take his gun also, but was too weak to carry it. Then, as I started on, I fell for a third time and thought I had stepped into a prairie dog hole till I found I could not rise. I had been shot through the leg, so I sat there loading and firing as fast as I could till my shells were nearly gone, when one broke in my gun and made it useless. I hopped toward the ditch, but whenever I stepped on my wounded leg, I fell down. Through the smoke I could see nothing but dead women and children now, and there were dead soldiers among them. At last I gained the dry creek, where an Indian gave me a carbine he had taken from a dead enemy. At that moment the fast-firing cannon, Hotchkiss, began to speak, and it was so close and loud that it frightened me, so I endeavored to crawl away up the ditch. I had not gone far till I met Whiteface, my wife. She had been shot, the ball passing through her chin and shoulder, but she mumbled, let me pass, let me pass, you go on, we will all die soon, but I must get my mother. There she is. She crawled to where her mother lay at the top of the bank, but as she lifted the body in her arms she fell dead, shot again. At this I followed up on to the prairie, for I thought I would die quickly now, but before reaching the top an Indian pulled me back. As I fell he was shot through the head. I took his cartridges, for they suited my carbine, and hobbled on till I met another woman coming toward me with a revolver in her hand. It was a soldier's gun which she had taken from a dead body, for she was very bloody. As she neared me a white man peered over the bank and killed her. I fired and he ran back. Then I crawled onward as fast as I could, coming to White Lance, my brother. He sat with his back against the bank while my younger brother, Pursued, lay beside him. They were both wounded, and Pursued was dying. He said, We will all be dead soon, my brothers. Kill as many as you can before you go. They had three belts of cartridges, which they had stripped from soldiers, and when we saw that Pursued was gone, we crawled behind a little knoll where the ditch turned, from which we could see our enemies. We fired at them many times, till they turned the fast-firing cannon at us. Then we lay down, close behind the hummock. When it roared, the dirt and gravel were scattered over us by the ball. I became very sick and weak and thirsty, and could shoot no more. But I heard soldiers approaching, and saw one peep over the bank. Although I could take no aim, I fired, and they ran back, shooting the fast-firing cannon at us again till a bullet from it cut Hawk Feather, who lay with us, almost in two. Some men on a hill not far from the cannon fired at me also, with their rifles, till one bullet threw gravel in my face, and I thought I was wounded again, so lay very still. After a little time they ceased. White Lance had gone on, so I crawled after to look for him. While doing so, an Indian scout fired at me, then ran away. I felt extremely sick and wanted to die, so wormed my way up the side of the ditch and shot at the soldiers, hoping they would kill me, but I could not stand up and their bullets went high. Again they turned the quick-firing cannon toward me, the balls passing so close that I felt the wind lift me from the ground. I was nearly blind and could not rise, so lay for a long time till the firing stopped. Then I crept over the hill, coming to my brother, yell at them, and Jack LaPlante. They had a horse, but I could not ride, so they held me on the pony with their arms. I begged them to leave me, for I wanted to die, but they said, We will go to the agency or die together. In this way I came to Short Bull's camp, but I was so badly wounded they could take me no farther. I remembered my father's words, however, 
and when I could be hauled without danger to my life, I went into the agency. While there I learned that Horn Cloud, my father, Yellow Leaf, my mother, my wife, whose name was Whiteface, Whitefoot, our little child, my brother, whose name was Pursued, and my sister, named Her Horses, had been killed, and that my two brothers, White Lance and Enemy, were wounded. They also told me that when the firing started, although he was very sick, Bigfoot came out before his teepee. As he saw his people falling, he drew his blanket over his head, and standing so, a soldier killed him. Sometimes I live again the old, old days when honor and glory were in the tepees of my tribe, and I see the faces of my people as I dream. They were good and brave and true, all but the medicine men. Those were liars, as my father said. It comes to me bitterly that perchance there was no savior for the Sioux, or that the white man's gods were stronger. Why else did he stand silently, with hidden face, to let his people perish? End of Wounded Knee, an Oglala Sioux First Person Account by Rex E. Beach Recording by David Wales